All right. Good morning and welcome to the 166th meeting of Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. I'm Mike Kaczynski, a project manager with FDA, and I'll be uh, today's meeting facilitator. This is a live virtual public meeting that is being broadcast in its entirety through C-SPAN, uh, Yorkcast, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, many other avenues. Today's event is also being recorded and will be posted on FDA's uh, VRPAC webpage along with all relevant meeting materials. Throughout today's meeting, I will be reminding our, our speakers and presenters and committee members uh, as to when uh, they are close to their allotted time and assisting them when needed. Just as a reminder to everyone that once called upon to please manage your mute and activate your webcams. If we encounter any technical issues throughout the day, we may have to take an unscheduled break. Uh, at this time, though, I'd like to get the meeting started, and I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Arnold Monto, the acting chair, who will now provide opening remarks. Dr. Monto, you ready? Take it away. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to add my welcome to the 166th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. It is my pleasure to open the meeting and to uh, remind you of the one topic that we have for the meeting. We will meet in open virtual session to discuss, in general, data needed to support authorization and or licensure of COVID-19 vaccines for use in pediatric populations. So I'd like now to hand over to our designated federal officer, Prabha Atreya, who will give the administrative announcements, the roll call, and introduce the committee. Prabha. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monto. Good morning, everyone. This is Prabha Atreya, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer, that is the DFO, for today's 166 Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and the committee, I would like to everyone to welcome uh, to the, uh, today's virtual meeting. Like Dr. Manta mentioned, the topic for today's meeting is to discuss in general data needed to support authorization and our licensure of COVID-19 vaccines for use in pediatric populations. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on May 21, 2021. I would like to introduce and acknowledge the excellent contributions of the staff in my division and the great team I have in preparing for this meeting. Ms. Kathleen Hayes is my D backup DFO and co-DFO, providing excellent support in all aspects of preparing for and conducting this meeting. Other staff who contributed significantly are Ms. Monique Hill, Dr. Janet Devine, Ms. Christina Wett, who provided excellent support. I would also like to express our sincere appreciation to Mr. Mike Kaczynski in facilitating the meeting for today. And also our kudos to many of the FTA staff working behind the scenes very hard to make sure that uh, today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one like the previous four VERPAC meetings on the COVID topics. Please direct any press or media questions for today's meeting to FDA's Office of the Media Affairs at FDA OMA, one word, at FDA.hhs.gov. The transcriptionist for today's meeting is Ms. Linda Giles. We will begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and temporary voting members. When it is your turn, please turn on your video camera, unmute your phone, and then state your first and last name. And then when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next person. Please see the member roster slide in which we will begin with the chair. Dr. Arnold Monto, can we please start with you? Thank you. Mike, can we see the slide, the roster slide? The next one, please. 
Uh, I'm Arnold Monto. I'm professor of epidemiology at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and my area of expertise is infectious disease, epidemiology, and disease prevention. Brava. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amanda Kuhn. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Amanda Cohn, the Chief Medical Officer at the National Center for Immunizations and Respiratory Diseases um, with expertise in pediatrics and uh, vaccines and epidemiology. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Good morning, everyone. I'm Archie Chatterjee, Dean of Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases specialist by background and training with a focus on vaccinology. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Meissner, Cody Meissner. We can't hear you, Dr. Meissner. You need to turn your speaker. Good morning. And uh, my name is Cody Meissner. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Tufts University School of Medicine and Tufts uh, Children's Hospital. My area of interest is infectious disease, and I've had uh, more than 35 years of experience with uh, pediatric immunizations. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Dr. Gantz. Good morning. I'm Dr. Haley Gans. Uh, I'm professor of pediatrics and pediatric infectious disease at Stanford University. And my um, research focus is on the immune response to vaccines in multiple different populations, including children and immunocompromised folks. Thank you. Dr. Kurilla. Good morning, uh, Michael Carilla. I'm the director of the Division of Clinical Innovation at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences within uh, NIH. Uh, I'm a pathologist by training and a background in infectious disease product development, including drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. Thank you, Dr. Kofit. Yeah, good morning. I'm Paul Offit. I'm from the Division of Pediatric Infectious Disease at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. My expertise is in the area of vaccines and vaccine safety. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Anziato. Good morning. I'm Paula Anziato. I lead vaccines clinical development at Merck and I'm here today as the non-voting industry representative. Thank you. Dr. Pergam. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Pergam. Um, I'm an infectious disease physician in Seattle, Washington, and I work at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. My area of focus is in the immunocompromised population. Thank you. Dr. Fuller. Ovita Fuller. Good morning. I'm Ovita Fuller. I'm an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at the University of Michigan Medical School. My expertise is virology and community engagement for disease prevention. Thank you. Dr. Kim, David Kim. Good morning. This is David Kim. I'm the director of the Division of Vaccines in the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Uh, which is under the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, and my interest is in, in vaccines. Thank you. Dr. Rubin? Hi, I'm Eric Rubin. I'm uh, at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Brigman Women's Hospital, and Editor-in-Chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, and Infectious Disease Physician. Thank you. Dr. Hildreth? I'm the President. Good morning. I'm James Hildreth. I'm the president of Mary Medical College and professor of internal medicine. My expertise is in immunology and viral pathogenesis. Thank you. Thank you, Hildreth. Dr. Portnoy. Good morning. I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy. 
I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, and I'm also an allergist immunologist at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Okay, thank you. Dr. Dodd. Dodd, Dr. Dodd. We can't hear you, Dr. Dodd. You need to turn on your speaker. There we go. How's that? Yes, that's better. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I'm Lori Dodd. I'm a biostatistician. Um, I'm a member of the Biostatistics Research Branch at NIAD, as well as the Chief of the Clinical Trials Research Section. My expertise is um, in clinical trials and, and infectious diseases. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sawyer? My name is Mark we can't Sawyer. Hear you. Now we can. We can hear you. Continue. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Sawyer. I am a professor of pediatrics and uh, pediatric infectious diseases at University of California, San Diego, and Rady Children's Hospital, San Diego. Thank you, Dr. Melinda Watson. Melinda Wharton. I'm. I'm director of the Immunization Services Division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, and I'm an adult infectious disease physician by training, and uh, my expertise is in vaccines and vaccine programs. Thank you. Dr. Nelson? Hi, I'm Mike Nelson. I'm a professor of medicine and chief of the Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology Division at the University of Virginia, as well as president of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. Recently retired from Army Medicine at Walter Reed. My interests are vaccine immune responses and adverse events. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, Dr. Levy? Hello, good morning. My name is Ofer Levy, and I'm director of the Precision Vaccines Program at Boston Children's Hospital and professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Thank you. Dr. McInnes. Good morning. I'm Pamela McInnes, uh, retired now from the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at the National Institutes of Health and have a longstanding interest and work record in vaccines and other biologicals. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McInnes. Dr. Perlman. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm... Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to... Okay. Yeah, I'm Dr. Stanley Perlman. I'm a, pro a professor of microbiology and immunology and of pediatrics and a pediatric infectious disease physician by training. I'm at the University of Iowa, and my expertise is in coronavirus, uh, immunology, uh, virology, and pathogenesis. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce our FDA staff. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Dr. Marianne Gruber, Director, Office of Vaccines, who will say a few welcome remarks. Dr. Gruber, go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, my name is Marion Gruber, and I'm the Director of the Office of Vaccines Research and Review at CBA at FDA. And on behalf of my colleagues in OVRR and uh, the center, I would like to welcome the VERPAC members to today's meeting. This is the fifth VERPAC meeting convened over the last seven to eight months to discuss COVID-19 vaccines. But today's topic is of particular importance to our stakeholders, the American public and parents, as we ask you to discuss considerations and data to support licensure or emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines for use in pediatric populations six months to less than 18 years of age. Your perspectives and opinions regarding approaches to evaluating COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness and in particular safety to support their use in pediatric populations as described in our briefing document and this will be discussed further this morning, 
will help the FDA to advise COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers to ensure that pediatric trials will be adequate to support vaccine licensure and, if needed, emergency use authorization in these groups. Severe COVID-19 resulting in hospitalization and death does occur in infants and children. However, the COVID-19 disease burden is generally lower in younger pediatric age groups compared with adolescents and adults. In recent times, we also have become aware of rare adverse events after administration of some of the COVID vaccines. The most recent reports of myocarditis observed in adolescents and young adults following administration of some of these vaccines. Therefore, risk-benefit considerations to determine whether to issue an emergency use authorization for use of COVID-19 vaccine in, to healthy pediatric individuals will need to account for this information and risk-benefit consideration will likely be different, not only compared to those for adults, but also they may be different for younger versus older pediatric age groups. To facilitate your deliberations, we have formulated three non-voting discussion items, but we welcome your insight on other aspects of this complex topic as we intend to take the different perspectives that we will be hearing and express today into consideration in refining our approach to evaluating COVID-19 vaccine safety and effectiveness in pediatric populations. Thank you, and I look forward to the committee's discussions. Thank you, Dr. Grubel. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Celia Witten, the Deputy Director of CBOR, and Dr. Philip Kraus, Deputy Director of Office of the Vaccines, at this meeting. Uh, Dr. Peter Marks, our Center Director, will uh, join us later in the day to make his remarks uh, addressing the committee. Now I will proceed with the reading of the concept of interstatement for the public record. Thank you. The Food and Drug Administration is convening virtually today, June 10th, 2021, the, 160, the 166th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, of 1972. Dr. Arnold Manto is serving as the acting voting chair for today's meeting. Today on June 10th, 2021, the committee will meet in open session to discuss data to support authorization and our licensure of COVID-19 vaccines for use in pediatric populations. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties. With the exception of industry representative member, all standing and temporary voting members of the WERPAC are appointed as special government employees FGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, some other agencies, and are subjected to federal conflicts of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 United States Code Section 208, is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGEs, and SGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children, and for the purpose of 18 U.S. Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investment, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements or CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing uh, assignments, uh, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are either current or under negotiation. FTA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S. Code Section 208, Congress has authorized the FTA to grant waivers 
to special government employees and regular government employees who have financial conflict of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employees services outweigh the potential for a conflict of interest created by financial interest involved or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial conflict of interest reported by the committee members and consultants, there have been one conflict of interest waiver issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants serving as temporary voting members. As you have heard before, Dr. Laurie Dodd, Dr. Ovita Fuller, Dr. James Hildreth, Captain uh, David Kim, Dr. Ofer Levy, Dr. Pamela McInnes, Dr. Arnold Mancho, Dr. Michael Nelson, Dr. Stanley Perlman, Dr. Jay Portnoy, Dr. Eric Rubin, Dr. Mark Sawyer, and Dr. Melinda Wharton. Among these consultants, Dr. James Hildreth, a special government employee, has been issued a waiver for his participation in today's meeting. The waiver was posted on the FTS website for public disclosure. Dr. Pala, Pala Anunziato of Merck will serve as the industry representative for today's meeting. Industry representatives act on behalf of all regulated industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve as only non-voting member of the committee. Industry representative on this committee is not screened, does not participate, any, participate in any closed sessions if held, and do not have the voting privileges. Dr. Jay Portnoy is serving as the acting consumer rep for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed as special government employees and are hence screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. Disclosure, disclosure of conflict of interest for speakers and guest speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FTA guidance. FTA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial interest they may have with any affected firm, its products, or if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind standing and temporary members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FTA participant has a personal imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from such involvement and uh, their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes reading of the conflict of interest statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting to Dr our chair, Dr. Arnold Manto. Dr. Manto, uh, take the meeting back to you. Thank you. Dr. Manto. I believe Dr. Manto, I'm not quite sure if Dr. Manto's audio is connected at the moment. So while we're waiting for Dr. Manto's audio to come back in, uh, Prabha, um, yes. I believe, can you announce the first speaker, Dr. Are we allowed yes. to, or should we wait? Okay, do you want to go ahead and, and introduce the first speaker and then we'll help Dr. Manto when he gets back. Okay. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Manto, I'm uh, introducing the first speaker of the FTA presentation, Dr. Ram Chandra Nayak, PhD. He's a biologist in the Division of Vaccines and uh, uh, Related uh, Product Applications, Office of the Vaccines. Uh, Dr. Nayak, go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ram Nayak from the Division of Vaccines and uh, Related Products Applications in the Office of Vaccines Research and Review at CBER FDA. I'm going to provide a brief introduction for today's advisory committee meeting regarding licensure and emergency use authorization of vaccines to prevent COVID-19 for use in pediatric populations. As you all know, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic still continues in the U.S. and worldwide. The ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic has affected individuals of all ages in the U.S. 
although uh, incidence and severity of disease are generally lower in pediatric populations compared with adults, cases of severe COVID-19 resulting in hospitalization and death have occurred in pediatric populations. Uh, CDC speakers will provide more specific details regarding epidemiology of COVID-19 in the pediatric population. COVID-19 vaccination is an important public health measure to control uh, SARS-CoV-2 in pediatric and other age groups. Now there is an intense interest in uh, pediatric COVID-19 vaccines. Regarding um, requirements of DLA, a single set of uh, basic regulatory requirements applies to all vaccines regardless of uh, uh, the technology used to produce them. Section 351 of Public Health Service Act states that a BLA can be approved based on a demonstration that the biological product is safe, pure, and potent, and the facility in which the biological product is manufactured meets standards designed to assure that the biological product continues to be safe, pure, and potent. To facilitate the manufacturing, clinical development, and licensure of COVID-19 vaccines, FDA published the guidance for industry in June 2020, which provides an <coughs> overview of uh, key considerations to satisfy regulatory requirements set forth in the IND regulations and licensing regulations for CMC and non-clinical and clinical data through development and licensure and for post-licensure uh, safety evaluation of COVID-19 vaccines. The guidance notes that the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines should be demonstrated in adequate and well-controlled clinical trials that directly evaluate the ability of the vaccine to protect humans from SARS-CoV-2 infection and or uh, disease. Additionally, the guidance notes that the safety evaluation including the size of the database required to support licensure should be no different than for other preventive vaccines for infectious diseases. Um, based on the declaration by the Secretary of the U.S. Department of uh, uh, Health and Human Services, that the COVID-19 pandemic constitutes a public health emergency, FDA may issue an EUA for a medical product after determining that certain statutory requirements are met. As an EUA of uh, a COVID-19 vaccine uh, allows for the rapid and widespread deployment for administration to millions of individuals, including healthy people, issuance of an EUA requires a determination that the known and potential benefits of the investigational product outweighs its known and potential risks based on the data from at least one well-controlled phase three clinical trial demonstrating vaccine safety and efficacy in a clear and compelling uh, manner. Issuance of an EUA for an investigational COVID-19 vaccine would require adequate manufacturing information to ensure the product's uh, quality and consistency. FDA published guidance for industry for EUA for vaccines to prevent COVID-19 originally issued in October 2020 and uh, revised later. The guidance describes the <clears throat> FDA's current recommendations regarding the need for manufacturing non-clinical and clinical data and information to support the issuance of an EUA for an investigation vaccine to prevent COVID-19. The guidance also includes the advice the FDA has been providing to the uh, potential vaccine developers. Um, previously, uh, as Dr. Gruber said, a total of four uh, WARPAC meetings occurred to discuss development and authorization of licensure of COVID-19 development and authorization or licensure of COVID-19 vaccines. The WARPAC met on October 20, 2020 to discuss in general the development, authorization and or licensure of COVID-19 vaccines. No specific uh, application was discussed at this meeting. On December, 20, December 10, 2020, the WARPAC met to discuss the EUA request for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. On December 17, 2020, the WARPAC met to discuss the EUA request for the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. And on uh, February 26, uh, 2021, 
the WORPAC met to discuss the EUA request for the Janssen COVID-19 uh, vaccines. There are, currently there are uh, three COVID-19 vaccines uh, available for use under EUA. Moderna and Janssen COVID-19 vaccines are authorized for use in adults 18 years of age and older. Uh, Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine was originally authorized for use in adolescents 12 through, uh, originally authorized for use in individuals 16 years of age and older. However, last month, FDA granted extension of emergency use of this vaccine in uh, adolescents 12 through 15 years of age. So Moderna's EUA amendment for adolescents uh, was submitted for FDA review on June 9, 2021. So currently there are no approved or authorized COVID-19 vaccines for pediatric population less than 12 years of age. Oh, this is uh, uh, the overview of today's agenda. After this introduction, uh, CDC Dr. Hanna Kirking is going to talk on epidemiology of COVID-19 in pediatric population, followed by uh, CDC Dr. Shed. Shannon Stockley, uh, who speaks on uh, operational aspects. Post-authorization surveillance activities will be uh, presented by FDA, uh, Dr. Steve Anderson, and CDC's uh, Dr. Tom uh, Shima Bukuro, uh, followed by the break. <clears throat> After the break, uh, <clears throat> FDA's Dr. Doran Fink is going to present on considerations on data to support licensure and emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines for use in pediatric populations, followed by uh, uh, additional question and answer uh, sessions. Uh, Phyllis Arthur of uh, Biotechnology Innovation Organization is going to present uh, industry perspective consideration for COVID-19 vaccine and COVID-19 vaccine pediatric trials, followed by lunch break and after lunch break, there will be open public hearing, and at the end, the committee commit discussion and uh, um, comments. There are three items for discussion today. No voting on this uh, uh, item. The first item is provided there is uh, sufficient evidence of effectiveness to support benefit of a COVID-19 preventive vaccine for pediatric age groups, for example, six to uh, less than 12 years, two to less than six years, and six months to less than two years. Please discuss the safety data, including database size and duration of follow-up that would support emergency use authorization and uh, uh, licensure. Item two is provided there is sufficient evidence of effectiveness to support benefit of a COVID-19 preventive vaccine for adolescents 12 to less than 18 years of age. Please discuss the safety data, including database size and duration of follow-up that would support licensure. And item three is, please discuss studies following licensure and or issuance of an EUA to further evaluate safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines in different pediatric age groups. Thank you. All right, Arnold, let me make sure you're unmuted. Uh, Dr. Monta, are you back? Okay, this is Arnold Monto again. I've got uh, audio but no video, so uh, let's first of all thank Dr. Nike for your introduction, which has covered uh, some of the key points that we're going to be discussing later on. Uh, Let's move on now uh, to uh, Dr. Hannah Kirking, who is uh, from uh, the uh, Medical Epidemiology Dr. Division of Dr. Monto. Diseases. Respiratory Dr. Monto. Virus. Dr. Yes. Monto, we still have our we still have time for the Q and A. Oh, we have a Q and A. Okay, excuse me. <laughs> it's all right, <laughs> sir. <laughs> All these technology issues. We do have time. Uh, we've got about uh, uh, more than uh, five minutes for Q&A. 
questions for Dr. Naik, especially about the uh, voting question, the, the discussion questions we're going to be getting to, into later on. Dr. Meisner, I see you're up there. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nick. I appreciate your presentation this morning. I would like to ask you um, a specific question, and I'm not sure who it should be uh, uh, addressed to, but perhaps you can answer. I'm thinking back over three of the recently FDA-licensed vaccines for children, and I think of uh, the, the dengue vaccine, Dengvaxia. I think of uh, the human papillomavirus vaccine. I think of the rotavirus vaccine. And can you remind us how many subjects were enrolled in those trials before a, uh, approval or licensure uh, w was granted? Because I think it's, uh, it was tens of thousands of uh, participants, but perhaps you can remind us of, of the actual numbers. Over. I would, I would invite my FDA colleagues to answer these questions. I, I, I'm, I'm not aware of those specific information. Dr. Feng? Hi, Dr. Meissner. Uh, I can uh, try to answer your question. So uh, for the, the dengue vaccine, you're, you're talking about Dengvaxia, which was approved in, in 2019. Uh, this was a vaccine that was approved uh, for use in ages 9 through 16 years, so entirely a pediatric population with no um, adult uh, safety data available at that time. It was approved based upon a clinical endpoint efficacy study that was adequately powered uh, to uh, formally uh, test uh, via statistical hypotheses uh, the efficacy of the vaccine against dengue. And so uh, by necessity uh, of the efficacy endpoint trial design, uh, that safety database was in the you know, upwards of, of 10,000 uh, pediatric re recipients in that age group of 9 to, to 16 years. Uh, in terms of the Gardasil uh, vaccine, the safety database for uh, pediatric age groups, which was initially uh, 16 to less than, than 18 years of age. Those were included amongst the total initial uh, age group of 16 to, to 26 uh, years of age uh, for which the vaccine was approved. That was, that was less, that was in the thousands. Um, and we had accompanying uh, adult safety data uh, along with that approval uh, initially for use in older adolescents. Uh, we then had uh, uh, studies in uh, several thousand uh, uh, pediatric age individuals uh, who were younger adolescents uh, and uh, some younger children, so 9 to um, uh, 15 years of age. Uh, and then for uh, the rotavirus vaccine, uh, these uh, safety databases were in the high tens of thousands, so uh, 60, 70,000. Uh, that was driven by uh, clinical endpoint efficacy study considerations again, and also uh, the desire to investigate a specific uh, adverse reaction uh, into susception, which, uh, based on experience with previous vaccines, uh, was uh, suspected to occur uh, uncommonly. Thank you. Any other Dr. questions uh, before we move on? Oh, I see Dr. Rubin's got his hand raised. Dr. Rubin. Yeah, I, just to follow up on, um, on with a comment more than a question. Um, but as I understand it, those vaccines for which we had, uh, that Dr. Fink was discussing, that had tens of thousands of children involved, had no adult safety data. So it's a little slightly different case. Is that right? Yeah. yeah yes, that's correct. So as, as I mentioned, uh, for both the dengue vaccine and uh, for the rotavirus vaccines, we had 
uh, no experience in adults prior to approval of those vaccines for, for use in the respective uh, pediatric populations. Uh, with HPV vaccines where the, the safety database uh, was, was uh, less compared to the, the rotavirus and, and dengue vaccines, we did have experience in adults. Thank you. Um, we're sort of, uh, Dr. Fink, before you go, uh, I just want to, uh, we're getting a little ahead of the game because uh, m uh, our discussion, which we have a lot of time for, is this afternoon. But I wanted to uh, uh, raise the another issue to think about as we go through. And that is that because of the experience with adults, when we have our discussion, we are to focus on safety issues and not on efficacy issues. Is that correct? So I, I will cover this uh, during my presentation. We are asking the committee to focus their discussion on uh, safety issues. We have uh, a very well-established regulatory precedent uh, for demonstrating effectiveness in pediatric populations, uh, including in the situation where uh, clinical endpoint efficacy for the vaccine has previously been demonstrated uh, in adults. So I will get into those details during my presentation. But yes, we are asking the committee to focus their discussion on safety issues. Right. I just wanted to bring that up because we, again, are getting ahead of the game. But, uh, so we're, uh, I just want to keep everything in mind uh, so that uh, uh, we remember all this as we go through the next presentations. And thank you, Dr. Fink. And now, uh, finally, uh, I will call on uh, Dr. Kirking, uh, Dr. Hannah Kirking. Uh, from uh, the respiratory virus branch at CDC, uh, who will tell us about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in pediatric populations. Dr. Uh, uh, Kirking, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit more about the epi component of the discussion. Um, I'd like to start with a brief overview of the current status of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic globally and within the United States. As of June 1st, there have been over 170 million confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 with over 3.5 million deaths. The burden of the disease has been highest in the WHO regions of the Americas and Europe. Um, incidents globally of SARS-CoV-2 reached its highest peak in mid-April, driven largely by cases in Southeast Asia. This occurred after a previous peak in January of 2021 that was driven by cases in the Americas and in Europe. Globally, the incidence of cases has increased and decreased over time, and the trends have been driven by different geographic regions. This slide shows the daily and moving seven-day average incidence of SARS-CoV-2 cases within the United States. As of June 4th, there were over 33 million total cases reported. The current seven-day average of 14,349 daily new cases continues a downward trajectory with a 35.2% decrease compared to the week prior. Similarly, this graph shows SARS-CoV-2 deaths in the United States over time. Almost 600,000 deaths have been attributed to SARS-CoV-2. The seven-day moving average count on June 4th was down 21.6% compared to the week prior. And for the most part, trends in deaths continue to follow the trends in case counts. Now let's transition and talk specifically about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in children and adolescents. I thought we would first start with a review of what is already published, as there are numerous published studies and reviews. Early reports that relate to the epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 and, and children specifically largely utilized convenience and or observational data. This was largely an opportunistic use of data that was available, um, while better systems and or studies were being developed and or starting to enroll participants. The other thing to note is that analyses of children 
often includes participants less than 18 years of age, all grouped together. In summary, the published literature on infection and transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in children remains largely mixed. Some studies suggest that children are infected less. Others show that infection rates are similar to those seen in adults. Some studies show that children transmit virus less, and others show that transmission is similar for children as it is in adults. I want to review a couple important epidemiologic principles before I transition to highlighting some of the important data. First and foremost, young children are not physiologically or socially equivalent to older children, adolescents, or adults, and I realize everyone probably is well aware of this. Um, but it's a reminder that age should be disaggregated whenever possible, for example, into finer age bands of less than five years, six to 11 years, or 12 to 17 years, as an example. Secondly, we have to beware biases when interpreting data related to COVID-19 in children. Exposures and behaviors both impact the observed infection rates that we see, not only biologic differences. Incidence and transmission estimates should be unbiased by care-seeking behavior. So in short, if you, if you do not look for infected children outside of clinical settings, you're probably going to miss them. And lastly, universal testing is important when trying to understand the epidemiology of COVID-19 in children. Testing should be done independent of presence or absence of symptoms when trying to better understand rates of infection and transmission risk. So the epidemiology of COVID-19 in children definitely differs from that in adults. Uh, and this is due to many factors that ultimately lead to a child becoming infected or not infected. Each is important for understanding the transmission patterns. And this is kind of a breakdown of the important epidemiologic factors um, for us to consider and that, we've been, that we do have increasing data to inform our understanding. To start with, in general, children are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. From various studies, when testing systematically in children exposed to SARS-CoV-2, children are as likely to have infections detected as adults. However, one caveat to consider is that the risk of exposure for children relative to adults has changed dramatically over the course of the pandemic. For example, at the start of the pandemic, uh, full societal shutdown likely benefited children more than adults meaning it likely reduced exposures for, children's more, for children more than it did for adults. Um, this pattern that we see of kids relative to adults has likely dramatically changed when schools reopened and when society has reopened more broadly, which does change the risk for children. The next factor considers the risk for transmission. Children and adolescents can transmit SARS-CoV-2, and I'll review some data specifically on this topic. We now have studies with strong methods that account for differences in exposures and include universal testing. Within these studies, we are seeing that children are transmitting SARS-CoV-2. And then finally, there's clinical factors and outcomes to consider. Children and adolescents are less likely to seek testing for SARS-CoV-2 and are less likely to require medical care. This is due to the fact that the risk for symptomatic and severe illness is lower in children and in adolescents um, relative to most adult age groups. Now I want to review some important and fairly new data with all of you. This data is from the Coronavirus Household Evaluation and Respiratory Testing Cohort Study. This is a prospective cohort of households that include children less than 18 years. The presence of a child in the household, household is required for enrollment but all household members are enrolled and followed. Enrollment uh, is in two sites, um, one in New York City and the other including select counties in the state of Utah. The cohort includes 1,196 individuals uh, across 300 households, and they're enrolled, they were originally enrolled in fall of 2020. Individuals in the cohort participate in weekly surveillance testing for SARS-CoV-2 infection. In addition to weekly testing that is independent of symptoms, they respond to weekly inquiries about whether they have had any illness symptoms that need a COVID-like illness case definition. In addition to their weekly screening with mid turbinate nasal swabs, individuals also collect an additional swab at the onset of any COVID symptoms. Uh, and all the viral testing is done via RT-PCR. This slide shows the incident rates of SARS-CoV-2 infection per 1,000 person weeks 
by age group overall and at each site. These are data from September 2020 through February 2021, when both sites uh, during this time period experienced a clearly defined single wave of SARS-CoV-2 circulation. The different colored bars indicate four age groups, children less than or zero to four years, five to 11 years, 12 to 17 years, and adults 18 years of, and older. As you can see here, incident rates were similar across the age groups at both sites and overall among the cohort, as indicated. This slide includes data from Flutes C, an ongoing household transmission study in Tennessee and Wisconsin. Whereas the last study I described was a cohort study, this is a case ascertained household transmission study in which lab confirmed SARS-CoV-2 index cases and all household contacts are enrolled to assess secondary infection rates. The top of the table on the left shows the age category of the primary case, or the first case in the household to develop illness or to test positive. The numbers of total household contacts are also shown in the first column. The second column shows the secondary infection rate of household contacts. In general, the top part of the table captures transmission risk from various age categories. As you can see, secondary infection rates for primary cases ages 0 to 4 was 46%. Secondary infection rates for household members where the primary case was 5 to 11 years was 64%. The third column and the graph on the right shows the risk ratio of secondary infection rates for each age group relative to the reference group age 18 to 49 year olds. As you can see, there is not a statistical difference between secondary infection rates for children primary cases relative to adult primary cases. Uh, the bottom part of the table captures ages of contacts and their secondary infection rates, somewhat analogous to the last study we described. And as you can see here, there's no statistical difference between secondary infection rates for child contacts compared to their adult, uh, compared to adult contacts. This slide is from an early field epidemiology household transmission investigation that was done in Utah and Wisconsin. This slide compares the presence of symptoms in children and adults with COVID-19 after household exposures. Um, by way of disclosure, the age categories here do group all individuals less than 18 years into one category. But as you can see, in general, younger children and adolescents have less symptomatic illness when infected with SARS-CoV-2 than adults. Um, children have more upper respiratory symptoms, largely driven by rhinorrhea and runny nose, uh, but they have significantly less lower respiratory symptoms. The same pattern with children being less symptomatic has definitely held up through several studies throughout the pandemic. Let's transition and talk a little bit more about hospitalizations. We also see that children have lower hospitalizations than adults of all ages. This graph shows the number of new COVID-19 hospital admissions per 100,000 population, stratified by age. The yellow dotted line shows 0 to 17 years. The solid black line shows the total for all ages. And the purple line at the top shows the hospitalization rates for those 70 plus years. The graph on the right shows children and adolescent hospitalization rates placed on a different y-axis than the graphic on the left. The y-axis for the graph on the right showing children 0 to 17 years is over a scale of magnitude lower than the graphic on the right. This slide shows um, disaggregated rates of hospitalization for children and adolescents, and it's from the MMWR that was just published last week. In short, it shows hospitalization rates for children and adolescents throughout the pandemic um, by using CDC's COVID net hospitalization surveillance data. The y-axis shows hospitalization rates per 100,000 population, and the x-axis shows the calendar week throughout the pandemic. Um, ages 0 and 4 are shown in the solid blue line. Ages 5 to 11 are shown in the wide dashed line, and ages 12 to 17 are shown in the narrow dashed line. As you can see, younger children and those between 0 and 4 years and adolescents between 12 and 17 years had higher hospitalization rates compared to children 5 to 11. And furthermore, we also have looked at seroprevalence data by age. 
Um, in summary for this slide, CDC is partnering with commercial laboratories to conduct and publish results from large-scale geographic seroprevalence testing that uses de-identified clinical blood specimens from all 50 states, D.C., and Puerto Rico. Um, and they use these residual specimens for SARS-CoV-2 antibody testing. The survey includes people of all ages who have blood specimens tested for reasons unrelated to COVID, such as routine or sick visits in which blood was collected and tested by one of three private commercial labs um, across the 52 sites. The data presented here is from the latest round of testing covering the period from February 15th through March 21st, 2021. These um, are anti-nucleocapsid estimates and therefore do not take into account vaccination-induced seropositivity. The data shown here is available on CDC's website and it's updated regularly as testing is scheduled to continue throughout the rest of this year. As you can see, seroprevalence among children and adolescents 0 to 17 years is actually the highest among all age groups. Um, notably, although a finer age band uh, illustration is not presented on this slide, we have assessed this and a manuscript for publication is currently under development. Importantly, when we look at children 0 to 11 years, versus children 12 to 17 years, both age groups have approximately the same seroprevalence. Or put another way, younger children's seroprevalence is similar to that of older children and adolescents in this most recent survey. Taking all of the epidemiologic differences I just reviewed and incorporating that evidence, CDC has created a model that estimates the burden of SARS-CoV-2 by age and different disease outcomes within the U.S during the pandemic uh, to date. The goal of these age-specific burden estimates are to better approximate the true number of cases, symptomatic illnesses, and hospitalizations to date. Age categories are listed in the first column on the table, followed by point estimates and uncertainty intervals for rates of infection, rates of symptomatic illness, and rates of hospitalization. All of the rates shown are per 100,000 population. As you can see, infection rates in children 0 to 4 are estimated to be lower than older children and adults. However, school-age children and adolescents between the ages of 5 and 17 have had infection rates similar to those in some of the adult age categories. When looking at symptomatic illness, you can see a similar pattern. Rates of symptomatic illness in children 0 to 4 are lower than older children, adolescents, and adults. Children and adolescents between 5 and 17 have infection rates similar to those in the adult age categories. Importantly, hospitalization rates among children, including younger and older children, are lower than all of the adult age categories. Um, of note, these estimates are updated regularly as we gain more data and are publicly available also on CDC's website. Patterns in the burden estimates will change with time as other public health policies evolve. An important example of this may be variable vaccination across different age groups. I want to transition and talk a bit more about a specific severe clinical 19 outcome or multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children is an illness in persons aged less than 21 years that's characterized by fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius, multisystem organ involvement, lab evidence of inflammation, and a current or recent diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection or exposure with no alternative plausible diagnosis. Um, by way of history, MISC was first identified in April of 2020 in a cluster of children in Europe who experienced hyperinflammatory shock following SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, in May of 2020, CDC developed a case definition, published a health advisory, and requested suspected cases of MISC in the U.S. to be reported to the health departments. Since then, 51 jurisdictions have reported MISC cases to CDC. Um, CDC has been working to summarize the cases reported to our national surveillance system to better describe and understand MISC. Uh, and this data included is what has been reported through, um, I think, May of 2021. So since May of 2020, uh, CDC has received reports of 4,118 confirmed cases of MISC in the U.S. with onset between February uh, 19, 2020 and May 18, 
2021. Shown here is the epidemic curve plotting the seven-day moving average number of MISC cases represented by the solid line and COVID-19 cases represented by the dotted line. The left y-axis defines the number of daily average MISC cases in units of five. The right y-axis defines the number of daily average COVID-19 cases among all ages in units of 50,000. The grayed out area on the right side of the figure represents the most recent three-week uh, period for data of which reporting is still incomplete. Cases of MISC have occurred in three waves, and you can visually see the peaks of MISC following the peaks of COVID-19 infection. The mean age of MISC cases is nine years. Um, the graph on the right shows the distribution of MISC cases by age. 60% of the cases are male, and of the oh. 2000, and among the patients with complete race and ethnicity information, 31%, oh, sorry, 32% are Hispanic Latino, and 30% are non-Hispanic Black. 37% um, of MISC cases report a pre-existing condition and obesity and chronic lung disease were the most frequently reported. So let's quickly summarize all of this. Here are the highlights of what I've presented. Um, as of June 4th, there have been over 33 million cases of COVID-19 and almost 600,000 deaths in the United States. Children have lower rates of hospitalization and mortality compared to adults. Children are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, so younger children with infections tend to have fewer lower respiratory symptoms compared to adults. From prospective cohort and household transmission studies, infection rates are similar across age groups. Uh, children can transmit SARS-CoV-2 to others and with similar efficiency as adults. Uh, MISC is a severe complication of SARS-CoV-2 infection and has had varied clinical presentations. And finally, MISC is highest and disproportionately so among Black and African American children and Hispanic and Latino children. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kirking. Uh, I see uh, Dr. Gantz has her hand raised. Dr. Gantz. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your presentation, and I really um, appreciated you giving us that comprehensive sort of history on pediatrics. I had a couple of questions, because I think you pointed out a very important aspect of the data, and that we can't clump these age groups together. And I think that a little more granular data needs to be, um, if you have it, provided um, Particularly, if you take the so the zero to five year um, or less than five year, whatever zero to four, also I think is too um, aggregated. And so, if you could take the newborn data out of that, because we know that there was a lot of newborn disease um, related to um, parental disease. Um, if you take that out, um, can you really discuss what actually the rates are? in that age group um, without that, and any predictions um, as the um, adults in the childbearing age actually are vaccinated and obviously wouldn't expose their newborns. That's my first question. My second question is, can we get a little more granularity about the one-year-olds? There was some early data showing actually a higher rate of um, intensive care use in that group, and it was not clear if that was just severity of disease or discomfort with these young children who were infected, known to be infected with SARS-CoV-2, um, because I think that's going to be very important as we understand vaccination in these very young um, children. Thank you. Yeah, I think, thank you for those questions, and we spent a lot of time talking about them here, um, largely because the issue of disaggregating age versus having numbers to show uh, relative patterns has been an ongoing challenge. Um, I will admit that I don't know that I have <laughs> a strong answer to your questions right today in terms of disaggregating the zero to four age group specifically. Um, I, will, uh, I will have to check with colleagues and see how much they've looked at the newborn disease versus the, the, older, the older part of that age cohort and see how much more we can kind of tease out of it. Part of the challenge is, is 
um, you know, our large scale surveillance data at least, getting the more granular details that, that we always want as clinicians to understand or be able to make sure is standardized across the reporting is, is a lot harder than it might seem. So, um, but yes, totally appreciate the need for even further dis, uh, age disaggregates and um, we'll share that back. We are talking a little bit across our, our epi task force here at CDC about pushing across the board. You know, obviously we don't produce all of the data, but pushing for more finally disaggregated data because anyone working in pediatrics knows that, yeah, a newborn is not a four-year-old and a one-year-old is not a four-year-old, especially when it comes to, to respiratory viruses. Thank you so much. Dr. Hildreth. Um, Dr. Kirkin, first, thank you for this great uh, overview and summary. What does the data look like when you look at children with underlying conditions like obesity or asthma or sickle cell? Does it, do the numbers change when you take that into consideration? And could it be that the underlying conditions in minority children are related to them having a higher rate of MIS, MIS syndrome? Is that possible? Can you repeat that last part of the question, Dr. Hildreth? So I was wondering whether or not underlying conditions were related to the higher frequency of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in minority children? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think to your earlier questions, you know, children that do have comorbidities are higher risk. Um, so it's not particularly surprising that's holding true from the, the other retroviruses that we're more familiar with, um, as well as in COVID-19. In terms of the relationship um, between, uh, I guess I would say, race and ethnicity, comorbidities, and MISC, um, I think there's a complex relationship there that we're still working to understand. Um, mm -hmm. The first question I think that we've received a lot is, are the MISC, um, the higher rates of MISC in some of the racial minorities that we see, is that related to their risk of infection alone? or is it something on top of just infection or incidence in that population? Um, initially, there wasn't a lot of data in there, but there is a paper coming out that's been re-looking at our surveillance data more broadly, coming out today, actually. <laughs> I didn't cover it because it's embargoed, but um, in short, it'll show and suggest that if, even if you correct for increased incidence rates in Latino and, and Black and African American children, it seems like the the increased burden of MISC, there might be something additionally on top of that. Um, I'm not sure how much we've been able to stratify to see how much of that might be accounted by comorbid medical conditions, like you suggest. Um, uh, but definitely, I will take that back to the, the individuals leaving that part of it. I don't know that we have the numbers yet to say strongly that we can stratify by all three of those different things. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, of course. Uh, Dr. Meisner, and I better warn everybody, we're going to have to restrict the questions in a little while because you're re really running over. Dr. Meisner, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Monto, and thank you, Dr. Kirkin, for uh, such an interesting presentation, and thanks to you and everyone else at the CDC who is uh, providing such remarkable data. The question, I, I guess it's more of a comment rather than a question. If I look at the most recent rates of hospitalization among uh, individuals under 18 years of age, and this is at the CDC site, the rate is 0 0.4 per 100,000. That means four per million. And the MMWR report that uh, you cited ends on April 24th. And if you look at the slope of the curve since April 24th, the number of hospitalizations is going down quite dramatically. So I very strongly believe we need a vaccine for adolescents and children. But I want to be sure that the risk of the vaccine is less than the risk of hospitalization because four per million certainly does not constitute an emergency and 
there are significant questions about the safety of this vaccine. So maybe you could comment about what's happened in the six weeks since that MMWR report. And I'll also note that, co that uh, Ms. C, if I could read your table correctly, is, is getting pretty close to zero cases. So as we generate herd immunity, this disease is, is, is disappearing between the vaccine and natural immunity. So just playing the devil's advocate here, um, I, I think we need a BLA before we can approve this for children. But how would you respond? Yeah, I was kind of expecting this question because uh, I think it's, it's the million dollar question right now. Um, I think broadly, you know, I think you described the patterns of hospitalization and MISC, that as case counts are falling, those are also falling rapidly for children. So there's not a, a big surprise in that. I think the, the challenge for me is I, I grapple, you know, and as a, um, by way of background, I'm internal medicine and pediatric trained both. So I've been making some of these comparisons throughout the pandemic. Um, but I think the thing that's a challenge for me is that you have a risk benefit ratio on an individual level. And you have a, or a sorry, uh, uh, yeah, risk benefit ratio on the individual level and a risk benefit ratio on a population level. And so I'm not sure where the balance is with how you try, you know, triangulate both of those considerations. Um, as case counts fall, the negative outcomes from COVID virus itself, um, whether that's cases, hospitalizations, MISC, are also falling. Um, Having said that, there's no guarantee that the current, you know, general case count that we're seeing in the U.S. is going to stay as low as it is right now. We're all hopeful, myself more than anyone, that pattern does continue, um, but we don't know. And, there, you know, there's the variables out there of, of variants, and we can't ignore what's happening outside the U.S. and how that may or may not impact our curve here. So we'll see on that. I think the thing that epidemiologically I also have to consider are not just the, the risk benefits from a medical standpoint, but there's also kind of the societal risk benefits too of, of what children, what ch role children play in the overall pandemic across society. And so how to balance that I think is much harder. And as I was trying to think about, you know, this presentation, I don't know that there's a precedent for something like this in, in the question that you all are grappling with right now. And, and things that I would think about would be, you know, as children return to school increasingly, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, um, and the importance of other mitigation measures, you know, I, I do think there is some risk for transmission in, in any pool of people that are not vaccinated, um, but that risk is related to background community rates as well. So it's a little bit of a moving target. Um, but, you know, in addition to health outcomes, vaccine outcomes, there's big outcomes such as keeping schools open and having child care available for the rest of America. And that's the part that I think is, is tough. So I appreciate that the risk benefit ratio for the individual is, is rapidly changing. Um, and then that societal one is as well, but with some question mark of, of what could happen, you know, in the upcoming months. Sorry. I don't know that I have the magic answer, <laughs> but that's how I'm but thinking about it in my mind. I, I don't think anybody has the magic answer. Uh, one more question, and Dr. Kirking, uh, could you be sure to hang around till this afternoon when we have our general discussion? I'm sure there are going to be more questions about uh, 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 risk as we tackle risk benefits. So uh, uh, just one more question right now from Dr. Levy. Hello. Hello, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, a few things briefly. Uh, I'd like to agree with Dr. Haley Gantz that it's very important to get more granularity on the pediatric data. I know you're limited by what's captured, but this is a plea that we partner in the future to capture with more granularity. The pediatric, the, the child immune system is changing across days. 
let alone weeks, let alone months and years. So just to have it in, in years of life really does a disservice. And as we know, if we take sepsis as an example, you take adult sepsis criteria, apply it to school-age kids, you miss a lot of sepsis. You apply the pediatric school-age sepsis criteria to newborns, you miss all of the sepsis. So it, it, there's really an ontogeny here, a change with age in the immune system, and we've got to really be more granular in capturing that. And that would be, I think, within the spirit of the Pediatric Research Equity Act, or PREA, which is alluded to in the briefing document. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. The other thing is you talked a little bit about seroprevalence. Did those seroprevalence studies take into account that the pediatric uh, response to infection with SARS-CoV-2 is distinct? And children mount a different type of antibody response that's narrower, that tends to have uh, fewer antibodies and fewer types of antibodies. So the conventional seroassays might not capture all of the pediatric infection, and we might just be catching the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, thank you for the comments. Um, definitely noted on the age dis disaggregation and trying to get to finer age groups. I 100% agree with that. And like I said, we had a lot of discussion even upcoming to this presentation to get as granular as we could, uh, and for sure there's desire to even go further. Um, in terms of uh, your second question, remind me your second question. My apologies. With zero, with zero prevalence. There's work yes. by Don Farber and others published in prominent journals saying that children mount a different type of antibody response to this infection, and the conventional assays don't always pick it up. So I would wholeheartedly say that there is truth to that, um, and that you know these zero prevalence surveys are for sure trying to recognize the pattern and show the signal. I would not hang my hat heavily because there's still a lot more unknowns of what's not captured and, you know, a seroprevalence survey of, of a good sample population, not perfect, using a nucleocapsid uh, antibody test. Um, on the CDC website, there is a link to, to the broader data and to the, the methods that that, that estimate includes, um, but I do agree with you. I think it, it might not be telling the whole picture due to differences in the immunologic response in adults and kids. And finally, we, we don't know too much about long-term effects of the infection in children. They might not manifest acute symptoms, but there's more to be learned. Wouldn't there be more to be learned about the long-term effects of this infection early on? Yes, absolutely. Thank 100%. you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Kirk, uh, Kirkling, and please uh, hang around for this afternoon. We're going to have a vigorous discussion uh, related to uh, risk. Next, I'd like to ask Dr. Shannon Stokely uh, from uh, the Associate Director of Sciences Office at CDC to talk briefly about operational aspects. Thank you, and good morning. And thanks for this opportunity to talk about uh, implementation of COVID-19 vaccination for adolescents in the United States. So as you're aware, after the FDA approved the expansion of the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to be used for adolescents aged 12 to 15 years, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices met on May 12th and voted to recommend this vaccine for this age group. And the recommendation was also published in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And clinical considerations for use of the vaccine were posted on the CDC website. So with the approval of the vaccine for adolescents, we wanted to promote vaccination for this age group as quickly and equitably as possible, and we did this using a multi-pronged approach. So the plan started with relying on the existing infrastructure, such as mass vaccination sites and pharmacies, to open up their appointment systems to include adolescents. And this is followed by strategically enrolling primary care providers as COVID-19 vaccine providers. And then finally, we plan to apply school-focused strategies, such as school-located vaccination clinics during the late summer and early fall, as children prepare to return to school. And while I present this as a, as a phased approach, in reality, in most states, these activities are being implemented concurrently. With the planned approach, primary care providers are very important as they are tested by families and are usually the place where children receive their routine vaccines. Parents have confidence in their providers and prefer for their children to be vaccinated in this setting. 
Um, however, there have been challenges with enrolling providers because of the packaging of the vaccine, especially for the Pfizer vaccine. Many sites are not able to handle the minimum order size of 1,170 doses or the newly available packs of 450 doses because of their patient volume may be too small. So unless uh, the packaging becomes smaller or jurisdictional immunization programs are able to break down the package and redistribute vaccine in smaller quantities, many providers are not interested in enrolling in the program. And this could have implications for future vaccination efforts um, if the vaccine were to be recommended for younger children, as we know most of them uh, prefer to uh, receive their vaccine in the primary care office. Pharmacies and HRSA sites, such as federally qualified health centers, are also very important to implementation, and especially in areas that may be underserved, such as rural areas, uh, where they may be the only source of health care for some people. And lastly, school-based vaccination will be an important strategy for vaccination as children get ready to start the new school year in August and September, and especially for children who were not early adopters of the vaccine. Um, many states implemented school-located vaccination clinics as soon as the vaccine was authorized for adolescents, and many more have plans to conduct them in the late summer and early fall. Um, with the introduction of the vaccine for adolescents, we were frequently asked about consent for vaccination among minors, and the federal government does not have specific requirements for medical consent for vaccination. Um, this is determined at the state and local level. So therefore, healthcare providers must follow their state laws when providing vaccine to adolescents. And these laws do vary by state. For example, in one state, a child age 15 can self-consent for vaccination, whereas in another state, the age of consent may be age 18. But again, providers must follow their state laws and any policy requirements from their own organization when administering vaccine to adolescents. So this slide shows progress to date with COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, the line graph shows vaccination coverage by age group with adolescents age 12 to 15, depicted by the dashed yellow line. And as of June 7th, over 171 million individuals have received at least one dose of COVID vaccine. And that is almost 52% of the U.S. population. Among adolescents age 12 to 15, over 3.4 million, or 23%, have received at least one dose of COVID vaccine. It's also worth noting that 39% of adolescents aged 16 to 17 years, shown in the solid yellow line, have received at least one dose. When COVID vaccine became available for adolescents, CDC also updated its guidance about co-administration of COVID vaccine with other vaccines. So now COVID vaccine and other vaccines may be administered without regard to timing. And that means vaccines can be administered on the same day or within 14 days of each other. And when deciding whether to co-administer other vaccines with the COVID-19 vaccine, providers should consider if the patient is behind or at risk of becoming behind on recommended vaccines, their risk of vaccine-preventable diseases, and the reactogenicity profile of the vaccine. These updated co-administration recommendations may facilitate catch-up vaccination of adolescents. The pandemic has had an impact on the delivery of routine vaccines in the United States, and we have been monitoring routine vaccine orders through our Vaccines for Children program. And as of June 6, orders are down cumulatively by 12 million doses compared to what we were seeing um, pre-pandemic in 2019. And when we look at this by vaccine, we see that vaccines primarily given to adolescents have been the most impacted. And compared to pre-pandemic, um, or compared to the pre-pandemic time, vaccine orders are down 18% for Tdap and HPV vaccines, and down 12% for meningococcal conjugate vaccine. So as parents are bringing their children in to get a COVID-19 vaccine, we encourage providers to remind them about the importance of staying up to date on routine vaccines. If vaccines can be given during the same visit, that's fine, but if not, parents should make follow-up appointments so their child can get caught up if they're behind. 
And to help inform parents about COVID-19 vaccine for adolescents, CDC has developed a lot of materials, both print and digital. We have specific web pages devoted to vaccination of teens. We have fact sheets and also a toolkit for pediatric healthcare providers for how to communicate with their patients. And we also have frequently asked questions and other information to dispel myths. And shown on this slide is just a list of resources that are available in, in the link. So again, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, uh, Dr. Chatterjee? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Stokely, for your presentation. I have two questions for you. The first is with regard to education of providers. You uh, listed uh, some um, materials that have been developed for education of patients and, and um, parents. But I was curious, because this is a, such a complex subject uh, with regard to the moving target of the pandemic itself, the epidemiology, uh, and the uh, almost daily um, sets of information that come out with regard to uh, vaccine adverse effects and things like that. So what is the CDC doing to prepare providers should they agree and, and should the packaging um, change and, and the vaccine become available in, in a way that uh, providers can actually get this vaccine in their clinics? Great question. So part of the onboarding process of when a provider is enrolled as a COVID-19 vaccination provider is a requirement for training, and, and many states have this requirement before they will approve the provider. We have websites um, with training materials specifically about the vaccine products, um, about storage, handling, administration, and I know there's also materials from the manufacturers themselves that we recommend they view as well. Um, we also have our clinical guidelines website that uh, is updated frequently as things evolve and has information uh, to help them with implementing and administering the vaccine in their practice. Thank you. Uh, my second question is with regard to those resources that have been developed for patients and uh, parents and guardians, and that is whether they are available in multiple languages um, that uh, the, the patients may, may need those resources in? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do have um, resources translated into several languages. I'm not sure of all the languages that are available, but I know there, and um, we typically do trans have translated uh, information because we know that's important to the, for patients to receive information in a language that, you know, is their preferred language. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Yeah, so I just have a short question. In looking at the vaccination rates of uh, the adolescents, do the, is the uptake parallel their, uh, the older people in the same geographical areas? Is there any disparity there? Or is it just the people in the parts of the country that have higher rates of vaccination in total? Those the places that have higher rates of adolescent vaccination? That's a really good question, and I don't know that I have the answer for that. I know, um, especially with uh, the initial rollout of COVID-19 vaccine, you know, the older population was prioritized, and we've reached over 85%, I think, coverage for adults age 65 and over. Um, I, I have not seen analysis done where we've compared at a, a more local level coverage for the older population or adult population compared to adolescents, but that's something we can look into. I do know that, um, you know, coverage, you know, increased pretty quickly for adolescents age 12 to 15 initially, and we're hoping that that continues over time. Thank you. Dr. McGinnis. I have withdrawn my hand. Question answered. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gantz, final question. Yes, 
Thank you very much. Um, I had just um, one question about the co-administration. I know the recommendation was highly um, based on the fact that obviously um, individuals were behind and we really want to encourage the usual preventive measures that we have and I think that that's very, very important. But I wondered if you could talk about actually any data that actually would have um, been the basis of those um, recommendations. Um, there's not a lot of biological reason that this, these immunizations, SLA, would interfere with other um, co-administered in children vaccinations. However, we have seen, obviously, in other um, similar situations where there was some effect on the vaccines that were being given for their routine illnesses, we wouldn't want to interact with that, such as um, Prevnar with meningococcus. So I, I think that it's important um, to realize whether this was data-driven recommendations to catch people up with uh, not a lot of biologic reason, um, and what what further information um, would be forthcoming in the survey. Yeah, my understanding is, um, you know, the initial recommendation or, you know, guidance around co-administration was following the clinical trials and how they were implemented. It was not necessarily due to a concern of safety. It was just that's how the vaccine was tested in the clinical trials. But given that by the time this was implemented for adolescents, we've had hundreds of millions of doses administered to adults, um, there did not seem to be a safety issue. Um, I might defer to Dr. Amanda Cohn, our chief medical officer, um, to perhaps provide more context for how the decision was made around co-administration. I wasn't involved with that decision. Yeah, thank you. And just, it wasn't really a safety concern, but an immunogenicity concern. Right. I don't know if Dr. Cohn is available. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going now to post authorization surveillance activities, and we have a tandem presentation here. First, Dr. Stephen Anderson of CBER, FDA, and then Dr. T uh, Tom Shimbakuro of uh, uh, CDC, uh, and you, uh, uh, you're on. Thank you very much. All right, good morning. Um, as, as mentioned, my name is Steve Anderson. I'm director for the Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the Center for Biologics. And yeah. today I'm just going to give a, a brief update on some of the COVID-19 vaccine safety activities that we've been working on. Um, so we, we generally divide our activities into passive surveillance and active surveillance. Um, Tom Shimabukuro, who follows me, is going to be talking a lot about, is going to be talking about bears and current updates there. So I won't be um, presenting on that topic um, in this presentation. But what I will be focusing on is FDA's work um, in its active surveillance monitoring programs. Um, specifically, um, we've engaged two sort of data systems. One is um, FDA is working with the CMS Medicare data in collaboration um, with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and that's largely a claims data system. And we also have our in-house system, which is the FDA BEST system. And for the purposes of this presentation, the focus really is going to be on the claims data because those have considerable power to be used um, in vaccine safety surveillance and relevant here. Um, so talking just a bit a very brief overview of Medicare data. Um, the first bullet really mentions that it covers 34 million persons as the database that we're using um, for persons 65 years of age and older. Um, I realize that today's um, present is, topic is um, adolescents and children and pediatric population, so we'll be talking about that in a moment. Um, but just wanted to mention also um, the aspect of the systems that we're using. Um, the best system, um, the Biologics Effectiveness and Safety Initiative, uses sort of large claims data systems, as I mentioned, um, from three large um, data partners or collaborators. 
Um, they're large insurers that consist of Optum, CVS Health, and then Health Corps. Um, I just want to mention in advance that um, they're very important partners in the work that we do, and we really couldn't do the work without them um, engaging with us. I um, just wanted to mention an emphasis in our work on detection of adverse events, but also specifically rare adverse events with these large data systems. Um, so talking about the, the specific data systems, I wanted to give you a thumbnail sketch of the coverage of these systems. Um, so, so basically in the third column you see the millions, the number in millions of the persons covered or number of patients covered in our data system. Um, overall, those add up to approximately 200 million persons that are covered, and CMS has the bulk of those, as you can see. Um, and the others, Optum, CVS Health, Health Corps, um, again, have tens of millions of patients that they cover. Um, the important thing, too, about these data is the frequency which would they're up with with which they're updated. So for instance, CMS is updated daily, Optum is sort of every, every two weeks, and then some are longer, they go to monthly updates. Um, just moving on to the next slide. So I think the relevant question for this audience really is how many doses of vaccines are in these data systems that'll be relevant for analyses? So, you can see those the total numbers displayed here, and and just sort of adding them up. I think CMS is 17 million, um, and the others go between sort of three million for Optum, down to um, approximately six million for Health Corps, and 2.6 million or so for CVS Health. So again, it's up, it's slightly less than 30 million doses overall. Um, that we have access to for our data analyses. We're actively conducting near real-time surveillance in the first two data systems. Obviously, CMS, we've been working quite a while with that, and then Optum just came on in the past uh, two weeks. Um, I just wanted to mention um, our near real-time surveillance, and you've heard us talk before at this meeting about the near real-time surveillance or the rapid cycle analysis. Um, we're looking at 16 adverse events, and these, um, this approach has been used previously by government agencies during H1N1, so it has a sort of a successful track record. Um, and it's been used probably in the last, each of the last 10 years by um, FDA and CDC for their annual monitoring of the influenza vaccine. Um, here are sort of the 16 different adverse events of special interest. And I just wanted to mention initially the choices were made based on adverse events that were previously studied in vaccines um, but hadn't um, sort of had signals in the preauthorization clinical studies. Um, and now you can look through and see that some of them that we're looking at obviously have now signaled. So for instance, anaphylaxis um, in the upper left-hand corner. Um, but also we added thrombosis with thrombocytopenia because of the, the Janssen vaccine and the cerebral venous thrombosis cases that were identified in the past few months with that vaccine um, as something we're carefully monitoring. So those are the, the sort of um, types of outcomes we're evaluating. And then this just gives you, the, this is a government-wide approach. FDA is working with CDC. Um, and the Veterans Administration. So this gives you a coverage idea um, of the databases. Um, and I just wanted to point to the bottom, which is those for the pediatric population. So um, the vaccine safety data link from CDC and the best do have coverage um, for those persons 17 years of age um, and younger. So this just gives you an idea about our data sources and their coverage. Um, as you can see, there's um, reasonable coverage. Again, just various partners, they span from about three to four million total um, in the population um, 17 years and younger. So a, a reasonable amount of power. Obviously, we'd always like more data, um, but but it's a reasonable amount of power to do analyses. 
And then myocarditis is going to be talked about by um, Dr. Shima Bakura, and we thought we would at least um, give uh, provide some results that we have from our new real-time surveillance to those in both the BEST and CMS systems. So for BEST, that's the often data that we have in person 16, I'm sorry, 12 to 64 years of age. Um, there isn't, a, we haven't observed a safety signal. This is probably after one run um, in the past week. So these are really fresh, fresh data, fresh results. Um, I, I just also wanted to mention that for the persons 12 to 15 years of age, um, that authorization for the Pfizer vaccine was just made in, I think, the second week of May. And so we wouldn't expect necessarily to see that age population highly represented in the data systems yet. Um, it didn't signal in CMS as well for myocarditis and pericarditis, um, but it's an observation for this outcome that's been observed largely in young, young persons 30 years of age um, and even younger. Um, so we didn't expect to see it in the CMS um, population, so it's reassuring that it didn't signal in that population as well. Um, I just wanted to mention, if we do get a signal, the steps we're going to be taking, and that's really going to be conducting more robust epidemiological studies to follow up on any potential signals we identify um, in the near real-time surveillance program. I just wanted to mention that near real-time surveillance is a nice sort of screening method, but it has a lot of limitations. It really doesn't account for many types of confounding, and so you really need to launch then a full inferential study if you do signal on something so that you can better understand um, if that signal is a true positive or not. Um, so, and I, I will just point to the SCRI as a self-controlled risk interval analysis. So, um, and we're probably going to be relying a lot on that type of methodology for our studies. And we have studies sort of um, that we're considering, obviously, for CVST and, and the thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome, um, but also myocarditis and pericarditis um, are also considered for studies um, in the future. Um, we're, I also wanted to mention the focus on subpopulations in the FDA system. So pediatrics are important to us, um, pregnant persons, um, elderly, and others, and other um, population. I just wanted to mention that um, there are several people involved in this work, probably at least a hundred or so behind the scenes and various contractors and other partners and federal partners. So um, this work is really a huge effort by many different um, groups and I'm thankful for their um, help and collaboration in accomplishing our um, safety surveillance work. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And I think Tom is going to go directly next. Hi, can people hear me? Yes, please yeah. go ahead. Okay. Yes, we can. All right. Uh, good morning, and thanks for having me. I'm going to be giving some COVID-19 vaccine safety updates. And the two topics I'll be covering are early safety data of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccination and, per, and of Pfizer BioNTech vaccination persons 12 to 15 years old, and then myocarditis and pericarditis following mRNA vaccination. So to start with um, the, the early safety data in 12 to 15 year olds, I'm going to start off with data from. Um, our VSA system, with, which is our sm smartphone-based active surveillance system that uses text messaging and, and uh, web surveys. Um, we, we monitor uh, individuals um, closely uh, daily during the, the seven, zero to seven days after vaccination, and then weekly up to six weeks, and then at three, six, and 12 months after the last vaccination. These Daily surveys during the first week act about, ask about local and systemic reactogenicity and other health impact events. So on May 11th, um, vSafe age limits were expanded to allow registration down to 12 years of age at dose one, and this is um, primarily through parents or caregivers. And as of May 31st, we had just over 46,000 
persons aged 12 to 15 years um, registered and submitted at least one health in check-in during this zero to seven day um, interval after dose one Pfizer. So here's a, here's a figure showing the top solicited reactions um, in younger adolescents um, compared to older adolescents. So this is looking at local and systemic solicited reactions in 12 to 15 year olds compared to 16 to 25 year olds. We chose um, the 16 to 25 year old comparator because that's what was used in the clinical trials. And as you can see, the, the basic reactogenicity profile of these Vaccines are, are similar in these two age groups. Um, if anything, there's a little less self-reported local and systemic reactogenicity in the 12 to 15 year old age group. So now, now I want to move on to VAERS data. And just to remind you, VAERS is our spontaneous reporting, our passive surveillance system. Um, it's our, our, our national system that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Um, VAERS accepts all reports from, from anyone, um, regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the seriousness. Its key strengths are rapid um, detection of safety problems and the ability to detect rare events. Key limitations are inconsistent quality and completeness of information, reporting biases, and generally an inability to determine cause and effect. So here's the basic um, reporting. Um, of 12 to 15 year olds, again, looking at 16 to 25 year olds for comparison, um, both the numbers and you see the numbers of doses administered under there. I don't have this on the slide, but the crude reporting rates are very similar. The breakdown of non-serious adverse events and serious adverse, adverse events are also similar between these two age groups. Here are the most commonly reported adverse events to VAERS after Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination, looking at 12 to 15 year olds, and again, 16 to 25 year olds for comparison. You can see the most commonly reported adverse events are similar. Um, there, there appears to be, uh, and these are the top 10 um, adverse events, and these are not mutually exclusive. You can have more than one adverse event in a report. Um, there may be slightly more um, adverse events, which were indicative of vasovagal reactions in the younger age group, um, the 12 to 15 year olds. Um, and th these are vasovagal or syncope or presyncope like adverse events, but generally um, fairly similar to the 16 to 25 year old age group. So moving on to myocarditis and pericarditis following mRNA vaccination, and I'm going to start off with VAERS data. Um, these are preliminary myocarditis and pericarditis reports to VAERS following mRNA vaccination in reports with dose number documented. So these had to have, these. this is limited to where there was a dose one or a dose two documented. And by preliminary reports, I mean reports that, um, reports that come to us and we detect either through a search of MEDRA codes, which is the, the, the coding that we use to, um, for these reports, or they're pre-screened before they go through the process, processing um, procedures um, because they are suggestive of myocarditis and the contractor forwards those to CDC, or when we're um, alerted to a report from a healthcare provider out there and, and we basically take the report then, or um, we go in and pull the report out based on information the healthcare healthcare provider has, has given us. So follow-up medical record review and application of the working case definition and adjudication is, is ongoing or pending in many of these reports. These are the preliminary reports. As you can see, um, there, are more do there are more reports after dose two compared to dose one, um, slightly more after Pfizer than Moderna, but there has been slightly more Pfizer vaccine doses administered. And um, also Pfizer is the only vaccine that's authorized in these younger age groups. So these are the characteristics of these preliminary reports, again, with a dose number documented. I think the take home here is that for, for reports occurring after dose two, the median age is slightly lower. Um, the median time to symptom onset may be a bit shorter, um, two days versus three days. And the, um, the, the proportion of, of male and female reports is, is different. There's a higher proportion of male reports um, 
compared to female reports in the dose two reports compared to the dose one reports. I will say that these findings and the findings on the previous slide are consistent with um, the surveillance data that emerged from Israel and also um, from other um, case series reports and from the Department of Defense um, uh, uh, reports of myocarditis after mRNA vaccination. So um, the, this, is, this, the, this analysis is limited to reports in individuals 30 years and under um, and um, focuses on the, the presenting signs and, and symptoms. And you can see overwhelmingly chest pain is the most common presenting sign, I mean symptom. Um, some patients do have dyspnea, but chest pain is really the hallmark. As you can see, uh, ST or T wave changes on e ECG and elevated troponins are common. Um, there are also um, a number of these individuals have abnormal uh, echocardio echocardiography or imaging studies. So of these um, 475 reports in individuals 30 years and under, again, this is, this is an age-limited analysis, um, we, we do have um, outcomes or disposition on a substantial number of these. So 226 of these 475 reports met the CDC working case definition and follow-up and review are in progress for the remaining. 285 um, had a known disposition. 270 had been discharged, 15 were still hospitalized. Of the 270 discharged, 91% were discharged home. Um, of these 270 discharged, the recovery status was known for 221, and 81% of these 221 had full recovery of symptoms, and 19% had ongoing signs or symptoms or an unknown recovery status. So this looks at um, preliminary myocarditis and pericarditis reports to VAERS following second, just second dose of vaccination, and it's looking at um, a 30-day observation window. So again, this is limited to second, second dose, reports after second dose, um, where the symptom onset was in 30 days, broken down by age groups. You see the doses administered there in the second column, and on the far right-hand column, you have the observed counts. These are actually the, the, these are the actual preliminary VAERS reports. Um, the expected value you see in the left, in the column just to the left of the observed is based on published literature rates. The crude reporting rate is a, a simple calculation. You just take the observed divided by the doses administered, multiply by a million, and you get the crude reporting rate per million doses administered. And you can see um, there's there's very few reports in the 12 to 15 year olds, um, so that data is a little bit um, difficult to interpret. But in the 16 to 17 year olds and the 18 to 24 year olds, the observed um, re the observed reports are exceeding the expected um, based on the background, the known background rates that are published in literature. It's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison because again, these are preliminary reports. Um, not all of these will turn out to be true myocarditis or pericarditis reports, and the expected are based on published um, literature. Of note, of these uh, 528 reports after second dose with symptom onset within 30 days, over half of them were in these younger age groups, um, 12 to 24 years old, um, whereas roughly 9% of the total doses administered were in those age groups, so um, we clearly have an imbalance there. So now I'm going to move on to our uh, data from our vaccine safety data link. This is our population-based uh, system. It's an EHR-based system, so we have complete or near complete information on our covered population, um, which, which includes nine participating integrated healthcare organizations with data on over 12 million persons per year. So these are, this is uh, doses administered through May 29th. You see about 4.8 million Pfizer-BioNTech doses and 4 million Moderna doses. And the, the breakdown between dose one and dose two, the proportions are pretty similar between these two doses. So a substantial amount of doses administered in the vaccine safety data link.
This graph looks at the, the same data, although it's broken down by age group. And the take home message on this is in these younger groups, 12 to 15 year olds and 16 to 17 year olds, we, we have limited doses administered, limited exposure um, in these age groups. We have substantial exposure in the 18 to 49 year old age group. Um, but again, in these, in these younger, um, in, in these adolescent age groups, um, to date limited vaccine doses administered. So this this is a table showing uh, showing uh, this actually shows um, a roll up of all the pre specified outcomes that we are conducting um, near real time sequential monitoring on in the vaccine safety data link. I'm looking at a 21 day risk interval. This is a vaccinated concurrent comparator analysis. Um, as you can see, we've had no statistical signals in our primary analysis. Um, for any of these pre-specified outcomes, I just want to draw your attention to the myocarditis, pericarditis, which is highlighted. Um, so this analysis is adjusted um, for for age by five-year age groups, but this is not an age-stratified analysis. So while we have not signaled here, the adjusted rate ratio is 0.94. Again, if you remember to the previous slides, there has been limited um, vaccine doses administered in those younger age groups. So what we did was um, we went and conducted an additional age stratified analysis and this is outside of the um, sequential monitoring, the surveillance activity, this is an additional analysis, um, age stratified looking in the 16 to 39 year old age group in the 21 day risk interval. Um, as we accumulate more data, we will be able to chop those ages up finer. Um, but but right now, to get meaningful results, um, we had to we had to use a fairly wide age interval. And this is by um, by vaccine type and by dose. Um, you can see on the top there for Pfizer, um, the overall analysis, the adjusted rate ratio is 0.49. And both of the both of the rate ratios after dose one and dose two are below one. However, you see this dose effect, um, where the adjusted rate ratio after dose one is 0.12 and after dose two is 0.84. So um, uh, there is evidence here of a dose effect. If you look at Moderna, the adjusted rate ratio overall is four. Um, after dose one, it's 1.74, and what's really driving that is the dose two, where we have 11 events in the risk window, and the adjusted rate ratio right now is not estimable. Um, the reason for that is we have zero events in the control interval. Um, uh, I will mention that it is early. We are still um, accumulating follow-up time, so cases moving into the control window can, can have a, a pretty substantial impact on the adjusted rate ratio, but right now, um, there's a substantial dose two effect for Moderna, and that is probably driving the overall result for Moderna. So this slide is just a straight up rates, um, post-vaccination rates, um, looking at rates after both doses, and then after dose one and dose two for combined and by product type. And what you can, uh, what you see here again is this um, second dose effect, where uh, the the rate, the myocarditis, pericarditis rate per million doses administered is substantially larger after second dose, both in the overall analysis and um, by product type, both for the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. So to sum up the findings, the initial safety findings um, for Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination in 12 to 15 year olds from vSafe and VAERS surveillance are consistent with the results from pre-authorization clinical trials. Analysis of VAERS preliminary reports of myocarditis and pericarditis is in progress, including follow-up to obtain medical records to complete reviews to apply the working case definition to adjudicate cases. The preliminary findings do suggest that the median age of reported patients is younger and median time to symptom onset is shorter among those who de develop symptoms after dose two versus dose one. There's a predominance of male patients in younger age groups, especially after dose two. I'll just mention that myocarditis is more common in males in general. The observed reports exceed expected reports after dose two um, in the 16 to 24 year old age range. 
and limited outcome data suggests that most patients had full recovery of symptoms. The early vaccine safety data link data also suggests more cases after dose two versus dose one, um, an overall rate of about 16 cases per million after second dose. And finally, an ACIP meeting is scheduled for June 18th, next Friday. That time will update the data, further evaluate myocarditis following mRNA vaccination and assess benefit risk balance. Here's some educational materials with the references. I'd like to acknowledge the following, the contributions from the following in investigators and their organizations, and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you both very much. This is uh, has become a critical issue post uh, approval, licensure, follow up for these rare side effects that would not be found in uh, the clinical trials, uh, even if we went to rather large sizes. Uh, before we get into the multiple questions that are out there, could you tell us uh, if uh, there is an approval, let's say, down to uh, six months of age, uh, which is uh, on the table? Uh, what kind of resources do you have for follow-up in young children? I don't know who wants uh, to say I, that. I can, I mean, I can start that. So the, the VSD has, um, and, and VAERS, VAERS is, as a spontaneous reporting or passive surveillance system basically has the entire U.S. population under surveillance, so anyone eligible to get a vaccine um, could potentially report to VAERS. In those age groups, it, it would be clearly through parents, caregivers, or or, or healthcare providers. Um, uh, myocarditis and pericarditis is an adverse event of special interest in our in our um, in our monitoring, um, so we are following up on every report of myocarditis, pericarditis, especially in these younger age groups, to get medical records um, to uh, adjudicate these cases and to um, confirm cases. And the vaccine safety data link, um, you know, our ages go down birth through through older adults, so we have um, coverage on on. Um, on younger individuals, on, on children um, as well. And then just to, just to follow up to the best systems and the data systems that we have, I believe we do go down to six months of age. We definitely go down to one, one year, but um, probably six months as well. I also, also mentioned that our clinical Thank immunization you. safety assessment um, project team is a uh, it's a collaboration between CDC and um, and seven uh, medical research centers, and these individuals are available to review complex cases. So, um, complex adverse events following immuniz cases of adverse events following immunization in children. Um, you know, we we have the the ability to um, work with our collaborators and, and academia to do deep dives into individual case reports, including for children. Right, and I think the issue is sensitivity, and then you can work it out after uh, after you've detected some of these uh, putative uh, adverse events. Dr. Kim. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Anderson. Uh, you, you discussed uh, best, uh, best, as in B-E-S-T, capital letters, as a, as a terrific data source for, you, for, uh, for children, um, older children, and, as well as younger children. And I'd like to ask you, uh, besides CDS, Optum, and, and Health Core, uh, are there plans to expand the, uh, the, uh, the surveillance uh, base, database, uh, that you currently have to include uh, millions of other potential uh, surveillance opportunities? Yeah, so we have, I, I didn't present that. I think I presented that at a past um, advisory committee meeting. I, I guess I should have put that slide back in. But the best system is really um, additional claim systems like market scan, 
um, and others, but then also EHR systems. So we have several EHR systems um, that we include as well, and some of those are also claims and EHR linked data systems as well, so that gives us a little bit more granularity of data as well. Um, we can reshare that slide um, for the committee um, just for your information um, so that you have that. Okay, Dr. Gans. Thank you so much um, for that uh, wonderful um, uh, data. Um, I had a question that was along um, the same lines as Dr. Kim. So when we add in all of the systems of surveillance that are going to be um, considered moving forward, what percentage of the pediatric population actually is um, accounted for then when you're I'm considering um, the best in BSD and however best is going to be expanded. That's question one. Yeah, so I I don't have that at my fingertips right now, but um, I can um, ask my staff and then we, we could provide that answer a little bit later um, if that's helpful. Okay. Wonderful. And along those lines, as we're considering some of the particularities and unique features of pediatric disease, um, we know that there's a lot of uh, immune-mediated diseases that um, actually aren't on your list of diseases that are being counted for. There's very specific ones that we're starting to see in the adult population, the thrombocytopenia and things like that. But the disease is actually slightly different in pediatrics in terms of the immune-mediated disease, and therefore the reaction to the vaccine might be different. And I know that VARES will account for these and you can pop them into these other systems, but I'm wondering if we can actually just be proactive about looking for those in our um, non-passive surveillance, so in the BSD and, and BEF, and put those into the list of um, signals that would be accounted for. Yeah, so Tom, so I, I think from our perspective that we do, so I'll just give you an exam, example. So we developed sort of a little uh, more expanded list of vascular conditions that we're, we're going to be evaluating as well because of the, you know, the signal of the CVST and the TTS. And so I think we, we are considering doing something similar for pediatric conditions too because um, I think, as you mentioned, that there's some um, nuances and, and it's a special population that we really have to consider, you know, conditions that are specific to that population, to the pediatric population. So right. just, we we have the oh yeah, thank you I was say, we have, we have the ability to add go, go ahead go ahead I'm um, sorry <laughs> we we have the ability to add pre-specified outcomes in VSD and we would certainly um, work with our colleagues in FDA to um, to identify um, outcomes that we we may want to consider adding and using CISA to provide that advice as well. Thank mm. you. Right, Dr. Meisner. You're on mute, Dr. Meisner. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, I want to. I would like to thank both uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Shimabukuro for um, fascinating presentations. And um, Dr. Shimabukuro, I, your presentations are always crisp and informative. And thank you uh, both for all of the time that you spend um, in in this in this critical area. So I'd like to go back to the myocarditis issue because I think that's going to be very relevant for adolescents and children when we're weighing uh, benefit of risk. 
I mean, I can't help but be struck by the fact that it occurs more commonly after the second dose as a per pretty specific um, interval of time. Uh, it's primarily after the mRNA vaccines, as far as we know. We know uh, there's a consistent age. There's a lack of alternative explanations, even though these patients have been pretty well worked up. And it's a widespread uh, description occurrence because Israel, as you said, has uh, found a, a pretty similar uh, uh, situation. So um, the, the question that, that I would like for you to clarify is can you um, restate the rates of occurrence of vaccine-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia that occurs in women in their 30s and 40s and the, the, the rate that you suggested um, for the occurrence of myocarditis that's occurring in uh, adolescents and young children? So the, the, the first question is the rates of TTS in the, the high-risk strata. Is that what you're asking, Dr. Meisner? Yes, yes sir. Um, so the, the the highest rates are in are in younger women and in the I don't remember exactly what the age breakdown is I believe it's the 30 to 39 and 40 to 49 and it ranges from around 11 or 12 per million uh, in that group to around 9 to 10 per million in the 40 to 49. Uh, at, at this point I think we're still learning about the rates of myocarditis and pericarditis. We, we continue to um, collect more information both in VAERS and continue to get more information in VSD. And, and, and I think as we gather more information, we'll, we'll begin to get a better idea um, of, of the post-vaccination rates um, and, and, you know, by, and, 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 and hopefully be able to, to get better in more detailed information by by age group um, I'll say it's it's still early um, the 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 authorization and the recommendation for the 12 to 15 year olds um, was was in in mid-may and um, immunization of these older adolescents probably didn't really get going to later in the vaccination program so we're still gathering information and I, 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 you know, I believe that we will um, ultimately um, have sufficient information to, um, to, to to answer those questions. I will mention that that there will be an ACIP meeting next Friday where we'll have updated information um, from the information I presented today, and that will be put in the context of benefit and risk. And so the the risk of myocarditis in the high risk adolescents is on the same order of magnitude of the risk of VITT, uh, at least based on our available data. Is that is that correct? I I I wouldn't be comfortable comparing those two outcomes. They they are they are fundamentally different outcomes, and I I think um, with 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 TTS, I think we had very we had strong evidence of a of a causal relationship fairly early on after that vaccine started to be used. I think now we're still gathering information on myocarditis, still assessing um, the risk, um, and I think there's there's still um, more, more work to be done and more information um, and data to be to be analyzed for myocarditis. I, I'm not sure that, that, that we want to compare those two outcomes, um, fundamentally different and, and really in different age groups. and different strata as well. Yeah, my thought was, should this be included in informed consent? Uh, because there is, I think it's hard to deny that the, there's some event that seems to be occurring in terms of myocarditis. So th that was my thought. But thank you very much for your uh, in, in the Israel In the Israel study, I think the rate was one, one per 6,000 was accroted. And then uh, within specifically in that male population, 15 to 24 years of age, and that's a posted um, result. So that at least gives you an idea. That may be an overestimate for our population, but that gives you um, a, a better estimate, um, at least for that population. I'll mention on, on my slide set, we do have links to um, 
information on myocarditis and pericarditis, both for healthcare providers and for the general public. Um, so um, we're committed to, um, to timely communication and transparency in communication. Thank you both. Thank you. There's just time for two more questions. We're already eating into our question and answer, major question and answer period. Uh, Dr. Portnoy. Great, thank, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. It was, it was excellent and, and I want to comment about the VSAFE program because every time I filled out my VSAFE thing, I felt really good that I was contributing to the process. It was a really well done and well executed um, program. Um, the question I have is about the rate of these adverse events in patients who've had the vaccine and how does that compare to the rates of the same reactions in unimmunized individuals who actually get infected by COVID. When I'm talking to my patients about getting the vaccine, they want to know what, what the risk is of getting the vaccine, but they also want to know what the risk is if they don't get the vaccine and get infected by COVID. So is there a way that you could compare these risks of, of these reactions to the vaccinated patients versus if you get infected? I think what you're getting at is a, is a benefit risk assessment. Yeah, um, exactly. And I, uh, I, 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 uh, I'll have to say that that is going to be the topic of the ACIP meeting next Friday, um, where, where the folks um, in the EPI groups will, will talk about um, natural disease outcomes and put that in the context of benefit and risk um, with respect to vaccination. Because yeah, obviously vaccines have a risk of adverse events, but if they're a lot lower than the risk of the infection, then it's the risk benefit is still worth getting the vaccine. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, finally, Dr. Offit. This, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this question is for Dr. Shannon Bakura. Tom, um, it, it, we, we also see troponin leak in patients who have MIS-C, where clearly that's immune-mediated, and it usually went by the time you see MIS-C, the infection has resolved. That also appears to be true here, sort of amplified by the fact that it is a second dose rather than more of a second dose and first dose phenomenon. So in both cases, it seems to be an immune-mediated effect that's causing uh, myocardial involvement. Do you have any any um, uh, thoughts as to what the pathogenesis of that is, or are we going to wait until the ACIP has this discussion on the 18th? Uh, th there are discussions about the path the potential pathogenesis of this condition. Um, I I I can't give you an answer right now on pathogenesis. I, I do want to say that for the data that we presented, um, we specifically excluded. MISC cases because we think that's fundamentally different than these myocarditis cases, um, which um, the the patients tend to have myo just myocarditis, not the other manifestations of MISC, and tend to do quite well with conservative treatment. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. We're going to take a well-earned uh, break. Uh, We'll resume since we're running about 20 minutes late at 10.55 Eastern, 10.55 Eastern.
I'll tell you when we're live. All right, welcome back. Uh, Arnold, take it away. Next, uh, we're going to hear the FDA presentation. Considerations on data to support licensure and emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines for use in pediatric populations. And we have presenting uh, Dr. Duran Fink of CBER. Dr. Fink. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to the committee and members of public who are watching. Uh, I'm Doran Fink. I'm the Deputy Director for Clinical Review in uh, the Division of Vaccines and Related Product Applications, Office of Vaccines, Research and Review in CBER FDA. Now, Dr. Monto already introduced the title of my talk, so I'll proceed to the overview for my presentation. This will follow Section 2 of the FDA briefing document for this VRPAC meeting very closely. I'm going to begin by discussing some general considerations for development of vaccines in pediatric populations and data to support uh, licensure uh, or emergency use authorization uh, as these data might apply to COVID-19 preventive vaccines. The second part of my talk will then address specific considerations for data to support licensure or emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines for use in adolescents and in younger pediatric age groups, respectively. As Dr. Naik mentioned in his introductory FDA talk this morning, there is intense interest in pediatric development of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, this interest is not only due to public health concerns, but also because addressing pediatric development of COVID-19 vaccines uh, would be a legal requirement for any vaccine manufacturer pursuing licensure in the U.S. As required by the Pediatric Research Equity Act, or PREA, a vaccine manufacturer applying for FDA licensure of a COVID-19 prevented vaccine would need to provide at the time of the licensure application for use in adults and for all pediatric age groups from birth through less than 17 years, one of the following, either assessments of vaccine safety and effectiveness from clinical trials in pediatric subjects or other sources, or a request for deferral of studies to assess vaccine safety and effectiveness in pediatric age groups to be completed at a later date, or request for a waiver with an appropriate justification from the PREA requirement to provide these assessments. Now, those of you who are astute observers will probably recognize that PREA covers age groups from birth through less than 17 years. However, we are asking the VRPAC to focus their discussion today on pediatric age groups from six months to less than 18 years of age. Why the differences? Well, first of all, the typical development plan for vaccines and transition from adult development to pediatric development typically includes a cutoff at 18 years of age. So even though the upper age limit that is covered by the Pediatric Research Equity Act is less than 17, we're going to follow the trajectory of typical pediatric vaccine development up through age less than 18 years. At the lower end of the pediatric uh, age range, PREA covers down to birth. However, there are some specific considerations for younger infants birth through less than six months of age that are particularly complex. For example, it is possible that maternally derived antibody transferred via the placenta could provide protection in infants following either vaccination of pregnant women or natural infection of women of childbearing potential. Secondly, for pediatric development of vaccines for use in very young infants, there is the need to consider 
concomitant administration with multiple and very closely spaced routinely administered immunizations. Finally, the typical age de-escalation approach to pediatric development starts with the oldest age groups, i.e. adolescents, and then proceeds downward, carefully evaluating for vaccine safety and also dose ranging to ensure that doses studied in pediatric age groups are well tolerated. Thus, the youngest age group of birth through less than six months of age, if pediatric development proceeds in that age group at all, is typically the last to be initiated. At this time, we're not aware of any studies that have uh, in, been initiated involving infants less than six months of age. So because of the need for further discussion about trial design and other specific considerations for this youngest age group, we are therefore going to focus our discussion starting with six months of age. We are going to cover both data to support licensure as well as data to potentially support extending an emergency use authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine for use in pediatric age groups prior to licensure of the vaccine for use in those age groups. Extension of an emergency use authorization for pediatric age groups could be considered as needed to address the ongoing COVID-19 public health emergency. However, such an extension would rely upon a determination that all statutory criteria for emergency use authorization are met, including that there are sufficient data to support that the vaccine's known and potential benefits outweigh its known and potential risks in the age group or age groups being considered for emergency use authorization. And so consistent with FDA's approach to emergency use authorization as outlined in our guidance document, an emergency use authorization for use in millions of healthy pediatric vaccine recipients would rely on data from at least one well-designed clinical trial that demonstrates the vaccine's safety and effectiveness in a clear and compelling manner. So to reiterate, today VRPAC is asked to discuss general considerations for safety data specifically safety data, to support licensure or emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines for use in pediatric age groups from six months to less than 18 years. We recognize that the universe of considerations around pediatric COVID vaccine development, licensure, and emergency use authorization is not limited to safety data. However, to focus the discussion, we are asking that the VRPAC not discuss product-specific considerations, including data to support initiation of pediatric trials for specific COVID-19 vaccines or approaches to enrollment of specific age groups. These are discussions that FDA is having and are ongoing with vaccine manufacturers and rely upon the protections afforded by federal regulations for protection of pediatric research subjects. We also recognize that for public health and practical reasons, there is intense interest in developing data to inform concomitant use of COVID-19 vaccines with other vaccines that are routinely recommended for use in pediatric populations. We could not agree more with the importance of these data and therefore we encourage vaccine manufacturers to develop these data in their pediatric studies. However, in keeping with regulatory precedent, data to inform concomitant use of COVID-19 vaccines with other routinely recommended immunizations would not be a requirement to support either licensure or emergency use authorization for use in pediatric age groups. I'd like to turn now to some more uh, specific considerations regarding demonstrating vaccine effectiveness and demonstrating vaccine safety in pediatric populations. As outlined in the VRPAC briefing document, there are several 
potential options for demonstrating vaccine effectiveness in pediatric populations. One option is a clinical endpoint efficacy trial in which the effectiveness of the vaccine is directly demonstrated for preventing SARS-CoV-2 infection and or disease. The briefing document goes into some detail about various considerations for endpoints and success criteria for clinical endpoint efficacy trials. However, FDA acknowledges that based on current COVID-19 epidemiology, conducting clinical endpoint efficacy trials that are adequately powered for formal hypothesis testing in pediatric populations, specifically in those age groups for which disease incidence is lowest, may be very difficult, if not infeasible. Therefore, my presentation will focus on the second option, which is the immunobridging trial. This is a well-established approach to demonstrating uh, effectiveness in pediatric age groups based on, first of all, prior demonstration of vaccine efficacy in a comparator population, typically adults, followed by comparison using statistical hypothesis testing in a very rigorous manner of immune responses elicited by the vaccine in a pediatric age group as compared to the group or the population in which vaccine efficacy has previously been demonstrated. This immunobridging approach presumes that disease pathogenesis and mechanism of protection are similar across the age groups being compared. Now, clearly, COVID-19 disease outcomes are different between pediatric age groups and adults, and even across pediatric age groups. And there may be differences in SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 vaccine immunology across age groups. However, based on available data, FDA considers that mechanisms for disease pathogenesis and protection elicited by COVID-19 vaccines are sufficiently similar across age groups to allow for this immunobridging approach. An immunobridging trial should be adequately powered to demonstrate statistically non-inferior immune response in the pediatric age group being evaluated as compared to the group in which vaccine efficacy was previously demonstrated. As an example of a comparator group, my presentation lists adults 18 to 25 years of age. We would typically support use of a younger adult age group as opposed to, for example, elderly adults being included in the comparator population to mitigate against bias that would favor a more robust immune response in a younger population uh, e.g. a pediatric age group that could bias the, the study in favor of success. The immune response biomarkers that are selected for immunobridging trials should be clinically relevant to the disease process and to the suspected or demonstrated mechanism of protection. However, they do not need to be established scientifically to predict protection against infection or disease at a given threshold. We have a number of examples of previous vaccines that have been approved for use in pediatric populations based upon immunobridging using immune response biomarkers that have not been established to predict protection against infection or disease at a given threshold. Some examples that were mentioned in the briefing document include HPV vaccines and oral cholera vaccine. Based on currently available data, FDA considers that neutralizing antibody responses can be used for immunobridging trials of COVID-19 vaccines. And we would consider that these trials should evaluate both geometric mean titers and seroresponse rates to evaluate the full range of neutralizing antibody responses, with seroresponse rates evaluating the lower end of the response range 
and geometric mean titers evaluating the higher end. Of course, if an immune response biomarker were established to predict protection at a given threshold, then an immunobridging trial could proceed based on evaluation of seroresponse rates alone. And in this case, those seroresponse rates would be seroprotection rates. Now, even though we recognize that it may be difficult, if not infeasible, to conduct an adequately powered clinical endpoint efficacy trial with formal hypothesis testing, an immunobridging trial should plan for efficacy endpoint analyses as feasible to support the immunobridging data. These uh, clinical endpoint efficacy analyses can be descriptive. They don't need to involve formal statistical hypothesis testing. FDA would expect that any immunobridging trial designed to support either licensure or emergency use authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine in pediatric age group be scientifically rigorous, as is our usual standard for data to support pediatric use of any preventive vaccine. Here are some features of scientifically rigorous pediatric immunobridging trials. First of all, we would expect that the pediatric and adult comparator groups are similar with respect to demographic variables other than age. And as I mentioned on a previous slide, the age differences should be minimized to the extent possible. They should be similar with respect to baseline health status, and they should be similar with respect to prior exposure to SARS-CoV-2 infection or vaccination. For the cleanest data, Ideally, both groups, the pediatric group and the adult comparator group, would be naive to both SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. And we recognize, given the trajectory of the pandemic and uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, it could be very difficult to conduct a trial in which a naive pediatric group is enrolled concurrently with a naive adult comparator group. And for this reason, the comparator group does not necessarily need to be enrolled concurrently in the same trial with the pediatric group being evaluated. As long as there are adequate measures in place to mitigate against introduction of bias in terms of selection of participants and conduct of the immunogenicity assays and analyses. We would expect that a sufficiently uh, stringent statistical success criteria be used and typically, what FDA has accepted for immunobridging trials uh, would be non-inferiority margins of 1.5-fold for geometric mean titers and negative 10% for seroresponse rates. We are open to the possibility of alternative statistical success criteria, but only if adequately justified. Finally, we recognize that pediatric development will necessarily involve ensuring that doses evaluated in pediatric study subjects are safe and well tolerated. And therefore, a dose escalation approach that would be typical of pediatric development would also typically be accompanied by dose ranging to select a dose that is well tolerated in a given age group. When contemplating an immunobridging approach to infer effectiveness, not only in a different age group than that for which the vaccine has been demonstrated to be effective, but also at a different and likely lower dose level, we would need to ensure that the data to support the use of the selected immune biomarkers are sufficient, that we have sufficient confidence in those data to support the immunobridging approach, not only to a different age group, but also to a different dose level. Once again, this does not necessarily mean that we would require an immune marker that has been established to predict protection at a given threshold. This would not necessarily be a requirement. I'd like to turn now to evaluation of vaccine safety. 
And as stated in our June 2020 guidance on development and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19, the general approach to safety evaluation of COVID-19 vaccines should be no different than for other preventive vaccines for infectious diseases. And this is true for pediatric populations as well. We would expect that pediatric vaccine trials of COVID-19 vaccines assess common injection site and systemic adverse reactions that would be solicited for at least one week after each study vaccination. We would expect that such trials would collect and evaluate all adverse events for at least one month after each vaccination, and that they would evaluate all serious, other medically attended adverse events and adverse events of special interest, which would include cases of severe COVID-19 and MISC should they occur, collected for the duration of the study. The study duration should be at least six months and ideally one year or longer after the last vaccination. And current pediatric COVID-19 vaccine trials in progress are operating consistent with this expectation. Finally, we would expect inclusion of a comparator group for safety, ideally one that receives a placebo control followed for as long as is feasible. We recognize that some adverse reactions, for example, myocarditis or pericarditis as discussed earlier today, may be too infrequent to detect in a safety database of typical size for pre-licensure clinical trials. Even a safety database that includes tens of thousands of pediatric trial participants. COVID-19 vaccines represent a novel class of prevented vaccines, with some candidates also representing novel vaccine platforms. Consistent with our approach to other vaccines for uh, infectious diseases, we would expect an overall safety database for pediatric age groups from six months to less than 18 years to generally approach approximately 3,000 trial participants vaccinated with the age-appropriate dosing regimen intended for licensure or authorization and followed for at least six months after completion of the vaccination regimen. This is a general consideration and does not account for any specific safety concerns that might arise during clinical development, either in adults or in pediatric age groups, that would warrant evaluation in a larger pre-licensure safety database if feasible. Now, Dr. Meissner earlier in the day asked a question about pediatric safety databases or other recently approved uh, vaccines in the U.S. And I'll reiterate here that in cases where there has been available data in a large number of adults and an immunobridging approach has been used to support and demonstrate effectiveness in pediatric populations, the pediatric safety database that FDA has accepted is consistent with what is outlined on the slide. In the example of Gardasil, the first FDA-approved uh, HPV vaccine, the pre-licensure safety database for ages 9 to 17 years was slightly over 3,000. And this was an approval for use in that pediatric age group that was concurrent with use, uh, approval for use in adults, young adults, ages uh, 18 through 26. So at that point, we didn't have much in the way, we didn't have anything in the way of post-licensure safety data in adults. For other vaccines that have FDA approval for use in pediatric age groups based on immunobridging to infer effectiveness, we have allowed a pediatric safety database of considerably less around uh, 1,500 for a Japanese encephalitis vaccine and slightly more than 500 for oral cholera vaccine. Regardless of the overall size of the pediatric safety database, we would not necessarily expect the entire safety database 
to be available for FDA review at the same time. As I mentioned before, pediatric development typically follows an age de-escalation approach that allows for safety data and dose ranging in older age groups to then inform selection of an appropriate dose for younger age groups. So FDA has in the past and would for COVID-19 vaccines consider age group specific safety data for either licensure or emergency use authorization if appropriate based on benefit risk considerations. They would need not involve review uh, in consideration of the entire pediatric safety database from six months to less than 18 years at the same time. However, this overall safety database should include adequate representation across age groups, especially younger age groups that are less physiologically similar to adults. And we would expect an adequate number of vaccine recipients in each specific age group, and I will get into that in a later slide. In addition to pre-licensure clinical trial safety data, we would also base any licensure or emergency use authorization decision on data that also considers safety experience from clinical trials and post-licensure and or post-authorization use in older age groups. For example, younger adults for use in adolescents and younger adults and adolescents for use in younger pediatric age groups. These safety data in older age groups would be considered in the risk assessment for each pediatric age group. That finishes my discussion of general considerations, and so now I'm going to turn to more specific considerations for licensure or emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines for use in specific pediatric age groups, starting with adolescents. We would expect that evidence of an effectiveness for use in adolescents be derived from an immunobridging trial that is adequately powered and that also includes descriptive clinical endpoint efficacy data as available. The safety database that could support licensure for use in adolescents would include at least 1,000 younger adolescents, i.e. those 12 to less than 16 years of age, and additionally up to several hundred older adolescents, i.e. those 16 to less than 18 years of age, each with a median follow-up of six months after completion of the vaccination regimen. This total exposure safety debate database would be supplemented by an adequately sized control group, ideally one that has received a placebo control, as well as available safety data from clinical trials and post-authorization or post-licensure use in adults. In the event that older adolescents, those 16 to less than 18 years of age, had been included in an adult efficacy trial, we would consider inclusion of that older adolescent age group in an original licensure application for use in adults. With subsequent consideration of licensure for use in the younger adolescent age group based on immunobridging and safety data. An emergency use authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine for use in adolescents, similar to licensure, would require evidence of effectiveness. And for this, we would also expect this evidence of effectiveness to come from an adequately powered immunobridging trial with descriptive clinical endpoint efficacy data as available. We would expect the same size clinical trial safety database as for licensure, although with a somewhat shorter overall duration of follow-up in order to address the emergency situation. We have considered that a median follow-up of two months 
after completion of the vaccination regimen would be sufficient to support emergency use authorization of a COVID-19 preventive vaccine in adolescents, provided that there are no safety issues that would warrant a longer period of follow-up. This consideration accounts for the physiologic similarity between adolescents and younger adult age groups, similarity in COVID-19 disease incidence between adolescents and younger adult age groups, and also takes into consideration that there would be safety data available in many thousands of adults, specifically many thousands of younger adults, that would help to inform risks in adolescents. This approach is reflected by FDA's May 2021 extension of emergency use authorization for use of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID vaccine in adolescents 12 to less than 16 years of age. Also reflected by the precedent with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, FDA would consider including the older adolescent age group, those 16 to less than 18 years of age, in an emergency use authorization for use in adults if older adolescents in this age group had been included in the adult efficacy trial. Turning now to data considerations for younger age groups, again, we would expect that licensure of a COVID-19 preventive vaccine for use in younger pediatric age groups could be supported by evidence of effectiveness from an immunobridging trial, one that is adequately powered, uh, and also includes descriptive clinical endpoint efficacy data as available. Following the typical age de-escalation approach to pediatric development, we would expect multiple immunobridging trials, each independently powered for the age group involved. The examples that we give in this presentation and in our discussion questions are six to less than 12 years, two to less than six years, and six months to less than two years. There's nothing magical about these age cutoffs. They merely reflect generally what FDA has discussed with individual ma vaccine manufacturers in terms of their approach to pediatric development and age de-escalation. And there are slight differences across the various pediatric development programs for COVID-19 vaccines that are currently underway. We would expect for each of these age groups, no matter what the exact age cutoff is, a safety database of at least 1,000 vaccine recipients vaccinated with the age-appropriate dosing regimen intended for licensure and with a median follow-up of at least six months after completion of the vaccination series. Plus, as is the case with adolescents and also for that matter with adults, an adequately sized control group, ideally receiving a placebo control, as well as consideration of all available safety data from clinical trial experience and experience with post-authorization or post-licensure use in older age groups, those being adolescents and adults. Consideration of emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines for use in these younger pediatric age groups we believe is more complex. The considerations of whether to consider in the first place extending an emergency use authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine for use age group would include trajectory of COVID-19 epidemiology in the U.S., the burden of COVID-19 disease in these younger age groups, and therefore the anticipated benefits of making the vaccine available. And finally, the robustness of available safety data, including from clinical trials in the specific age groups, as well as experience in older age groups to inform risk assessment. 
Because of all of these considerations and age group specific differences, a conclusion of clear and compelling safety and effectiveness to support emergency use authorization and indeed the need for emergency use authorization may be less certain for younger pediatric age groups than for adolescents and adults. This is one of the questions on which we would like to receive input from the VRPAC today. If it were determined that there were a need for emergency use authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine for use in younger pediatric age groups, data that could potentially support such an emergency use authorization in an age group specific manner would include first evidence of vaccine effectiveness from an adequately powered immunobridging trial plus descriptive clinical endpoint efficacy data as available and would also include the same size clinical trial safety database as that which support as that which would support licensure with a sufficient duration of follow up to assess risk what would be a sufficient duration of follow up well, you'll notice that we did not make a proposal here on the slide, and this is another question that we would like the VRPAC to discuss and provide input on today. Considerations for sufficient duration of follow-up to potentially support emergency use authorization in these younger age groups would need to consider the anticipated benefits in these age groups and in an age group specific manner would need to consider available safety data from clinical trials in post-licensure or post-authorization experience in older age groups, and would also need to consider physiologic differences between younger pediatric age groups versus older age groups and adults. We recognize that these are very complicated considerations, and we look forward to the discussion this afternoon. To remind you of the discussion items, first of all, we would like the VRPAC to discuss that in the situation where provided there is sufficient evidence of effectiveness to support benefit of a COVID-19 preventive vaccine for pediatric age groups, please discuss the safety data, including database size and duration of follow-up that would support, first of all, emergency use authorization, and second of all, licensure. And we would like this discussion to consider age group specific factors. Secondly, in the situation where there is sufficient evidence of effectiveness to support benefit of a COVID-19 preventive vaccine for adolescents 12 to less than 18 years of age, we would like the committee to discuss the safety data, including the database size and duration of follow-up that would support licensure. And finally, we would like the committee to discuss studies following licensure and or issuance of an emergency use authorization to further evaluate safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines in different pediatric age groups. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fink. As usual, a very clear presentation of topics in which there are not so clear answers. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions right now, and then we're going to, again, ask you to please uh, stay with us this afternoon, as I know you will, uh, because I'm sure there will be questions that come up during our discussion. We're not going to have the time to really be able to answer everybody's questions, which start with Dr. Carilla. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, Doran. Uh, the question I have is, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the immunobridging. Uh, you, you made the point that we don't always necessarily have to know the correlate of protection, and in this case, we, we don't know the correlate of protection. 
but I'm a little concerned with the fact that we're talking about a vaccine that was derived from a viral sequence that is now well over a year and a half old, and that sequence is, that strain is actually not circulating anymore. And so when you're trying to immunobridge immune responses against the vaccine to clinical benefit, you're looking at clinical benefits, clinical efficacy that was derived from a different set of circulating strains. And so I'm, I'm having a little trouble as to how we can actually estimate the likelihood of, of ongoing protection um, from, from what is now a new set of circulating strains going forward. Thank you. You know, that, that is a very important question, not only for pediatric age groups, but also for adult age groups who have already been vaccinated. Sure. And so as, as we discussed back in October and at the various uh, VRPAC meetings for consideration of specific uh, EUA requests, uh, continuing evaluation of vaccine effectiveness in the post-authorization and even post-licensure period uh, as new strains and variants emerge will be of utmost importance. And so if data at the time of a consideration of a pediatric vaccine licensure or emergency use authorization suggested that the currently available vaccines based on that original uh, strain were no longer effective against the variants currently in circulation, then we would need to take those data into account. And we may decide if there is strong evidence that currently circulating strains are not adequately covered by the vaccine, we may decide that the immunobridging approach uh, as described in my presentation, would, would not be sufficient. Based on currently available data, I think we are still seeing very good levels of protection. And so uh, against the, the variants that are currently circulating. And so for that reason, we are going with the approach as described in my presentation and in the briefing. And, and is that made clear in your guidance to manufacturers that it's not just what their phase three results showed, but rather an ongoing evaluation? I think we've, we've been clear in our discussions with vaccine manufacturers. Okay. Thank you. All right. And just in general, I think that we should try to keep our discussion away from the variant issue because it's a global issue. It's not related only to some of the pediatric questions, which are complex enough. Uh, Dr. Cohen. Thanks, Dr. Pink. That was great. Um, one clarifying question before the discussion this afternoon. Is FDA um, uh, focused on those age groups as the only age groups in terms of the breakout, or would there be any, um, would FDA consider different breakouts, especially between that age two and six, where potentially there could be some um, changes in terms of uh, school-age children versus preschool-age children? As, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, the specific delineation of age groups uh, that, uh, that were presented in my briefing document, or in our briefing document, uh, and in the slides are uh, roughly following the approach to pediatric uh, development and age de-escalation um, that uh, has been uh, proposed uh, and discussed with individual vaccine manufacturers. If there were com scientifically compelling arguments to consider uh, subgroups uh, within those age groups uh, or to uh, consider different uh, age cutoffs, uh, we, we would consider those, those arguments. Uh, what, what I presented, it really reflects um, a breakdown in terms of the timing uh, upon which we expect data to become available uh, for various age groups. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nelson. 
Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Fake. That was an outstanding presentation. Very well thought out and a thoughtful approach to the immunobridging approach, which clearly clinical efficacy endpoints exclusively are likely infeasible at this point. Uh, so it did set the stage for our discussion this afternoon. Uh, I'll avoid the variant question, although I do share some of the same concerns that Dr. Carilla had as we move forward with respect to efficacy. But since this meeting is focused on safety, I wondered if you'd clarify for me a couple of things. One was on slide seven, you talked about features of scientifically rigorous pediatric immunobridging trials. And you talked about a, the, the comparator group and that the data needed to be, or the demographics of the groups, so the active group and the younger age groups being studied, needed to be similar to the comparator group, presumably the older age group, older adolescents and young adults. Uh, but you made specific mention to similar demographic variables, to, which I, I would assume includes ethnicity and other things. So in recognition that those adolescent and young adult trials did not sufficiently enroll in some cases specific ethnic groups. How do you reconcile the approach or how data will be presented for analysis in an immunobridging setting? That's question number one. The second one is, oh, well, let's start there. Okay. Well, we, we expect and encourage sponsors of vaccine manufacturers to do whatever they can to ensure adequate representation of racial and ethnic minorities in their clinical trials. Uh, we understand that sometimes clinical trials do fall short of the goals. And in this case, uh, those shortcomings are reflected in the labeling of, of the vaccine, in the fact sheets in the case of emergency use authorization, and in the package inserts in the case of, of licensed vaccines. Uh, that's, uh, that's fair and very helpful. And the second one was a little bit unrelated, but it talks about the EUA standpoint. And um, when we're talking about small signals, particularly in this population, relatively smaller trials than the 40,000 plus that we saw with the adult trial leading to the initial EUA authorization. My question is, will small signals generate a pause for a vaccine specifically, or will they extend across all relevant vaccines? And I know that may be hard to predict uh, without understanding the exact signal or scenario, but I wondered if you give us what the approach might be as we go through our risk-benefit discussion this afternoon. Thank you. And so that, that, that is a, a hypothetical question. You're right. It's, it's very difficult to, to answer in, in the abstract. Um, if we uh, were to encounter a signal in the post-authorization uh, or post-license, well, if we were to encounter a signal in the post-authorization use of a vaccine, let's, let's keep it to that for now, um, that uh, we felt warranted a pause. Uh, we would consider very carefully whether that signal applied only to a specific vaccine or to a subclass of COVID-19 vaccines or to COVID-19 vaccines in general. And we would have to follow the available data to make that determination. Thank you. Thank you. One final question from Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim, please. I think you're muted. That, that was great, uh, Dr. Fink. Um, I have a question regarding immunobridging. Uh, in your discussion, you mentioned that the, basically the reference group will be the 18 to 25 year olds to uh, for the uh, for the younger uh, age adolescents and, and children to be uh, uh, to be studied. Um, given don't we have don't we have data on on uh, 12 to 17 year olds at this point in time uh, so that uh, we don't uh, we can narrow the uh, uh, the the um, uh, age range of the comparison group uh, of the con basically uh, one group of uh, on on, uh, on immunobridging uh, to 12 to 17 year olds uh, compared to uh, compared to ch children um, 
if, if, um, that are being considered, uh, those that are uh, younger than 12 year olds. So immunobridging would um, would utilize the data from 18, not from 18 to 25 year olds, but uh, 12 to 17 year olds. Is it possible? All right. So so thank you for that that question. Uh, that that is a question that we have we have considered and discussed, and uh, there are benefits and and uh, risks to, to to that kind of an approach. So in, in terms of benefit, potential benefit, what you describe uh, is that the adolescent age group would be closer uh, in age and presumably closer in terms of the uh, mechanisms of, of vaccine elicited immunity and immune response to the younger pediatric age groups. And so potentially would be uh, a comparison, a reference group that is less prone to bias uh, than using a younger adult group. Um, on the other hand, um, effectiveness of uh, the vaccine in the adolescent group, if inferred from immunobridging to the original adult reference group, would be based on a statistical comparison. And so then, if you were to use the adolescent group as the reference group for a younger pediatric age group, that would be a statistical comparison to a statistical comparison. And you therefore introduce the risk of, of bio creep, where you're, you're working with a non-inferiority margin uh, that allows for a, a, a potentially larger and larger difference uh, in immune response to be uh, successful in uh, uh, the hypothesis testing, the, the statistical hypothesis testing. So uh, because of this risk, uh, we would consider uh, that situation uh, to lend itself most appropriately to maintaining the younger adult uh, population as the reference group for all pediatric age groups. And we have used this approach for other uh, FDA licensed vaccines approved for use in pediatric populations. Great, thanks for the explanation. Okay, thank you and thank you Dr. Fink once again. Uh, final talk before lunch, an industry perspective, considerations for COVID-19 vaccine pediatric trials. Philip from Phyllis Arthur, uh, Dr. Arthur, or Mr. Uh, Ms. Arthur. You're still muted, uh, Dr. Arthur. <laughs> All right. It's the phone, it's the phone computer combination. <laughs> My apologies for that. Thank you so much for inviting no us to give a quick presentation. Uh, this is a very important topic for industry. My name is Phyllis Arthur. I'm the Vice President for Infectious Diseases and Emerging Science Policy at Bio. Bio is a trade association here in the United States that works with biotech companies working in human health, food and agriculture, and industrial applications of biotechnology. Our members actually, as you know, responded uh, across COVID-19 issues, therapeutics, and of course vaccines as well as diagnostics. And we're very interested in this particular topic. Uh, mainly we wanted to support and underscore the rigor of the FDA's approach to this issue of pediatric trials for the COVID-19 vaccines. And at the end of my presentation, I'll highlight just a few questions that we have for the agency that we'd like to, to have addressed for the sponsors as they work closely with the FDA to execute their pediatric trials. There you go. So I think that there's a lot of agreement that there's a need for uh, understanding of how the COVID-19 vaccines will work in pediatric populations. And the sponsors support the approach and the recognition of the way the FDA is approaching this particular issue. Children, as we've heard from the presentations today, generally have had less burden of disease from COVID-19 infection than adults throughout this pandemic. But there have been some very important data showing that children are still um, impacted both with hospitalizations and severe disease. Uh, in, in June, on June 4th, the CDC presented at their ACIP meeting some updated data on COVID-19 disease in adolescents. And there were um, over 200 poor adolescent um, hospitalizations that required intensive care, and 5% of those actually required invasive mechanical ventilation. 
Additionally, this data showed that the, the rate of adolescent hospitalizations has been rising over the last two months of the pandemic, going from 0.6 per 100,000 in March to 1.6 per 100,000 in April. Cumulatively, COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates from October of 2020 to April of this year were 2.4 to three times higher than we see in a normal influenza season with influenza associated hospitalization rates. Um, and, and so I think it's important for us to think about both the impact on, on the, the adolescents and children themselves, as well as, of course, the important issue that was discussed earlier about the impact of adolescents in the overall response to the pandemic. Obviously, we, we've heard as well today about this new syndrome that's been associated with COVID-19 infections, the MISC, and we think that that's an important severe impact that can, it can have on the heart, lung, kidney, brain, skin, eyes, and gastrointestinal organs had to be taken into account in terms of how children and adolescents are impacted by COVID-19 infection. As we discussed earlier, vaccination is increasing among adults and young adults, and that's very important to reaching overall protection and a reduction or a limit and ending of the pandemic. Strategies focused on immunization of these particular populations are certainly important, but we want to make sure that we don't just focus on young adults and adolescents, uh, young adults and, and, and older adults, if we're going to actually end the pandemic and achieve herd immunity. Children will be a key part of that exercise. For pediatric vaccine clinical trials, sponsors have had decades of experience in working with the FDA on how to approach these trials, and I think Dr. Fink covered many of the examples that we were thinking about as well, particularly how uh, efficacy of HPV vaccines was then immunobridged into efficacy and safety for younger populations as a good example. We'd also hold up the example of influenza, where I think it's a, it's a good comparator to what we may see with coronavirus as we move from pandemic period to endemic period where there's a need to understand year-on-year -year, um, ep epidemiology and endemicity and how we may have to look at multi-year studies as a way to really capture overall efficacy in the younger population. So we think there are several different ways to look at trials moving forward um, and how to get to younger age groups um, and look at efficacy over the long term. Sponsors are obviously very pleased with the various options and approaches that really maintain the high standards of how we do research in the COVID in, in pediatric population and thus support the various approaches laid out by Dr. Fink, including randomized controlled trials that are the gold standard for clinical trials, age de-escalation, immunobridging, and of course, dose ranging. And then of course, rigorous safety monitoring both during the trial period and in the post-trial period as well as continuing in the post-marketing period. So we had a few questions that we wanted to share with the FDA and the panel for consideration. Can the agency comment on the regulatory pathway for uh, authorization of lower pediatric doses compared to the doses that are authorized currently in adults? Um, would immunobridging support use of lower doses in pediatrics? What are the FDA's plans for vaccine effectiveness studies in the pediatric population? What are the expectations for sponsors with regard to vaccine effectiveness studies moving forward? And how will FDA and sponsors collaborate on vaccine effectiveness studies? I'll add an additional question here, even though it brings up a topic we just were discussing, which is how is the FDA viewing or approaching pediatric study requirements when it comes to variants? So I know we just discussed, we weren't going to talk about variants, but it's one of the questions we have as well as industry. Would FDA be in favor of immunobridging in this instance, or would separate studies of pediatric populations for variants of concern be required? How should sponsors approach co-administration studies? This has been discussed today as well, and concomitant use of these vaccines as we move into the more complicated schedule of pediatric immunization. How will FDA use data from pediatric populations from the safety monitoring systems that are currently used for COVID-19, for example, V-Safe. How does the FDA intend to collaborate with other regulators outside of the U.S. to ensure global alignment on the approach to vaccine pediatric programs? And how will the FDA's approach evolve as COVID-19 moves from 
the pandemic phase right now to an endemic phase where the vaccine may be given more routinely in some, um, in some approach. So these are our questions, and we're very pleased to have had the opportunity to speak to the committee today and participate in these important discussions. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. You've asked a whole lot of very important questions, which really are directed both to FDA and to our group. Uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, any of the members, uh, voting members, uh, got comments? Or Dr. Gruber, would you help yeah. us out? Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Phyllis. Um, you raised a couple of important questions, and I think that, you know, some of them we will be certainly addressing when we talk with the, with the particular vaccine manufacturers, you know, in, in our discussions and collaborations on pediatric trials and pediatric development of COVID vaccines. Um, I don't think that we should really engage in these type of discussions today and really focus on the discussion points and questions that the FDA has formulated. One quick response in terms of global um, alignment with other regulators, we of course have frequent collaborations and exchange with our regulatory counterparts to make sure that you know the approaches that we're using regarding um, development of COVID vaccine in the pediatric populations, how we're looking at variants of concerns, that we really try to align our approach there. So I think you know again I thank you. This is really food for thought, and I I, I trust that this is going to your questions are going to be discussed and answered in the different fora available to us. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Gruber, for getting us off the hook in terms of answering <laughs> questions that we're not in the position to answer. <laughs> uh, so now we have come to uh, almost noon. I see no hands raised from, uh, from the committee. So I think we're going to take a break, a half hour break for lunch and reconvene for the uh, open public hearing at 12.30 Eastern. 12.30 Eastern for the open public hearing.
All right. Uh, welcome back. And uh, Dr. Monto, take it away. Well, welcome back for the open public hearing. Uh, I'd like Audio to recording for this meeting has session. begun. Please note. So welcome to the open public hearing. Please note that both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the product, uh, the sponsor, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the sponsor's payment of expenses in connection with your participation in this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. So over to you, Prabhu. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, and thank you. Welcome to the open public hearing. Um, we have a few uh, speakers who pre-register, and each of you have five minutes to speak. Uh, we will start with Dr. Sydney Wolf. Uh, Dr. Wolf, can you start? Uh, Sydney Wolf, Public Citizens Health Research Group. I have no conflict of interest. Last week in the Morbidity and Mortality Week reports of the CDC, the following statement was issued relevant to the 12 to 17 year olds that the current issue of EUAs has to do with. Recent increases in COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates and the potential for severe disease requiring intensive care unit admission, invasive mechanical ventilation among adolescents indicate an urgent need for vaccination in combination with correct and consistent mask wearing by persons not yet fully vaccinated. The data, which includes 14 states looked at for hospitalizations between January 1st of this year and March 31st, included, as I said, 204 hospitalizations Almost a third, 64, required intensive care unit admissions, 10 required mechanical ventilations. Fortunately, none of them died. Uh, these are obviously people who were not vaccinated at all in this 12 to 17 year old age group. And the message, as the CDC said, urgent need for vaccination in such people. The next slide comes from what little. Uh, comes from what? The, the next slide comes, next slide comes from what little is there in the public eye from Moderna's statement on May 25th. Out of roughly 1,000 placebo recipients in their trial of 12 to 17 year olds, uh, four out of 1,000 uh, got COVID, whereas out of 2,000 slightly more confirmed cases in the vaccine group, there were none. So no confirmed cases, and as they've said, this is a 100% calculated efficacy. We go back to these data just to get on this issue of the need in people 12 to 17, obviously older, the same and younger, but those have not been tested yet, for vaccination. So without vaccination, hospitalizations, just again, 14 states, intensive care unit admissions, and so forth. And this segues into one of the briefing document pages, page 12. Why use placebos in future COVID-19 randomized trials is the question being asked. Quote, if another COVID-19 vaccine is licensed or authorized for use in the age groups enrolled in the trial, 
recommended by public health authorities and widely available such that it is unethical to use a placebo control, the licensed or authorized COVID-19 vaccine could serve as a control. So this is talking about planning future trials. Obviously, the Moderna and nor Pfizer trials were or could have been organized that way. But as we get into other trials in that age group and younger age groups, I fully agree with this idea. And it certainly brings to mind the issue that I raised and I think others did in the first Pfizer meeting, which is what happens in the case of the Pfizer to the 2,000 people who were in the placebo group. And I had advocated that they should be immediately notified and offered a vaccine. And I think that that's been done. I believe it's been done for the Moderna. And I raised the question, which I hope the answer is yes, has it been done for the 2,000 children, the 1,000 children in the Moderna and roughly the same amount in the Pfizer, age 12 to 17, who got a placebo? They should get a vaccine, just as in future trials, nobody should be getting a placebo group, a placebo in a trial. The reasons for having these comparative studies, obviously, is an ethical reason. It would be unethical once there's an authorized vaccine for that age group. Parents would be much more willing to enroll their children since they would always get some treatment, not a placebo. And related to that, obviously, clinical trials for subsequent vaccines for that age group would therefore have less difficulty with enrollment with one already authorized vaccine around for whichever age group, the next one is below, tw below 12, uh, it would be difficult to enroll people if you are telling them you have, you have a 50% or a 30% chance of getting a placebo. And finally, this has to do with question three that you're being asked to address today. Please discuss studies following licensure and or issuance of an EUA to further evaluate safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines for different pediatric age groups. Since FDA has not yet authorized publicly, at least we don't know that's been done, it's supposed to happen in the next few days, the Moderna vaccine for 12 to 17 year old adolescents, why were these data not provided during this meeting? As you know, there was not a comparable meeting before the Pfizer uh, 12 to 7 was authorized, and so there wasn't an opportunity to do it, but it should be part of the discussion. And I think in conclusion, a much more evidence-based discussion of question three, which I just read, could have thereby occurred. Further evaluation of any vaccine for any age group needs to be predicated on what is already known. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. The next speaker is Dr. Peter Doshi. Let us know if you need us to move the slide, please. Hello, I'm Peter Doshi, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. If you could uh, please advance to my title slide showing my financial disclosures. For identification purposes, I'm on the faculty at the University of Maryland and an editor at the BMJ, and I have no relevant conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. The slide labeled slide A at the top right. So the question is, what is the evidence in children thus far? Let's take Pfizer's trial of 12 to 15-year-olds, which supported the recent EUA. In this trial, harms outweighed the benefits. The placebo group was better off than the vaccine group. I know that's a blunt way to put it, but the reason is because efficacy benefits were rare, whereas side effects were common. I'll explain that. In terms of the benefits, the reported 100% efficacy was based on 16 COVID cases in the placebo group versus none in the fully vaccinated group. But there were around 1,000 placebo recipients, so just 2% got COVID. Put another way, 2% of the fully vaccinated avoided COVID, whereas 98% of the vaccinated wouldn't have gotten COVID anyways. But on the other side of the ledger, side effects were common. It's on my slide. Three in four kids had fatigue and headaches, Around half had chills and muscle pain. Around one in four to five had fever and joint pain. The list goes on. In sum, all the fully vaccinated 12 to 15-year-olds avoided symptomatic COVID, but most wouldn't have gotten COVID even without the vaccine. So the benefit is small, but it came at the price of a ver of very common side effects that were mild to moderate in severity and lasted a few days. And then there are the long-term effects about which we still know nothing. I'll come back to this point. Next slide, slide B, please. 
Why do so few vaccinated children enjoy any efficacy benefit? As I said, one reason is that few kids got COVID, at least during Pfizer's trial. Also, many infections are asymptomatic. But another reason is that many children are post-COVID at this point. The CDC estimates some 25 million U.S. children were infected by March. That translates into 23% of kids 0 to 4 years old and 42% of children 5 to 17 years as being post-COVID. And I say post-COVID because the evidence to date suggests that the immune response following natural infection is robust and long-lasting. I think this is why so few vaccinated kids reap any benefit. Next slide, slide C, please. Now let's talk about long-term harms. There's a view out there that serious side effects always occur within six weeks of dosing. Well, it's just not so simple. The fact is that historically, side effects were not always discovered so quickly. For pandemics and influenza vaccines, cases of narcolepsy in adolescents were first reported around nine months after vaccines were given. And now with COVID vaccines, it wasn't until this month, four or five months into the vaccination campaign in Israel, that myocarditis was recognized as a harm in young men. So it's not simply a matter of how long after dosing did these adverse events occur. The crucial question is when are these adverse events noticed, researched, and established as linked to the vaccine? The pharmacovigilance timeline matters. Unless you recognize harm soon after they occur, you can't use that knowledge to prevent harm in the next person about to get the vaccine. And on long-term harms, we know nothing. All we can do is theorize, say, by considering the mechanism of action, vaccine biodistribution, and other essential studies that we outlined in our June 1st citizen petition. Next slide, slide D as in David, please. Next, I want to address this idea of vaccinating children to protect adults. I encourage the advisory committee to read Dr. Levine et al.'s editorial, who explain why, quote, vaccinating children is likely to be of marginal benefit in reducing the risk to others, end quote. And even if you think a small benefit is better than nothing, let's not forget that it's an unproven hypothetical benefit. We need confirmatory evidence, not just assumptions. And then there's the ethics and the law. FDA can only indicate a product for use in a given population if benefits outweigh risks in that same population. So if benefits don't outweigh risks in children themselves, it can't be indicated for children full stop. Whether vaccinating children might help adults is a moot point. Final slide, slide E, please. In summary, we must avoid a fiasco. EUA criteria are not met because there's no emergency for children. Thus far, risks outweigh benefits, and we know nothing about long-term safety other than history's lesson to be very cautious. Does this mean we should prevent parents desiring to vaccinate their children? No. Access does not require an EUA or BLA. Rather, an expanded access program can thread the needle providing access to vaccines while being honest about the evidence that it has not been demonstrated that benefits outweigh risk. FDA approval must represent a high bar of robust evidence, otherwise the whole point of regulation is lost. Thank you for listening. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Doshi. Uh, The next few speakers do not have any PowerPoint presentation. Uh, The next one is Dr. Jacqueline Miller. Thank you, and good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Miller, and I'm the head of development for infectious diseases at Moderna. As a pediatrician and mother, I am very encouraged that the VRPAC has convened to discuss authorization and licensure criteria for COVID-19 vaccines in the pediatric population. This pandemic has dramatically altered life for all Americans over the past year, including our children. Because of concerns of COVID-19 disease and transmission, children have had to adapt to distance learning, reduced group activities, and the restricted ability to interact with other children and their teachers. School closures have significantly impacted the life of students. Education is one of the strongest predictors of an individual's future success, and the impact of longer-term school closures on the future health and achievement of children has not yet been quantified. According to the CDC, 18% of COVID-19 cases reported during the month of April occurred in children and adolescents. To date, more than 3 million cases of COVID-19 have occurred in children. And while children are less frequently impacted by the severe complications of COVID-19, we have observed unusual and severe disease in children, including MIS-C, which is characterized by high fever, severe systemic inflammation, and hospitalization. 
As with adults, children of color have been disproportionately impacted by this complication, with 64% of cases occurring in black or Hispanic children. Moderna strongly supports the vaccination of children and is actively generating clinical data. We recently communicated the top-line results of our Teen Cove study, which enrolled more than 3,700 children, 12 to 17 years of age, 26% of whom were from communities of color. The vaccine efficacy in the nearly 2,500 adolescents who received Moderna COVID-19 vaccine was observed to be 100% when using the same case definition as in the pivotal trial for adults. When using a less restrictive case definition, the vaccine efficacy was 93%. And asymptomatic infection occurring 14 days after the first dose was reduced by 60%. The primary immunogenicity endpoint of the study was met, demonstrating that the antibody responses induced by the vaccine in 12 to 17-year-old adolescents are similar to those in adults 18 to 25 years of age. The safety profile of the vaccine was generally similar between adolescents and young adults. We will continue to monitor these study participants for efficacy, immunogenicity, and safety endpoints for 12 months after vaccination, and we submitted our application for the authorization of emergency use to the US FDA yesterday. We're also conducting KidCove, uh, a clinical trial in pediatric subjects in over 6,700 children who are six, to, six months to 11 years of age. We have focused on ensuring the safety of children and therefore are conducting a dose-ranging study to see if a lower dose might be effective in younger children. We look forward to providing additional updates to this study as information becomes available. The available data in children complements the data we are continuing to accrue in the pivotal phase three study and through rigorous safety monitoring through the Emergency Use Authorization Program in collaboration with the FDA and CDC. Over 100 million Americans have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and the benefit-risk profile remains strongly favorable. We remain committed to comprehensive, ongoing safety monitoring, signal detection, and proactive and transparent risk communication in collaboration with the FDA, CDC, and other regulatory agencies. Vaccination against COVID-19 will not only directly benefit children's health, but also enable them to safely return to school and other activities. We are extremely <coughs> grateful to the VRPAC and the FDA for meeting today to provide guidance about the data necessary to support emergency use authorization and licensure of COVID-19 vaccines in children. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. The next uh, visitor speaker is uh, Ms. Kim Woodsack. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Woodsack, and I'm speaking on behalf of Woody Matters, a drug safety organization started after the death of my husband due to an undisclosed side effect of antidepressants. We represent the voice of families who live every day with the consequences of the current drug safety system. I'm also on the board for USA Patient Network, an independent patient voice advocating for safe and effective accessible medical treatments. There are over 74 million children between 0 and 17 in the United States and close to 2 billion globally. While I don't have kids personally, I care deeply about them. They are our future and they will be here after you and I leave this world. And that's why I'm here today. I have great concerns over the authorization or worse yet, fear a premature full approval of COVID vaccines for children. For starters, is there really an emergency with children in COVID? The data shows kids are neither in danger, or danger nor dangerous. They are a small percent of the total cases with even a smaller number who experience um, serious illness or die. I question the timing of last Friday's CDC announcement of the rise in children being hospitalized with COVID. The media ran with it and more fear was stirred, perfectly timed in advance of this meeting. Does the public truly understand how pediatric trials work, like how few children are actually in them, how efficacy protection is often determined by immunobridging um, based on an assumption using adult experience, or safety is considered adequately con uh, characterized using only a several hundred um, trial participants? 
assumption on top of assumption. This hardly makes me feel confident in the one-size-fits-all shots on how they're being evaluated, especially when there's the potential to be used on millions of children. Trust me, the average person doesn't understand this. All they are being told is it's safe and effective. The truth is we don't really know that much about these vaccines. So safe and effective messaging is being thrown around from everyone from government officials, the media, community, religious leaders, to Hollywood celebrities. Then you add in all the promotions like multi-million dollar um, lotteries, free donuts, free shots at the, at the local bar, and so on. This subconsciously creates the illusion of that there are no downsides whatsoever, nothing to weigh or consider. Right now, the discussions around vaccines seems to be less and less about the science and becoming more and more about driven by political agendas and motivations. With all the talks of mandates and having kids vaccinated by fall, there is certainly political pressure to approve and license these vaccines. However, this is completely outside the FDA's purview and opens Pandora box for compulsion. Like mandates, approving vaccines to bolster public confidence and convert the vaccine hesitant is backwards and, again, is outside of the FDA's legal purview. Last week, I, along with a group of 26 researchers and clinicians from around the world, filed a citizen petition. I believe you should have a copy in your documents today. We outlined several efficacy and safety measures that must be met before you can see, um, consider granting full approval. And that includes a competing, completing at least two-year follow-up of participants in um, pivotal clinical trials, even if they were unblinded and we lost the placebo control group. Ensuring the evidence of effectiveness outweighs the harms in special populations, including babies, children, and adolescents, and a thorough investigation of all adverse reactions, including deaths. We simply cannot ignore the growing evidence of harm and just accept the narrative, it's a good thing, that means the shot is working. This reminds me of the same attitude the medical establishment had when we were trying to get black box suicide warnings added to antidepressants, and suicide was dismissed as an inherent, dis, um, disease, um, inherent in the disease of depression. We need to dig deeper and find out if there's causal link, like the Norway's government did with 100 nursing home deaths, and they found that 10 were likely and possible 26 were causal. What has the U.S. done? As you are debating the merits, please look inward and ask yourself if this is truly the right thing for humanity. What if years down the road you found out the decision you made today negatively impacted your children and grandchildren's health? Do you want this on your watch? I often think back to the 1991 FDA Advisory Committee meeting debating the link between Prozac and suicide and violence. At the time, every one of the advisory members with financial ties to industry voted no. It wasn't until 2004, 13 years later, with more antidepressants on the market and now approved for kids, that black box warnings were eventually added. How many lives were destroyed, including my husband, because of that decision made in 1991? My closing message to you is this. Go slow. There's no rush. The future generations are depending on you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jeff. The next uh, speaker is Ms. Terry Dial. Hi, my name is Terry Diaz, and I am co-founder of GPAC, Global Patient Advocacy Coalition. I have no financial interest. I am a patient who is harmed by an FDA-approved medical device, and I am a passionate advocate for all patients to have proper informed consent. Thank you for having me today to speak about the use of COVID vaccines in children. According to the CDC website, although children can be infected with COVID-19, can get sick, and can spread the virus to others, less than 10% of COVID-19 cases in the United States have been among children and adolescents aged 5 to 17 years. Compared with adults, children and adolescents who have COVID-19 are more commonly asymptomatic or have mild nonspecific symptoms. Children and adolescents are less susceptible to infection and have milder cases. For a population that has the absolute lowest risk, I feel that it is imperative to look at the current facts and emerging data for this disease and the mRNA vaccines. There are many unknowns that the scientific and medical communities are still working on to understand. Our children are a vulnerable age group with many years of growth ahead of them, 
and I urge you to use extreme caution when making decisions about the use of this experimental mRNA vaccine. Please consider first and foremost the fact that we do not have long-term safety data. It is dangerous and reckless to expose children to an unnecessary procedure where we do not know the long-term outcome. There are many risks and complications that are emerging as more people have become vaccinated. Last month, a CDC advisory group recommended an investigation into further study of the possible possibility of a link between myocarditis and the mRNA vaccine, which includes those from Pfizer and Moderna. In a May 24th meeting, the CDC advisory group said that the data from the VAERS reporting system showed a higher than expected number of observed myocarditis or pericarditis ages in 16 to 24 years old. In addition, a specially appointed epidemiological team in Israel has found a likelihood of a link between receiving the second dose of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine and the onset of myocarditis in young men. As we know, Israel has been one of the first countries in the world to vaccinate the majority of its population. The resulting information that comes out may be beneficial in understanding how the vaccine affects the pediatric population. On June 1st, 2021, Israel's health ministry stated that it found the heart inflammation cases were likely linked to the vaccination. The study stated that there is a probable link between receiving the second dose of Pfizer vaccine and the appearance of myocarditis among men aged 16 to 30. According to the findings, such a link was observed more among men aged 16 to 19 than any other age group. There is a possibility that our pediatric population could potentially have long-term heart issues as a result of receiving the COVID vaccines. This could result in a lifetime of medical costs and a debilitating health complications. It would be most beneficial and in the best interest of our sons and daughters to wait until more scientific data is available before making any decision about administering the COVID vaccine to children and teens. The lack of manufacturer accountability is something that should be highly considered. Currently, the FDA and the CDC reporting system is challenging at best, whereas most patients and even the medical community does not know how to report to theirs, which means the number of adverse reaction reports are only a fraction of the actual reports. As of May 28th, there were 294,801 of adverse event reports and the manufacturers should be responsible for compensating patients who are harmed, disabled, or who have died. In the FDA briefing materials, it clearly states that the UAA can only be issued after certain requirements are met. One of those requirements is that there is no adequate approved and available alternative to the product for diagnosing, preventing, or treating the disease or condition. We have seen multiple studies come forward that have shown that hydrochloroquine and ivermectin as a successful treatment in fighting COVID-19. This blatant and obvious fact completely discredits the need for an EUA. It is my recommendation at this time for the FDA to not approve or license any COVID vaccines until clin clinical trials have been completed and long-term safety data is available. Long-term safety data will give patients an opportunity to make informed decisions about getting a COVID vaccine. My mom, who was in a vulnerable population, received her full Pfizer vaccines in the month of March, contracted COVID the end of April, and just passed away on May 14th, which makes me question the effectiveness of this vaccine. In summary, as we do not have a full grasp on how the COVID vaccines are affecting people long-term, I implore you to protect American children and refrain from making a decision until we have more scientific data. It is reckless and irresponsible for the FDA to approve these vaccines in children when we do not fully comprehend the long-term effects. Thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you, Ms. Diaz. The next speaker is Dr. Ross Jones. Hello. Um, I'm a pediatrician um, from Britain from the Health Advocacy and Recovery Team, representing a group of British doctors and academics, and we have no conflict of interest. We're very concerned at the speed of rolling out COVID-19 vaccines to children, while the safety data in young adults is still building. We all know that the risk of harm from COVID-19 infection reduces the younger the age group under consideration. 
but it appears that for side effects, the opposite is true with both thrombocytopenic, thrombotic thrombocytopenic per complications and myocarditis, both having higher prevalence in younger age groups. And there clearly would have to be a tipping point where risk of harms exceeds potential risk of benefits. I would suggest that probably applies to young adults as well. But my concern here is as a pediatrician for children. Um, we have no evidence that children need this, and we have plenty of evidence accruing that the risks of harm will outweigh the, any potential benefits. Your VAR system is rather like our yellow cards, tends to have considerable underreporting and also problems with ascribing causation. But you have your near live surveillance, which for our health insurance, which seems especially useful. We've discussed that standard trials don't have sufficient statistical power to elicit rarer but severe side effects. But there seems to be only one other alternative ever discussed, and that is simply, oh, just watching the post-marketing surveillance. And as everybody said, that's underreported, it's delayed in coming through, and by the time you get this information, millions more children will have been vaccinated and potentially harmed. And one of the previous speakers was even questioning the ethics of using a placebo. And yet, to my eyes, the question is about the ethics of vaccinating children that we don't know when we don't know this is safe. So I just wondered if in the States, we're watching this closely because in the, in the UK, it's just been authorized on a temporary basis, just as you have, but we haven't started using it. And we're desperately trying to prevent that happening. But would you have even considered at this time during the summer months when the risk of COVID is so low that you could randomize between states so you had some children who were going to get the vaccine now and others who would get it in a few months time you could have a hundred thousand or a million children in both arms of your study very quickly and really answer the safety data but at the moment we're just rushing headlong into vaccinating children without adequate safety data neither short term nor long term and the ethics of that is quite i think horrific and particularly, as Peter Doshin said earlier on, if we start talking about herd immunity, the ethics of expecting children to take a risk of harm for the sake of older adults um, is totally unacceptable and inappropriate. So like your, the last two speakers, I would plead with the FDA not to be rushing ahead with any further um, approvals. But if you are doing so, then for goodness sake, at least consider delaying some of those so you get some decent data to help those of us on the rest of the world who are waiting with bated breath to see how this unfolds. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Uh, Meg Seymour. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the National Center for Health Research. I'm Dr. Meg Seymour, a senior fellow at the center. We analyze scientific data to provide objective health information to patients, health professionals, and policymakers. We do not accept funding from drug or medical device companies, so I have no conflicts of interest. We can all agree that it is of utmost safety and effectiveness of vaccines for children across age groups. There must be an appropriate and favorable balance of the benefits and risks in order to support both an EUA and licensure. We agree with the FDA's assessment that the lower burden of disease in pediatric populations warrants more stringent criteria for safety and effectiveness than for adults. In terms of vaccine, vaccine safety, we agree with the FDA in order to adequately assess risks in pre-licensure clinical trials, the safety database for each age group should be at least 1,000 vaccine recipients plus control recipients. Given the millions of children who might be vaccinated using a licensed vaccine, we think it should be studied on a sample of at least 3,000 children. In addition, the FDA's recommended follow-up time of a median of at least six months after completion of the vaccination regimen is not long enough. For an adequate assessment, FDA should require that children should be followed for a minimum of six to nine months, not a median that includes follow-up of less than six to nine months. Finally, we want to stress the importance of enrolling children from all racial and ethnic groups, including minorities who are most affected by COVID-19 and clinical trials of the vaccines. While we are happy to see that FDA encourages diversity in clinical trials, mere encouragement is not enough. Vaccines should be not, not be granted EUA or licensure for use in populations for which they have not been tested and shown to be both safe and effective. 
please consider these points during your discussion today in order to ensure a favorable balance of, balance of benefits and risks for vaccines among the pediatric population. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seymour. The next and final speaker is uh, Ms. Nisa Shafi. Good afternoon. My name is Nisa Shafi, and I'm representing the National Consumers League. I have no conflicts of interest. The National Consumers League was founded in 1899 by the renowned social reformer Florence Kelly. General Secretary Kelly's support of vaccinations played a key part in mitigating a critical smallpox outbreak towards the end of the 19th century, and her stalwart advocacy for immunizations has informed NCL's bedrock principles for vaccine education, confidence, and safety. 122 years later, we are honored to persist in our pursuit to advance vaccines as vital public health interventions, and we extend our gratitude to the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee for the opportunity to present comment during this public hearing session. NCL appreciates that the FDA recognizes that emergency use authorization is not intended to replace the rigor of full approval and that randomized clinical trials are critically important for the definitive demonstration of safety and efficacy of a treatment. The diligent review of and public engagement that went into the EUA process for the COVID-19 vaccines currently available have helped our nation reach key milestones in immunization. As our adult populations have benefited from these critical public health efforts, we are energized to extend that momentum towards our youngest citizens through our education and outreach of consumers, we support the FDA in its efforts to develop a safe and effective ex and expedited pathway towards a COVID-19 vaccine via EUA to help prevent the spread of the virus in pediatric populations. We are encouraged to learn of the committee's uh, approach towards evaluating the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine, and we have great trust in the FDA's safety monitoring systems and call on the agency to perform ongoing post-market surveillance to ensure the vaccine's continued safety and efficacy. As we've observed with recent vaccine safety concerns, consumers rely on public health agencies to communicate and respond to any potential adverse events regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. We call on the FDA to continue to sustain its robust interagency collaboration as we endeavor to vaccinate the nation. Although children are at lower risk of COVID-19 compared to adults and tend to experience milder symptoms, pediatric populations now account for 22% of new COVID-19 cases compared to 3% last year. As with adults, children and adolescents with underlying chronic health conditions are at higher risk for COVID-19 related hospitalization and death. The absence of a vaccine for pediatric populations will lead to continuing transmission that will consistently put children at risk for infection. Furthermore, vaccine uptake for routine pediatric immunizations have declined dramatically during the pandemic. It is essential for public health officials, advocates, and parents to ensure that children are up to date with their vaccines and that children eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine receive their shots. Data shows that the COVID-19 vaccine currently available for children ages 12 to 15 is safe and effective and has been recommended to be co-administered along with routine pediatric vaccinations. While COVID-19 has impacted the entire country, it has largely devastated communities of color. Children of color, specifically Black and Hispanic youth, have been especially vulnerable. This has been even more apparent with the prevalence of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, a rare but serious COVID-19-associated condition that has been observed in children 1 to 14 years of age, 64% of which were reported to be Black or Hispanic. To achieve meaningful herd immunity, we will need to ensure that children have access to a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine and also consider the unique disparities that children of color experience in the face of the pandemic. Thank you to the committee for your consideration of our views on this important public health issue. Um, thank you, Ms. Shafi. And uh, this concludes the open public hearing for the public record. And so uh, with the permission of the chair, I would like to announce a 10 minute break, the next item on the agenda. And then after 10 minute break, we will uh, reconvene to start the committee discussion uh, this afternoon. Thank you.
All right, welcome back to the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research uh, VERPAC meeting. Uh, we will now enter into the uh, committee discussion. Dr. Manto, take it away. Welcome back. Uh, glad everybody is here a few minutes early. Our industry, our uh, open public hearings were a little shorter than anticipated, so I'm delighted that we could start a few minutes early because we have a lot to discuss. And before we go on to uh, some of the discussion type topics, I wanted to make sure that everybody was comfortable with the presentations we've had. I see Dr. Rubin has his hand raised, so I'll call on Dr. Rubin. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dr. Monto. Um, I have a question, and it might be for Dr. Kirking, if she's still here, um, leftover from this morning. It, it's true, as, as several people have pointed out, that the rate of COVID-19 is declining, but really that brings it down closer to, but still way ahead of many of the other viral diseases that we immunize children for. So I, I wonder if you can put COVID-19 in the context uh, and, and, and the risks and benefits for children in the context of the MMR preventable diseases, any of the other childhood vaccines that we use on a routine basis, just to give an idea of the magnitude. Dr. Kirking, there you go. Make uh, sure you unmute. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah, ahead, I'm please. here. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so just to clarify and make sure I'm understanding, you want to know how to put the context of COVID-19 declining case rates um, without vaccination in the children in the context of what we see with measles, mumps, rubella? Well, no, right? I guess I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the question that we're faced with is something of a risk-benefit question. Um, is there enough disease to warrant uh, the risks, the unknown, the somewhat unknown risks of uh, the vaccines or less known risks than these older vaccines? But we are using the older vaccines in diseases that are very rare. So, um, and if you think about the risk of mumps or measles or rubella or any of the other diseases in children um, where the rates are also very low and yet we continue to immunize, can you just kind of put it in the context of what the benefits would be for vaccination? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I guess I would say that it's a good analogy, actually, and one that I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, but it's, it's a little bit to, like, the tolerance of, of transmission, probably, and what can happen when transmission begins. And this is where I think the, the risk benefit to the individual um, is one way of looking at it, but the risk benefit across the population is the other. Um, similar to, as you kind of allude to, you know, a lot of the benefit of a measles vaccine in a single kid or in a cluster of children is usually to prevent outbreaks as much as it is to benefit them at the individual level. So um, it, is a, it is a good analogy to make. Um, I think, again, the unknown a little bit is that we have some sense of, of transmission and what could happen with measles or mumps or rubella probably beyond the the our ability right now to predict what will happen with transmission for COVID. And so um, the analogy is a good one, I would say. But knowing the trajectory of what's going to happen, I think, is a little bit more unknown for COVID. Um, similarly, though, I do think that um, there is, you know, based on what we know about children's ability to be infected and their, as well as transmission, I do think that um, there is some risk for transmission in child-centric populations where you congregate those who are unvaccinated, which is not totally dissimilar to, to things we might consider related to measles or, or some of the other childhood illnesses. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question fully or not. Um, it's a little hard to make a full direct comparison, but I do think with the, the population versus individual considerations, it, it, it holds valid. 
No, thank you very much. I, I realize that it's an extremely difficult question. I appreciate your no taking a shot at it. Dr. Wharton? Uh, thank you. Thank you. I think this question is for Dr. Fink. Um, I, I was I was glad to see the discussion of dose ranging studies in the uh, FDA briefing document, and just wanted to ask a question about that. Is it is it reasonable to assume that further vaccine development in younger age groups will be preceded by dose ranging studies? Yes, that's that's a reasonable assumption, and I, I believe that uh, ongoing studies uh, have some details published on clinicaltrials.gov, so you can look and see what's what's being done with regards to dose ranging. And, Great, thank and you. And Doron, as a as as a parallel to that question, how does that fit into the safety data safety database? So, uh, you know, typically what we would uh, ask for is uh, an adequate uh, size, adequately sized safety database of trial participants exposed to the dose and regimen intended for use, whether that's use under emergency uh, use authorization or, or use uh, post licensure. Uh, you know, that number is uh, uh, clearly a, a topic for, for discussion today. Uh, if uh, there are data available for uh, higher doses, uh, although we would expect with, with dose, dose ranging studies, uh, the, the numbers exposed to those higher doses would, would be uh, substantially uh, less than the, than the numbers uh, exposed to the, the dose, dose ultimately uh, selected for pivotal studies in specific age groups, then, then we would also uh, evaluate safety data for, for those uh, vaccine recipients as well. Right. I'm thinking of uh studies that lower that actually lower the dose from the ones that are typically used in adults, which create uh, other questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Carilla. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, I actually have a question uh, related to the CDC discussion earlier. Uh, today on the myocarditis, and the question is, uh, right now the, that that uh, adverse event seems to be largely associated with mRNA vaccines, uh, clearly coming out of the Israeli data, which I think they've mostly used uh, just one mRNA vaccine. So, and we have very limited experience, at least in younger age groups in this country, with anything other than mRNA vaccines. What I'm wondering, though, is, is there any data on uh, either the J&J &J or AZ vaccine in younger populations, 18 to 25, that the question is, is this, is this a class effect of the mRNA vaccines, or is this a broad um, uh, uh, adverse event related to just the COVID vaccines themselves? Do we have any, any clue about that? Hi, this is Tom. Um, can can you hear me? First of all, Are you able to? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I can't speak to any AstraZeneca data. I, I can say, I mean, there are reports of myocarditis after all of the authorized vaccines, but where we're we're seeing this increased reporting or unusual or unexpected reporting is after the primarily after the mRNA vaccines in adolescents and young adults, mostly in their early 20s, after dose two, and um, the, the 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 clinical features of these are similar to what um, other groups have observed, um, mainly in Israel and also in the Department of Defense data. So um, w we think that this is um, something that we are observing primarily in mRNA vaccines, again, in these younger age groups. And, and Tom, and the duration, the, the duration from onset, go, go ahead, Mike. 
Yeah, with the preponderance in males, so when we go to a pre prepubertal group, would you would you would would you assume that maybe that myocarditis would not be as prominent, or do you not want to make that make that estimate at this point? Do you mean the male to female ratio? That, that yeah, is, is is it associated with something that would be postpubertal in terms of a physiologic effect? Uh, I, I'm not that f familiar with the specific epi of myocarditis in that in that group. I, I can say that the 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 proportion male to female um, in these older adolescents and in these um, these younger adults it it is similar to what's observed with myocarditis in general. Um, okay. And I I I can make an assumption that might apply to younger age groups, but I don't know the answer. I don't know the specifics on the, to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, before you go, I just want to, since we're going to be talking duration of follow-up, this is mainly two to four days from inoculation. So m most of these, the symptom onset for most of these cases have been around four days, and 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 the overwhelming majority within a week. Um, uh, so, uh, th I mean, there are cases that have an onset beyond that, but in the recent in the recent cases in these adolescents and young adults, um, the onset has mostly been within days, and mostly most of them within a week. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Dr. Shimabukuru, actually this question is for you uh, as well. Um, in, in the data set that you shared with us, uh, you, you shared a lot of data, so, so thank you for your presentation, first of all. But it, you went through, <laughs> through it fairly quickly and, and want to make sure I understood uh, this particular piece of information correctly. When you showed the cases of myocarditis, pericarditis that uh, occurred in the Pfizer and Moderna recipients, there seemed to be more cases in, in the Pfizer uh, recipients than in, in, in the Moderna group. Did I misunderstand those data, or is that a real thing? So for the VAERS reports, the, our spontaneous reporting, our passive surveillance system, um, there are more, more reports after Pfizer vaccine. In our active surveillance system, the vaccine safety data link, there are more reports after Moderna, or not more diagnoses. Those aren't reports. There are more diagnoses after Moderna. So it's a bit mixed. Okay. So uh, what, what um, piqued my curiosity was, you know, if, if this is a class effect, as Dr. Kurla uh, talked about, and this has to do some, something to do with, with the mRNA um, platform, uh, these are both mRNA-based vaccines. And so is, is there a difference, do you think, in, in the formulations that result in this, or are these data just too few to make those kinds of, of um, uh, analyses at this point in time? So there have been slightly more Pfizer doses used in the United States, and Pfizer is the only vaccine that's authorized under 18. Um, so um, with respect to the spontaneous reporting, I, I think we need to consider that. Um, with respect to the diagnoses and the vaccine safety data link, I mean, at this point, those are still pretty small numbers, so I think we need to wait in, for the data to mature in the um, in, in Israel, I believe, um, the, these were Pfizer cases because that's the only vaccine they used um, in the uh, in some of the other case series. Um, there have been both Pfizer and Moderna um, related cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gans. You're muted. Thank Thank you. Um, I, I had a couple of questions also for um, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Shimabakuro related to the myocarditis. Um, there was um, one report that I think Dr. Anderson you showed that um, talked about the myocarditis and broke it down into dose one, dose two. 
Um, and I'm curious to know a couple of things about the dose one individuals. Did they go on to actually get a second dose, and how did they do with that? And then I'm wondering if there's any data that you can share or, or know of um, about um, the immunogenicity, if that was looked at in any of these populations after dose one, dose two, so we could start trying to understand if there's any predictors of who might go on and have a more robust immune response. This feels like a sort of hyperimmune response um, that we're seeing. Um, and with that, um, the oh. immunogenicity data, is there any data related to looking at sort of cytokine release syndrome, because it feels a little like that after COVID disease? So with, with respect to dose one cases who, who may have received dose two, I don't have that data. That's certainly something that we can um, look into. So, sometimes in vaccine safety, we see this phenomenon where if you have a dose one adverse event, you don't get dose two, or you're less likely to get dose two. Um, but that's certainly something we can look at. Um, I don't have any information on immunogenicity. Um, I'd have to yeah, do and our, job and, or and, that. And, and this is Steve Anderson. I would say for our data, we didn't. The rapid cycle analysis doesn't break it out by dose. Um, it's just all doses um, in the rapid cycle analysis. Even though we have access to both doses, we could do that later, but we didn't do that in this initial run. Uh, I'll mention in the in the vaccine safety data link, um, our our surveillance is is all all doses as well, um, at least right now it is. Um, when th that, that separate analysis we did, which was outside of surveillance, that was an additional analysis, that broke it down by dose. So is anybody looking for risk factors? I guess that's what I'm getting at. All we have is a male gender sort of preponderance, and um, I'm wondering if, and, and some of this might be looked at in terms of actual dose of the vaccine, you, you know, what dose was used, and also the, um, the, the, mechan the way in which we give it, so the schedule, if we obviously um, broaden that. But I'm just wondering if there's any way that we can identify risk factors, or is anyone looking at that? So we're currently following up on the um, spontaneous reports, doing as rapid a follow-up as we can for the reports in 30 and under, and that includes getting medical records. Um, to 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 review the medical records to confirm information in the report. Sometimes we actually reach out directly to the to the providers to make sure we get as complete a picture as possible on these these cases. Um, we also have a group at CDC called the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, um, which uh, which are are are. Um, our researchers at academic um, research centers and have access to specialists. And we have pulled them in to help us review cases and also to um, help us um, assess the issue of myocarditis in general after mRNA vaccines and, and, and also um, look into this issue of mechanistic evidence. So I, I think we will be able to get more information, at least on the, on the individual patients and additional information, um, possibly on on risk factors. But right now, um, I, we don't see any obvious risk factors other than, I would say, age, sex, and dose. And then for FDA's analysis, we haven't really begun a deep dive into the cases. Um, since we don't, we haven't identified a signal in our system yet, but the plan would be to do um, epidemiological analysis, and we just haven't. Um, done that yet, but your question about risk factors is a valid one. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Offit. Um, thank you. So, so this question is ultimately for, uh, for Dr. Kirking, and it follows up on something that Dr. Rubin had said. So, so what, what, it seems to me what we're, we're trying to do here is determine risk benefit moving forward for children. And, and, and so in terms of defining the risk uh, of vaccines, you will dis we'll discuss how many patients we're comfortable with, how big we want those range of trials to be, how long safety follow-up is. But I think the, the harder part of this may be the benefit part. I mean, uh, Cody alluded to this earlier. I mean, 
it, clearly the numbers of hospitalizations and, and missed C cases are declining. But I, 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 my bias, and I'm curious to hear what you're commenting on this, Dr. Kirkin, is that it's summer. I mean, this at its heart is still a winter respiratory virus. And I think come winter, we're going to see really how well we're doing in terms of population immunity. I mean, that in concert with the fact that we have variants that are becoming more contagious, which is what bat viruses do as they try, try and adapt to the human population. I mean, we have first the B117 variant, now the B617 variant, which are progressively more contagious, um, which means we need a higher level of population immunity. And, and the, the bigger thing to me is that there's 195 countries out there, many of which have never given a single dose of vaccine. I mean, we still vaccinate children in this country for polio every year, even though we haven't had a case of polio since the 1970s. I think we are going to have to have a highly vaccinated or highly immune population for years, if not decades. And it just seems silly to think that we're not going to have to include children as part of that since they can suffer and be hospitalized and occasionally die from this virus. I mean, 300 children have died from this virus at least. I mean, getting back to Dr. Rubin's question, there would be 500 children roughly that would die of measles. I mean, far fewer died of virus, or far fewer die of flu, I mean, at least now. So I don't know. I mean, that, that my sense is that the, 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 the notion that we are not going to have to vaccinate children going forward, I think, is uh, is wrong, but I'm curious to hear Dr. Perkins' comments. Yeah, thank you for the comments, and, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, to think about the population, what's happening around the pockets of unvaccinated kids, and what that might mean, or, or around pockets of children, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. I would say we can pull a little bit from some of our epi studies that we've done in the field already, um, where we've done some school transmission investigations. Uh, we've done some outbreak investigations in some summer camp uh, students last summer. Um, and, you know, the thing that overwhelmingly I think we learned from kind of investigations of what happens when, when COVID is introduced into a, a student population are two, twofold. One, in, in a group of children where it's introduced and there's not a whole lot of mitigation measures, it will transmit throughout. So that's one thing. The second thing would be um, that uh, the background community transmission definitely does affect how much introduction and transmission you will see in a child-centric environment. And so just from school transmission work, we did three different locations where we looked very closely at cases introduced and tested, you know, holistically around cases in schools. Uh, and this was before, you know, adults were, were as highly vaccinated as they are now. And in general, when community background rates were higher, we found more in kids. And when they were lower, we found less in kids. And so I would say those two kind of field epi uh, data points kind of go against each other, you know. If community transmission is low, your schools will do better, even if they're unvaccinated. Um, on the other hand, it can spread once it's introduced. And so I think in context of your global aspect to your question, uh, you know, we do live in a fairly global society. And so uh, having big pockets of unvaccinated, you know, we would anticipate potentially some outbreaks. Um, I think that the other part that makes its way into this that's hard to predict is what other mitigation measures might stay or not stay. And that becomes also an important part of the dialogue. Um, when we did transmission investigations in schools, largely last winter, when, when case counts were high, um, the other mitigation measures work. The other way I would say that is that, you know, last winter, the rest of the respiratory viruses, with the exception of a few, you know, were mostly quiet. So those other mitigation measures, even outside of vaccines, were effective. If we potentially are in a position where some schools or states might decide not to continue with some of those, we might see a very different pattern. Right. All we have to do is just, just uh, mask, social distance, shut down schools, shut down business, and restrict travel. And we're good. There's a, there's a price for that. But, I, I think you raise a good point, actually, though. Dr. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Pergam. Thanks, Arnold. Um, Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Kirking. This is a question for you. Um, I haven't seen much data in children um, related to the immunosuppressed population. Um, when we're looking at outcomes of interest, it's, mer it's merely focused on generalities like you know obesity and, and other demographic factors. There hasn't been as much related to the, the at-risk population. And in adults, that's clearly becoming a, a major risk factor for mortality. I worry a little bit that as we're thinking about these data, and I, I, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this, that much of what we've come through in the initial phases, these 
high-risk individuals would have been not in um, environments like schools or um, in close contact and so were le less likely to become um, potentially in, in contact with others that might have been infected. But as that changes and as states become less um, cautious, um, we may be putting a number of those high-risk children at, at risk. And I'm curious if you guys have considered this and sort of the an analysis and, and whether or not you have much data on hospitalizations, mortality, et cetera, in the, in the high-risk groups that, that might be um, particularly um, at risk. Yeah, so I, I think in terms of your question about um, data on the high-risk groups specific to, to younger children or the pediatric population, I don't have that information right now. Um, definitely we have it to some extent, and how big of data it is or how much signal we can pull out of it, I would have to talk to some colleagues that are, that are um, uh, leading analyses on that data specifically, so my apologies for that. Um, I think your point is a good one, though, that there could be high-risk children out there that have been protected, you know, over the past year by other mitigation measures, whether that is distancing or, you know, school from home or, um, you know, tighter mask recommendations for children and or adults. Um, so I do think that there could be changing epidemiology coming specifically as pertain to high-risk children, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know that I can predict yet what that might look like, but definitely would expect it will change as the overall proportions of who cases are right now is also changing. Thank you. We're going to have a few more general questions before we get on to the, uh, the discussion topics. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Fuller, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, just a statement, and I'm not sure if this is directed to Dr. Fink or Dr. Kirkland, but if we think about where we've been with uh, vaccines in this country, they presented a lot of disease for a lot of people. We look at measles, mumps, chickenpox, HPV, uh, rotavirus, polio, hepatitis, and we talk about COVID. Um, children have been protected because they've been home, as we were just talking about. And I agree with Paul, as we open up, um, this virus will not be in adults because adults, most of us hopefully will be immunized or in some way protected uh, because of natural infection. So it's going to go to, the, to those who are not immunized, and that means the population uh, circulation in children is going to be higher. So we already know that their staying home is not a, a social um, viable alternative. So I don't see that we have any option except to also protect our children in the best way we know what we do with vaccinations in this country. So my question is, what has been, and this will get into the later discussion, what has been the database size that was needed for rotavirus or Gardasil, um, either EUA or in those cases licensure, and what is the typical follow-up? Uh, we are still, I believe, in an emergency situation. I think that when this virus goes into our children, which is what it's going to do, that will give it an incubator to change. And so not just to protect them, which is important, but to protect ourselves as well as the global population. I agree with Paul. And I guess I'm asking what has been the precedent for looking at the number in, in um, recently uh, licensed vaccines. And I'm not sure um, who is best to answer this, Dr. Finkler. Yeah, I'm not sure. E I'm not even sure either. But this is a nice segue into the first uh, discussion topic. Anybody, uh, uh, Dr. Fink or yeah, Dr. hi, Gruber, uh, anybody uh, would like to talk uh, in response, and then we'll switch to the uh, first discussion topic. Yeah, Dr. Monto and Dr. Fuller, I'm, I'm happy to take this question. So. Um, yeah, I think this, these general considerations were, were touched upon in our, our briefing document and, and in my presentation and also in, in response to uh, an earlier question from, from Dr. Meisner uh, where I provided some, some examples and, and he asked about some examples, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, go over those again because it, I, I do think it, and agree that it, it's an important uh, point. So. Um, Sometimes, uh, 
F, uh, FDA approval of, of vaccines for use in pediatric populations uh, has uh, been the first approval of those vaccines. So they, they have not previously been studied or approved for use in, in adults. And in those situations, the safety database has largely uh, been driven by uh, considerations for adequately powered clinical endpoint efficacy trials. Uh, so into the you know, t tens of thousands or, or multiple tens of thousands uh, of, of vaccine recipients. And so one uh, example uh, of that recently was, was Dengvaxia, the, the dengue vaccine uh, that was approved a few years ago for, for ages 9 through 16. Um, there have been on occasion uh, uh, safety databases that have ranged into the tens of thousands, uh, 60,000 or 70,000 for uh, rotavirus vaccine uh, because of the desire to uh, further evaluate and characterize a specific safety concern, and in that case, uh, into susception. Um, on the other hand, uh, in numerous examples where vaccines were first studied and licensed uh, for use in adults um, and then uh, approved for use in pediatric populations based on an immunobridging approach, the pediatric safety database to support that licensure has been considerably less, uh, somewhere in the range of 500 to uh, around 3,000 or so uh, total trial participants exposed to the dose and regimen intended for use under licensure. Uh, and that range depends uh, on the age ranges being contemplated for uh, approval, uh, as well as other factors. Uh, so we, we talked about the example of, of Gardasil, uh, the first uh, approved HPV vaccine, where we had slightly more than 3,000 um, vaccine recipients ages 9 to 17 uh, in the case where that approval was, was concurrent with approval for use in younger adults, so, so really very little um, uh, 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 adult safety data other than uh, the, the thousands of adults that were evaluated in the, the clinical trials uh, that provided evidence of, of clinical endpoint efficacy. And then several other examples, Japanese encephalitis virus, uh, uh, oral cholera vaccine, uh, where we had fewer than, than 3,000 uh, total uh, pediatric recipients across uh, age groups, uh, supplemented, of course, with uh, data from clinical trial experience and post-licensure use in adults. Um, and then just to, to round out the answer to your question, uh, in terms of precedent for emergency use authorization, uh, we, we really don't have, have precedent. Uh, these okay. COVID vaccines are the, the first ones authorized for emergency use. So just a final right, comment, so I think we are in an emergency situation. We haven't seen it for the children because they have been, they've been isolated or there have been other mitigations. But as we open up again, uh, we, don't, we won't have those. We don't do a very good job with those. So I think we are in an emergency situation and we'll be going into the winter. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we're going to shift. Now to uh, the answers to the questions or the uh, discussion of the specific questions. So the first one uh, up on your screen, provided there is sufficient evidence of effectiveness, uh, we are going to be talking about two age groups, six to 12 year olds and two to less than six months of age. Uh, and uh, three groups, six to 12 years, two, to, two uh, to less than six years, and six months to two years. We're talking both about safety data uh, in terms of sample size and duration of follow-up. And we're talking about emergency use authorization and licensure. We also heard in Dr. Fink's introduction that it is possible that we may say that we only want to work towards licensure, that emergency use authorization is not 
uh, necessary in a particular age group. So uh, I'm opening up the floor to uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Meisner, you're first. Thank you, Arnold. It's a very interesting conversation, but I, I have um, a couple of comments. And first, I want to I want to start off by thanking Dr. Fink and Dr. Gruber and others at CBER for their extraordinary leadership during these very very complicated uh, discussions. And can't think of anyone who has more integrity uh, and is more thoughtful than than you folks are. So thank you for everything that you've done. Um, I agree with with uh, Paul Offit. I think. We certainly need a pediatric vaccine. That's not the question that we're uh, discussing today. The question, in my mind at least, is at what point will we have sufficient data to justify a pediatric vaccine? Because after all, children grow up to be adults and we want them um, to be immunized and immune. But remember, I, people keep citing high rates of disease in children. The rates in children are four, the hospitalization is four hospitalizations per million children under 18 years of age. I mean, that's on the CDC website. That is not an emergency. It is a very low hospitalization rate. And the, the rates may change as the season changes, but we're starting from a tiny, tiny uh, rate. And I, uh, I would, uh, the rates are also falling pretty dramatically and uh, among adults and children. So as uh, more people are immunized and become immune from infection, um, I think it's very likely that we're going to get this pandemic under pretty good control. Now the issue, so the issue to me is safety. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, we can look at the 2000 or 2200 uh, adolescents who were enrolled in uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine between 12 and uh, 12 through 15 years of age, 2200, 20, so half got the vaccine, half got placebo. Nobody was hospitalized, nobody died. And there were some who got URI symptoms. But so 2200 is not going to address um, the, the issue of safety. I'm worried about myocarditis. And let me just make a comment, because I've spoken to a number of cardiologists about this. The way we evaluate myocarditis today is based on gadolinium enhancement of an MRI in a person who has chest pain, elevated troponin levels, tachypnea perhaps. And th this method of diagnosing myocarditis is very, very sensitive. It doesn't take much of an insult to the myocardium to get a positive gadolinium, gadolinium scan. But we don't know what that means on a long-term basis. Will there be scarring of the myocardium? Will there be a predisposition to arrhythmias uh, later on? Will there be an early onset of heart failure? I think that's unlikely, but we don't know that. And so before we start vaccinating millions of adolescents and children, it is so important to find out what the consequences are because the disease, COVID-19 disease, is disappearing in adolescents and children. And I think we have to be so clear about what we're dealing with. Let me make one more point. In uh, 2003, there was a publication in JAMA uh, regarding myocarditis following the Drivax vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, which is, of course, a live vaccine. But in that situation, the military, it was given to, to young recruits, the 
rates of myocarditis in the military and young men, uh, because it was mostly men in those days, um, was two per 100,000. And after the Drybax vaccine, the rates were 7.8 cases of myocarditis in the 30 days afterwards. So there was a threefold increase. And in fact, Dr. Tony Fauci wrote an editorial in that same issue of JAMA um, discussing these rates of myocarditis. So I, I, I am really concerned that, that the FDA may, by not insisting on a full BLA, which to me means at least 12 months, maybe even 18 or 24 months of follow-up in children and adolescents before they are uh, uh, recommended to receive this vaccine. I do not feel we can justify a um, EUA, including uh, um, children under an emergency use authorization. The burden of disease is so small and the risks are are just not clear. We don't know. Once we've clarified it, then we definitely want to go ahead with this immunization program. There are other problems, as we've mentioned. We don't know what the risk is with co-administration. What happens if it interferes with other vaccines? I don't think it will. It's hard, as uh, has been said, it's hard to imagine a biological explanation, but it has happened with other vaccines. So, um, I think caution should rule the day here. Thank you. Over. Dr. Meisner, before you leave, are your comments up to 18 years of age? Yes, sir, they are. I'm uncomfortable about administering uh, because so few children uh, up to 18 have been enrolled. And I, you know, we admitted a 12-year-old boy uh, over the past weekend who uh, two days after his second mRNA vaccine with uh, a troponin level greater than nine, very high level, and evidence of myocarditis. I, this is not, um, I, I cannot believe this is a random occurrence. There is an occurrence. It has to be included in an in a informed consent if we're going to move uh, ahead. Uh, I think it needs a very careful safety evaluation before we recommend it because the risk of disease is so low in this group. Over. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Hello, and uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to make some comments. I wanted to make some comments about the big picture, pick up on some of the themes that Paul Offit brought up. I think it is a very complicated series of considerations in the big picture, and we've heard a lot, both in the public commentary and now from Dr. Meissner, about the very cogent arguments to go slow, be careful, and keep in mind the relatively low burden of disease. On the other hand, as Paul pointed out, we're reaching summertime here, which is the nadir for most respiratory viruses. I think the truer test will be how does the fall and winter look? We've got to keep that in mind. I know we're not focusing on variants here, but they're out there and uh, some of them do spread easier. And so we have to keep that in mind. And finally, uh, from an ethical perspective, uh, while it's true that we have to focus on the benefits to the population that we're thinking of uh, providing a vaccine for, uh, in the case of children, uh, reaching herd immunity as a nation across all age groups also directly benefits children because the economy o opens up, uh, schools open up better, and uh, so I think it it's a very complicated topic. The themes have been touched on, but I wanted to put that out there on the big picture. Uh, more specifically in terms of the clinical trials, and I know there's been some of this, the dose ranging and the granularity of the dose uh, doses may be very important with the mRNA vaccines, and I hope FDA continues to work with the sponsors to encourage granularity uh, in dosing and follow-up uh, to see if they could hit sweet spots where uh, one benefits from the immunogenicity uh, and perhaps less of the potentially, potentially associated uh, myocarditis or other adverse events of special interest. And then from a research perspective and a very important translational perspective, 
let's try to better understand uh, what this potential association with myocarditis is. Uh, you know, our research group uh, at the Precision Vaccines Program and others, Mihai Natia in Europe and others, have uh, opened up a field of innate memory. You know, it's logical. We measure the antibody response to the mRNA vaccine, to the spike. We believe that protects us. Uh, but these vaccines also uh, alter the innate immune system. And uh, Mihai Natia just uh, posted a study uh, from immunized adults that shows that if you take their blood after mRNA immunization, mRNA vaccine, this was the Pfizer product, uh, there's altered innate response in the blood to stimulation with pattern recognition uh, receptor agonists, like TLR agonists. So these vaccines may have innate immune uh, altering effects, and that could conceivably relate to uh, myocarditis. It, uh, that's just theoretical. Uh, but we know, for example, with viral myocarditis, that these same innate pathways uh, are triggered. So, so that's a, a, a possible connection. Uh, but my question to FDA is, what is the possibility of encouraging the sponsors to gather more information about the innate immune uh, activating effects of these vaccines, uh, because more needs to be learned uh, about that. Uh, so um, those were uh, several opinions, but it, they ended up with a question to FDA uh, in terms of what are their interactions with the sponsors around understanding uh, innate immune effects of the vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Kim. Well, I certainly appreciate the perspectives that uh, that Dr. Offit, Dr. Uh, Meisner, and uh, uh, and Dr. Ma uh, Levy just presented. And I'd like to uh, add a comment. Um, uh, just a just a very simple, yeah, actually, uh, uh, rhetorical question. Uh, there is uh, there is a cost, and we've seen that with uh, uh, with myocarditis and uh, and, uh, and and other uh, rare side effects. That uh, uh, that there is a cost to vaccinating the population, um, and I think we we should also consider, and, and I'm sure that's what uh, that's what all the members. Uh, as well as the watching public are, are thinking as well. What is the cost of not vaccinating? What is the cost of um, uh, uh, to, to, to our children if we do not proceed with uh, with the uh, with a vaccination program? Um, not only in terms of protecting their health, but for the larger public health. So I I, I uh, throw that out there uh, for consideration. And I, I have a question for for Dr. Fink, and perhaps Dr. Anderson can can also comment. Um, in the adverse event evaluation, uh, the uh, perhaps post-marketing evaluation, uh, there, that there's a comparison group, um, and, and it, uh, Dr. Fink mentioned that the, that the comparison group uh, will be followed as long as feasible, um, and also uh, that there are the, uh, number of slides that uh, that Dr. Fink presented uh, that uh, identified median um, of six months or what have you as, as a, as a, as a, as a follow-up. Um, to con contextualize the, uh, uh, these issues, um, vaccine confidence, vaccine acceptability, and vaccine uptake, are uh, they're all closely related and they move in the same direction. And the more we can do to promote acceptability, confidence, uh, and, and promoting the use of uh, the COVID vaccine, the better off we're going to be in the long run, obviously. And towards that, vaccine safety has been, uh, has been identified as, as, uh, uh, as the primary, uh, as one of the, one of the primary, if not the primary reason, why there is a lag, uh, perhaps a lag, in the use of vaccine in, uh, in gaining vaccine confidence and, and vaccine acceptability. So the more we can do to promote confidence in, in addressing the risk of COVID-19 vac uh, vaccine, the better off we're going to be. Um, so I would like to ask Dr. Fink and Dr. Anderson uh, that, uh, that I realize that there, uh, there's precedence, there's, uh, th uh, there's uh, uh, there are uh, set languages that we uh, that we use, um, but 
uh, COVID-19 is obviously not uh, uh, does not allow us to uh, to uh, fix uh, get uh, get fixated on uh, what was done in the past necessarily. Um, so moving forward, I wonder if you would consider uh, using uh, a, perhaps a different um, different uh, frame of reference for uh, question number one discussion question uh, question one. It also applies to to the second and the third questions regarding the duration of follow-up. Uh, and, and that is, um, rather than using follow by as long as, uh, as reasonable, feasible, uh, what if uh, FDA were to be more prescriptive in saying, um, uh, saying that the uh, adverse event evaluation in the comparison group should be followed uh, for at least a year, at least two years, something akin to what, uh, what Dr. Uh, Meisner was saying earlier. Uh, perhaps as, as long as uh, three, four, five years um, to allay the public about the fears of, uh, of not understand, not knowing uh, or not addressing the, the long-term effects, long-term adverse effects of COVID-19 vaccination program. And by the same token, rather than, there were several slides um, that Dr. Fink uh, presented. Um, I think the first one was uh, slide number 10, 11, 12, somewhere around that around there, where median uh, was used, median of, uh, of uh, um, uh, and, and, and what if we use, uh, uh, we replace the uh, word medium uh, follow-up uh, with minimum of six months. Uh, so a median of six months versus a minimum of six months uh, to, again, uh, this, uh, of course, this would delay the, uh, the uh, outcome analysis by, uh, by several weeks, but again, this would uh, this would help reassure uh, the the, pr the providers and the public that uh, 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 that a more definitive uh, definitive um, a, a set of guidelines or a set of uh, rules are being used uh, to uh, to uh, to ensure uh, vaccine safety uh, in, and and promoting uh, promoting the use of vaccines for the public. Uh, before you answer, Dr. Fink, may I just add a, <clears throat> an additional point, and that is without either emergency use and authorization or licensure with the event frequency that we have, how many cases will we have to, uh, ha will we, we have to evaluate over these time periods? because I think that becomes an issue as well. If uh, we have the kinds of numbers that uh, are going to be in these evaluations uh, before either emergency use authorization or licensure, and is the solution some better kind of post-marketing surveillance to answer some of these questions simply because of the low frequency of these events? Please. Thanks, Dr. Kim. So let, let me try to answer uh, your, your two questions in order. First, um, the, the language of uh, as long as feasible for uh, evaluation of the control group. So th this is a theme that uh, is, is repeated from our October VRPAC meeting and our product-specific uh, VRPAC meetings for, for authorization for use. In, in adults, and in the case of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, going down to age 16. The reason we say for as long as feasible is because once a vaccine has been authorized for emergency use by FDA and recommended for use by ACIP, if one were to then insist that all trial participants who were originally randomized to placebo remain uh, in follow-up uh, without access to the vaccine, then you run into serious ethical issues. And we, we've heard uh, a number of, of very strong viewpoints uh, expressing the, the reasons why that's problematic. So when we say as long as feasible, that, that's not to suggest that, uh, that those control uh, recipients would cease to be followed at all. 
in the trial. It means that at, at some point when the vaccine is made available and, and recommended for use, it becomes very difficult to argue against providing access to that vaccine to the placebo recipient. And so ideally that access would be, would be given under the conditions of participation in the clinical trial and they would be, continue to be followed uh, in, in the context of the clinical trial. Uh, if I may, um, but in the, in the context of what we were discussing earlier in earlier uh, PERPAC meetings, um, the, uh, as far as the uh, unmasking of the control group, um, I, I think they, they were to be offered, they were to be offered the, the vaccine um, for, uh, uh, for a crossover, uh, crossover monitoring. And, uh, and along those lines, there, there would be uh, uh, those who have not, uh, those who, who have not received the vaccine. And so I'm talking about uh, an opportunity where there's, uh, where there's a, a, a reasonable uh, chance that, you, that we may be able to, uh, to study a long, uh, study adverse events uh, occurring over a longer period of time. Uh, that um, uh, that rather than uh, rather than um, self limiting the the, the, dur the durational follow up with uh, as long as feasible to to be uh, more prescriptive and 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 identifying a period of time that uh, that would suit that would uh, allow us to uh, gain more information uh, for for uh, long term adverse events. Right. And so I, I, I do think that we're on the same page, that we, we do want all trial participants to be followed for as long as possible, whether they are initially randomized to vaccine or randomized to placebo, and then at, at some point uh, choose to be unblinded and, and crossed over uh, if the vaccine is to be made available and, and recommended. Uh, so I, I couldn't agree with you more that, that having as robust a, a duration of follow-up as, as possible is important. Having said that, um, there is cost to uh, waiting for very long follow-up before taking any kind of a regulatory action to make a vaccine available. And so we do have to be realistic uh, about the, the duration of follow-up that we would expect prior to warranted considering that. And uh, remaining follow-up would, would, would need to be done uh, after uh, authorization or, or licensure, as well as uh, in the context of, of post-authorization uh, or post-licensure use. Uh, the other question that you asked was about uh, this notion of a, a median of six months of follow-up. Uh, you know, here the, the intent was to really be uh, parallel with the framework that we uh, established and that the, the VRPAC endorsed uh, back in October um, for uh, clinical trials in, in adults. Uh, clearly those adult efficacy trials have many more trial participants than, than a, an immunobridging trial in a specific pediatric age group would have. Um, but in presenting the numbers that we've discussed with vaccine manufacturers in terms of overall a safety database and, and numbers for specific age groups. Those numbers uh, actually do uh, reflect uh, what would be uh, uh, potentially a, an acceptable number of, of vaccine recipients with at least six months of follow-up. Uh, so uh, if you take a, you know, a thousand uh, vaccine recipients with a median of at least six months, that means at least 500 uh, vaccine recipients uh, for a specific age group. Uh, if, you, if your uh, concern or your interest is detecting uh, very rare adverse events, then increasing from five, uh, 500 subjects with at least six months to 1,000 subjects with at least six months really isn't going to accomplish anything. Uh, increasing to even 10,000 um, would, would likely not accomplish anything either and thus uh, the need to consider what uh, additional safety evaluation could be accomplished in, in the post-authorization or post-licensure period. Additionally, uh, when thinking about prolonged duration of follow-up uh, prior to making a vaccine available, 
again, uh, the question is, are there specific events um, that would not become apparent or, or would be difficult to characterize in a reasonable number of subjects uh, that can be evaluated in the, the pre-licensure period um, uh, with, with a much longer duration of follow-up. The concerns that we're talking about now uh, largely manifest uh, in the fairly short term uh, after vaccination. And so uh, I think we're, we're right to, to focus on those concerns, but I think we need to, to be realistic and, uh, and really, uh, uh, you know, question what, what additional information would a much longer duration of follow-up uh, prior to making the vaccine available uh, what, what, what information would that provide in, in terms of the benefit uh, and risk? Thank you. Thank you. And then I'm getting alerts that we have 15 hands raised and the clock is moving on. So uh, I'm going to move on. I think the critical thing we heard was uh, with a uh, infrequent outcome and we'll use myocarditis as a, an example, long-term follow-up of the small number of, event, of events isn't going to give us a whole lot. And that is our dilemma in terms of uh, uh, not, not having a, a approval or licensure, then if, if you don't have uh, use, then you're not going to have events to follow. And uh, I, I, I uh, recognize the problems uh, that that creates. Dr. Rubin, please. And I hope you're, from now on, since so many people have their hands raised, please try to keep your questions focused. Thanks, or thanks, comments. Thanks. They don't have to be questions. <laughs> thanks, Dr. Monto. Um, the, um, I, I, I've, heard what people said, and I, I listened carefully to what Dr. Meisner said, and, and I agree with all of his, uh, his suppositions and, and come to completely the opposite conclusion. Uh, remember here that we're deciding whether or not this vaccine becomes available. We're not deciding how, how it's used. And as we've heard from a number of people, um, we, there's not much disease right now. It's not clear in the fall whether or not this will be a useful vaccine. But I will point out that we use a lot of vaccines for which there's very little disease, as, as Dr. Kirkham mentioned, um, for public health reasons. We don't think that that's a, um, we, we are willing to make that trade-off of an individual benefit versus a community benefit. But it, sure, we don't know what's going to happen. I think that's precisely the reason why we want to have these in our arsenal, because we give an EUA to, uh, to uh, the, the vaccine doesn't mean we have to use it. And, and I think we would have to think hard about how to use it, given all of the concerns that have been raised. Um, but we're, just to follow up with, on what you just said, we're never going to know. Remember that the, uh, the, the data that Dr. Shimabukuro presented is, uh, sh shows that these huge um, confidence intervals, we are not even we're all worried about myocarditis. We're not even sure that it's an association right now. It's hard, very hard to tell. And that's over hundreds of millions of doses um, given in the U.S. alone. Um, the last thing I'd say about safety is this isn't a blank slate. We're not going in with a new vaccine to kids. We're going out in with a gigantic um, base of experience now um, in adults. And that experience has suggested that there may be rare side effects. Um, but there, isn't, there, there, there aren't common side effects, at least for the mRNA vaccines, or actually for any of the vaccines at this point. Um, and um, so our prior probability going into this of having, so having side effects that we're really going to miss, even in the smaller studies uh, that we're talking about, is low. Um, I hate to not have the tool because as people have said, when we get back in September and kids are back in school um, and people are back indoors, who, and, and in certain parts of the country, vaccine rates are very low, who knows what things are going to look like? And I, I, I would just like to have the ability to use this vaccine if we need it. If, we set, if now we set preconditions that are not achievable, 
um, over a reasonable amount of time, we won't have it. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Given the number of people who want to express their opinions and the complexity of the questions we have and their multiple parts, I think it might be useful first to look at the three different age groups that are involved in this question and try to comment on whether there would be different answers to each of the three different age groups, let's say starting from the bottom, the under uh, six months to two year olds and working our way up to try to come to some degree of consensus of importance to have the vaccines, as Dr. Rubin just said, available for use. So I'm going to ask everybody to lower their hands and try to focus on that question so that we can try to move forward uh, and come to some kind of, uh, not if not consensus, then uh, a, a, a variety of different opinions so that uh, the agency can, can be informed by our opinions. So uh, now I'll, anybody who wants to, to comment, uh, Dr. Cohen, you got there first. And then Arnold, just a reminder every once in a while, if you don't mind turning your camera on. Okay. Yeah. I'm hiding. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'll just um, to uh, uh, to echo uh, Dr. Rubin's comments. I also agree that continued duration of follow up does not help us in this situation in terms of having confidence in terms of the safety uh, for these age groups. So, um, I also came to an opposite conclusion as Dr. Meisner in that it's not duration of follow up that I'm concerned about. It's the size of the cohort that studied, and I think when you break it down into age groups. You could, you could potentially consider, as you get younger, um, uh, asking for an increasing size of a cohort to study. So 1,000 may be um, sufficient for 6- to 12-year-olds who are more like adolescents, but we may want to um, expand the cohort size as we get into that younger age group where there are such can be differences even by year of life. And as we go through this, I want, we have question number three, or topic number three, it's a, which is a, a follow-up after approval or licensure. Keep that in mind as something that's going to be there uh, after we uh, either recommend approval or licensure. Uh, Dr. Offit. Right, I agree with Drs. Cohn and Fink and others regarding that the, the issue is not one of, of uh, how long we follow up, but how many people we, we want to follow. And, and, and with that, it, it comes down to what level of risk are we willing to accept? I mean, at some level, having lived through the rotavirus experience, I, I think it is instructive. I mean, the, the rota shield was introduced in the United States in 1998 and was found to be a rare cause of interception roughly one per 10,000 to one per 30,000 uh, infants, and this was given at 2.6 months of age, uh, developed in a susception for a disease that killed between 20 and 60 children a year in the United States, babies a year in the United States. That was considered unacceptable. That risk was considered unacceptable, even though you probably had a five to tenfold greater risk of dying from rotavirus in the U.S. than dying from interception. That risk was considered unacceptable. And so two more trials were done seven to nine years later. The first with Rotatec was, was 70,000. The second with Rota, uh, Rix was, was uh, 60,000, which then ruled out a risk that that ACIP was comfortable with saying, okay, we don't have this level of risk. But then when those two vaccines, both Rotatec and Rotorix, got into the real world and were given to hundreds of billions of people, you found out that those two vaccines also caused an exception, but at a much, much lower rate than was seen with Rotashield. So it's, it's not an issue of avoiding all risk. It's an, it's an issue of what level of risk are we willing to accept, which is going to dictate how big we want those trials to be. And I agree, it's, it is not a matter of, of length of trial follow-up. It's a matter of how big, how, what the size is, and those sizes are going to be determined to some extent by the different age groups, which then have different risks regarding um, just uh, uh, COVID itself. And would you suggest the numbers? 
put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I, I think I, 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 I'll pick. I'll pick a number. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll pick a number. For younger anyway. children, <laughs> I, I would think. I will. I'll say ten thousand. As you get to older children, I would be between five and 10,000, but I'm making that up and didn't have much time to think about it. I would love to hear what other people think, especially Dr. Fink, about what, uh, what numbers they, they would be comfortable with. Dr. Chatterjee or Dr. Fink, do you want to jump in? <laughs> I, I think we're we're interested in in hearing the the discussions of safety database size and input from other members of of the VRPAC, uh to help inform uh, our perspective and, and our decision making. I think we've we've laid out uh, what we have uh, accepted in the past for other preventive vaccines authorized for use in these age groups, and if there are compelling reasons to uh, take a different approach for these vaccines, then uh, we would like to hear those. And in some ways, given that this is age de-escalation, these are not going to be parallel in terms of age groups necessarily, because that's another consideration. We will have information from the previous one, correct? Correct. Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, I have a couple of quick comments to make and actually a couple of questions. Um, it's interesting that I was going to bring up the, the rotavirus experience, Paul, so I'm, I'm glad you went through that because that is, uh, is informative, I think, in terms of us understanding, you know, the, the numbers you need in a database versus um, versus how much risk we can tolerate. Uh, when I saw this this um, issue come up, uh, and it's it's still up there on my screen, I looked at the database size and I thought to myself, more, and for the duration, longer. And, and those were really the only two things that came to my mind. Um, jokes apart, I think that this, this requires uh, probably some sort of um, statistical modeling to help us understand better what the database size actually needs to be. Um, I agree with, with both Dr. Kwan and, and Dr. Offit that uh, as you get to the younger age groups, you probably need more to be able to pick up at least on some of those um, less frequent um, adverse events. I also think it's important for us, especially in that six month to two year cohort, uh, Dr. Monto, that we do consider uh, concomitant use of other vaccines because the vast majority of, of pediatric vaccines are actually administered in that age group. And while there may or may not be interference, there may be increased from a safety standpoint, there may be increased adverse reactions that occur. I, I think that in order to have um, some confidence in saying that those things uh, are not likely to increase the adverse events that occur in, that, in those age groups, uh, I, in that age group, I think it would be important to have a, a bigger cohort in, in the younger age group. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Thank you. We can hear you, Dr. Sawyer. All right, thank you for letting me make a few quick comments. Uh, I do agree with those in general who think we need these vaccines sooner rather than later in children. I think that uh, it's really challenging to predict what's going to happen with this infection. And I'm pretty sure we're going to need the pediatric component of immunity to create the herd immunity we need, given the number of unimmunized adults that are still going to be around, given what we've seen so far. Obviously, we need to follow the myocarditis story very carefully, and that might change the equation. Uh, I'm going to put out a lower number than Dr. Offit did. I, I, you know, I don't think we're going to find rare side effects, uh, you know, in the clinical trial easily, and especially the really rare side effects, as has already been stated. 
And so, you know, I'm thinking something in the three, three to 5,000 range would tentatively make me comfortable. We have very robust safety systems for evaluating vaccine post-use, post-release licensure or EUA. And those will capture unusual middle to very rare side effects. The last thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, on a relatively minor point for the very youngest cohort, six months to two years, we need to have a big enough database to have a very good sense of fever after vaccine because that's an age group where febrile seizures are common. And when we get to co-administration with other vaccines, we're going to aggravate that. And that is a public perception issue that we're is going to undermine confidence. So I really want to be comfortable in knowing what the rate of fever is after vaccine in the youngest cohort. Thank you. And Dr. Sawyer, just to clarify, you're talking about vaccinated individuals and not vaccinated plus placebo. Yes, I'm interested in, well, I'm interested, we need a comparison of fever in vaccinated right. versus placebo in order right, to really fix right. but the, but the, when you come up with the numbers of uh, 3,000 or to 5,000 or something like that, that's vaccine recipients. Yes, that, yeah. But as as Dr. Offit did, I also just made up this number, obviously. Well, I'll be. Can, <laughs> can, can I also ask? Can Dr. I also Frank, ask for yes. clarification? Are you are you talking about uh, three to five thousand per age group, or are you talking about three to five thousand? Uh, overall uh, appropriately represented by uh, various age groups? Uh, I, I was thinking overall, but in terms of the last part of your question about appropriately represented, I'm, I'm certainly interested in the, uh, the notion that others have already stated that the younger group may need a slightly larger representation to find things, uh, and, and so it may not be evenly balanced across the age spectrum. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. That's very helpful. Dr. Wharton. Uh, thank you. Um, I share others' concerns about the unpredictability of the current situation. Um, I, I think we can't assume that disease will stay low. And I'm very concerned that as children return to school, as things continue to open up, and as we go into fall and winter, that we could have a very different epidemiological situation and really need the tool of a vaccine for children. So I do think there's urgency for the pediatric vaccine development to proceed in a stage-wise manner from the older age groups to the younger age groups. Um, I, I think one, one extraordinary difference in this program is the very robust data we have on current on use of the current vaccines with hundreds of millions of doses given. And so we're 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 adding incremental knowledge to already a very large and robust database on safety and efficacy. So I actually am quite comfortable with the approach outlined in the FDA's briefing document with um, uh, with safety databases of 1,000 in each of the three proposed age strata and the proposed follow-up of uh, uh, a median of two months for the EUA and six months for licensure. I, I think that's thoughtful, and uh, I, it seems like the, uh, the challenges of accumulating larger, uh, a larger, doing larger clinical trials could result in a, a process that was so much slower that there would be risk that we would not have these tools available when we need them. Thank you. Dr. Gruber, you have your hand raised, I noticed. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to make a comment that, however, was just made by Dr. Wharton, and because I'm, I'm very um, appreciative that the committee really you know, takes courage to, to throw out numbers here. And we have asked you 
uh, to do so. Um, at the same time, of course, we're hearing we need the vaccines, we need them soon in children because we do not know what the virus will be doing in fall when kids are back in school, when people are indoors. And we, we are in a very difficult position at FDA to really weigh that, the availability with the desire to do uh, clinical trials in thousands of pediatric subjects. So I wanted to actually now echo what Dr. Wharton just said. There is going to be the, the very you know, difficult balance to strike if we wait too long and do these large you know, clinical tri trials with large numbers of pediatric subjects we may not be ready to have these tools available when we need them. And I had one more question, and that is when people say we need these vaccines available because we cannot predict this virus and, and what will happen in fall, is the thinking that we would need them available for all these pediatric age groups that we're discussing here, i.e. six to six months to 18 years of age, or can we say, you know, let's have the data, let's accumulate the data for, and I'm now making this up, 5 to 12-year-olds and, and perhaps in 2 to 5-year-olds, but leave the very young, the infants and toddlers, out of this equation for now. So I would like for the committee to comment on that and clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gruber. Uh, could uh, I get some help, Mike? Uh, I have lost my connection. Could you call on the next uh, speaker, please? Sure. Uh, looks like uh, Pamela McGinnis. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I agree with a lot of what Melinda had to say and several other people. I, I want to do this as a really phenomenal opportunity right now while some of the disease pressure is off to actually gather the data. Let's get them. Um, at least let us have very well characterized safety profiles uh, in these different populations. If I understand the May 10, 2021 extension to 12-year-olds, and maybe Dr. Fink can clarify this for me, but I thought there was something like 2,250 um, participants split between vaccine and placebo in a randomized control trial, 12 to 15 years of age, and you had safety follow-up for a median of two months um, following second dose. And then you had your immunogenicity was non-inferior to the older age group, and you had the number of cases. So those parameters came together. So if I think they were split 50-50, something like 1,150 people received vaccines. If that's true, um, I don't think that number can be smaller for any of the individual groups. And hopefully it would be a little bit bigger. Um, I don't think it needs to be unreasonably bigger, but I don't think it can be less than what you did for extension to 12-year-olds. And this was done, and it sort of set a precedent. And I think we have more comfort in 12-year-olds um, being physiologically closer to the massive database we have now in adults than we do for younger children. So I really think it's got to be bigger. Uh, do I think it needs to be 5,000? No. Um, so I think um, you, you might be looking around at a minimum of 1,500 vaccine recipients in, in the next group down. In answer to Marianne's question, I'm very uncomfortable with having a priority focused on emergency use authorization for this vaccine type in the current situation and in pediatrics. And if we took the time to say this is not going to be the priority under EUA, but rather to focus on the quality of data and the amount of data that would hopefully support actual licensure. I think takes a little pressure off, assures quality of the study, and um, paces things. Not everything can be the priority. So I would focus on the next step down in children, and I would 
I would like to gather the data with time in younger children and in toddlers, but it would not be my highest priority right now. Uh, before you go, Dr. McInnes, could you say whether your preference of not using an emergency use authorization go is in all three age groups? It is. Okay, Dr. Nelson. Thank you. Uh, this is a tremendous conversation, extremely important. Uh, let me first by state by stating that um, waiting for a crisis to pursue EUA might be dangerous for us. Uh, so I agree that we don't need to make it the focus of the conversation, but I do think we need to lay the groundwork in pathways so that an EUA could be enabled should the need arise in the future. Um, Dr. Groove, I, I'm laughing because I had the exact same age group di distinction set down for me as well. Taking into social considerations of the highest risk category as we enter into the fall season, I do believe that 5 to 12 year age group is probably the one that we should focus on. And the discrimination between ages 5 and 6 is probably going to be fairly minimal. I would not lump the six month to age five group together. I would certainly keep them distinct in the current ones up to uh, two, two years of age and keep a two to five year as a separate group. Those lower two groups, I think, do need larger numbers. Given four criteria or four emergences over the last several months with a decreased tolerance from compassionate testimony from the public and what we've heard, increased appreciation of rare adverse events, as we've heard during the discussion today, and certainly the increased complexity of co-administration and the ability to actually discern safety data in the midst of co-administration is going to complicate matters significantly, and I think we're going to need larger numbers for that. And the other factor that may not have been the case in previous vaccine approval is the reliance on immunobridging. So I think combined with those four factors, we are going to need larger numbers, particularly for the two lower age groups, maybe not as necessarily for the age 5 to 12 group, or maybe we can get away with 1,500 or so. Uh, but I think you're looking closer to two to 3,000 for those two younger age groups in my estimation. And I do want to give a total word of thanks or, to... Total or each group? Say again? <laughs> total or group? So the, 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 the... two younger ones. The two younger ones. I think it's 1,500 each, to be perfectly okay. honest. Okay, thank you. Is my recommendation. I do want to state that and congratulate the FDA for paying such close attention to rare adverse events to vaccine and the transparency with which they're approaching this issue. Fully appreciate you're not going to power a study to identify them a priori, but laying the groundwork to be able to, f to follow them over time is important. Having been engaged in the rollout of the smallpox and anthrax vaccinations and seeing the similarities emerge that at once unpredicted and probably low risk a side effect actually turned into something that really informed how the vaccine was used programmatically is the direction we need to go, and I wouldn't jump to conclusions with regards to mechanistic studies, but enable them by having high-quality studies that actively assess for the symptoms of myopericarditis. And, don't and actually also stratify those case definitions. Our experience with adjudicating cases of suspected myopericarditis was very difficult and remains very difficult and can be very gray in the way of distinguishing them. So I would encourage not dismissing the pre-hospitalization group that actually develops uh, myopericarditis because we don't know what those outcomes are. And putting active surveillance in that looks for that pre-hospitalization or asymptomatic group is going to be important for our understanding of risk. Dr. Dodd. Okay, can you, I don't know if you can, okay, thank you. you, got you. Um, all right, great. So I, I just want to say a few things. First, I agree, you know, the assessment of risk is clearly a moving target, and we do need to be ready to quickly make decisions should the, the risk-benefit 
pivot. Um, but when I hear numbers thrown around like 1,000 to 1,500 as a statistician, I'm sort of scratching my head asking, what are we going to learn with that additional 500? And if we're talking about really not going to learn much of anything. Um, and so I, one question back to the committee is, what are you expecting to learn with the additional 500? Um, even if you go up to 5,000, I would argue there is something additional gained. But um, I think we would need to understand from you all what it is we're trying to, to gain, and then we can come up with an appropriate sample size. So from where I sit, you know, I don't see a big difference from 1,000 to 1,500 um, in terms of what we would gain. And I guess I would like to ask Dr. Anderson, um, from his perspective as somebody who's been doing a lot of thinking about the, the monitoring um, post-marketing, you know, if we do have these rare events, then what we, what we need to do is really just make sure we're, we're monitoring um, these, these things very, very closely where we'll get lots of vaccinations and then we're going to, to monitor for, for these rare events. So that, that was one question for Dr. Anderson in terms of the trade-offs between adding more to, to a randomized controlled study um, that in my assessment probably doesn't add much to our risk assessment, at least for the rare events that we're talking about. And then the other question is, you know, we're going to learn a lot from the, the recent rollout of vaccinations to the 12 plus age group, and surely that's going to tell us something um, from, from the post-marketing surveillance of those. And so, you know, I think as that rolls out, we're going to learn something and we're going to have to adapt our thinking. So I don't know, Dr. Anderson, if you wanted to comment on, on the post-marketing surveillance and if there needs to be any enhancement of that monitoring or how you make the assessment of that um, relative to adding additional participants to, to a, a randomized control study. Thank you. Yes, and Dr. Anderson, uh, we do have a third, a third discussion topic on enhancing surveillance. Uh, post-marketing, but uh, and and that really does uh, become an issue here. Yeah, so I I, I agree. I'm so I, I think your point well taken, Dr. Dodd, about the uh, the difference between a thousand and fifteen hundred. And so um, I, I think, as we mentioned in the earlier in my session, I think we we have coverage of about ten million children in our databases. And then if you probably stratify by sort of those three age groups in the question, then you're getting down to a couple, so a couple million for each of these age groups. So febrile seizures, for instance, we did studies in, in the Sentinel system, and I think there were two million children involved in each of those studies. Um, we did two of those studies. And so that's generally the power we have for these age groups. And so I think for the rare types of events, we would have coverage in the post-market systems. But again, it's post-market versus pre-market or pre-licensure, pre-authorization um, So is what we're talking about. So um, that, that hopefully gives you an idea about numbers for post-market surveillance. Thank you. Dr. Sawyer. I want to add to the discussion about staging the age groups. I agree with others that the 6 to 12 year old is the most important. The social, educational, and mental health impacts have been dramatic in that age group, and I, we haven't talked much about that, but I think the long-term implications of that are likely to be profound. It's another reason I think we need the vaccine sooner rather than later. But I do want to also emphasize the two to six year old group as important. This is a key age for social development in children. And if they are, need to be socially distanced or kept at home because they can't yet be vaccinated, I think we're contributing to that problem. I have a two and a half year old grandson and when I take him to the park, he looks at the socially distanced and masked other children like they're from outer space. And he, he doesn't play on the play equipment. He's too busy trying to figure out what those other beings are in the park. So I think that age group needs to be prioritized as well. Thank you. Dr. Perlman. Yes, so, so I just want to add that I agree with the last statements that have been made. I think that we need to be prepared to have EUAs in, in, uh, um, in in ready to go if we start seeing a big upsurge in number of cases in the fall. 
with the number of variants that we're seeing. I know we're not supposed to discuss this, but the number of variants we're seeing, the kind of um, we, immune responses that we measure in people who are older and also in people who are immunocompromised. I think we just have to be in a good position to protect uh, the, the general population in addition to children. I know one of the comments that I, well, I was going to ask earlier was in the EUA, some of, one of the uh, public speakers mentioned that we only could consider effects on the individuals themselves and not on society. I, I don't, is that correct? Because it seems to me that this is, for, for children, this is such a broader issue and it's so much more important than just on the individual. Dr. Meisner, your hands raised. Uh, thank, thank you, Arnold. And I'd like to um, make a, a few comments in, re in response to what we've been discussing, and it's, it's fascinating. First of all, I don't think anyone disputes, again, th that we need a vaccine for children. That's really not the issue we're discussing. The issue, it seems to me, is at, at what stage are we going to say we know enough to justify uh, widespread use of a vaccine in adolescents and children. Now, people, I mean, the, the fact that the rates of disease are falling are, are almost are very likely related to a combination of the vaccine and natural immunity. As has been stated, about 50, 55% of the population has um, been uh, fully vaccinated, and there's another 20% or maybe more who have been infected. So um, we're getting up around 70 or 75% immunity. So this fall, could it come back? Sure, uh, it, it could come back, but the likelihood, I think, is pretty low. And, and there certainly are studies that say children were safer in school this year rather than the children who were kept out of school, kept at home. And a lot of that experience came from uh, private schools, resulting in inequity among the opportunities for our children. So I, I don't, I don't, I think we want to be very careful about the argument that we want to vaccinate children, again, to protect adults. I mean, I, yes, we need herd immunity, but we're probably going to get there. Uh, that's what the experience was, I believe, in Israel, that as more and more adults were immunized, there was less and less disease in children. So the first mandate is to do no harm. Um, and we don't know if we're, if we're doing no harm. Now, in terms of the number of subjects, uh, to be enrolled, that's a very difficult uh, question because 10,000, sure, it's better than 5,000, which is better than 3,000. But we're probably talking about adverse events that are very infrequent. And, I mean, in Israel, I think myocarditis was suggested at once one per 6,000. Well, we're not going to pick that up even with 10,000 subjects enrolled. I think um, this becomes a, a very, very complicated uh, question. But I, I think, and hopefully we'll be, get more information, as was suggested, from our experience with the 12 to 15-year-old uh, age group. Because if um, it, it, we'll see what happens with uh, myocarditis there, and, and we can then uh, make maybe a better recommendation about looking at younger children. But I, again, I, I think it's, even though there's not a statistical uh, signal about myocarditis, the fact that it's so specific after a few days after the second vaccine and it's a certain age group and gender, it's hard to say that there's 
Over. Dr. Gruber. Dr. Gruber, I'm having some difficulties here. I I didn't mean to say anything. Oh, okay. Your hand was raised in my... <laughs> okay, Dr. Gans. Thank you for um, calling on me. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I wanted to add a few points. Um, I wanted to add in on the side that I think it's really important that we um, have these um, immunizations available for children. So I'll just add that to the group that also felt that way. And I think we're all using the same data to get to that point. Um, I think what we're um, missing here is some of the facts that um, any time we're going to consider any of the age groups, so I do think there's probably not going to be too much of a difference between the next age group that's being considered, the 6 to 12 year olds, and the, the group that is already being immunized, and we'll have a lot of data um, to understand the risks of the adverse reactions. But we're not actually looking at that. So I think if we're going to consider um, these coming forward for anything, whether it's EUA and licensure, and I do think that the length of follow-up is not what's so important. Again, we're not going to see, we're not seeing more adverse events later on. We're seeing them within this early time period, so I think that can be caught. What we need to do is increase the number of our pediatric population within these, so whatever 12 to 15-year-olds that we can capture, we're not capturing everyone, and so um, expanding that, I know that's question three, but this is going to be important for this question. Um, as well as um, understanding risk factors. So we have real lots of capability to get EHR data that we're not using. And so I think that's really important. And it should come, I think, personally, before a committee, before it just gets expanded out so that people can consider the data at hand at the time when these studies um, have been completed and the request um, is gone into the FDA for any kind of expansion of use. I do think that the zero or I'm sorry, the six months to two years is a very different question. And the other thing that I haven't heard in the conversations yet is we really need to do a better job of understanding the dose escalation. Um, we're, we're, we don't seem to take any pause there. They've been moved um, fairly quickly with the current doses, which is great. But what we're seeing over and over is that the immune response in younger people is higher. Um, it's not less inferior, of course, that's the only mark that we have to move forward, but it's actually higher and that could be a marker of how we're looking at adverse events because a lot of these seem immune induced. And if children um, would do better with a lower dose, I think that's really important. The other thing that isn't part of this conversation is we chose three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is, the interval also might be important for children. So I think we need to just take a, a pause in the back up those um, preclinical studies in the phase one and two and really understand what we're doing before we move forward to phase three. Then the numbers of, you know, 3,000 with a split in the um, vaccinated and unvaccinated is probably going to be fine because we'll never achieve higher numbers to get to an adverse event and we're going to have to do that in our post-licensure. So if our post-licensure then could actually have um, increased enhancement for A, the pediatric adverse events that we're looking for, and B, um, a, a better population, because it sounds like only 10% of the pediatric population is in the current systems. Um, with that said, I also think that um, typically we don't look mechanistically um, during um, these clinical trials, but there's no reason we can't lean on um, our um, our studies to do some of that. There's no reason why we're drawing blood that we can't look for the um, signal that might be relevant to myocarditis. So we know um, people are studying very clearly myocarditis associated with COVID. So you can actually look at those markers post-vaccine and try and come up with some risk factors so that we can actually have a better idea when we're immunizing who would be at risk for some of these um, adverse events, and in addition, then we'll have the epidemiologic <laughs> studies. Right, thank so, you. That's all. Before we move on to the next discussion topic, I would like to know, I've, we've heard 
comments about the need to be able to roll out the vaccines if we start seeing more disease. How important uh, is it, uh, Dr. Gruber, Dr. Fink, for us to weigh in about emergency use versus licensure? We really haven't talked uh, much about that. And then we're going on to the next uh, discussion topic. I guess uh, Dr. Gruber and I uh, came on simultaneously. Maybe she can uh, add to, to my perspective. I, I guess it, it would be um, good to hear in, in more explicit terms, uh, I think we've heard from some people, uh, whether we should be uh, you know, contemplating emergency use authorization uh, for use in these younger age groups, um, and uh, also you know, whether uh, the duration of follow-up that has supported emergency use authorization for adults and in one instance uh, adolescents uh, would also be uh, uh, reasonable for, for well, any of these young Well, we have a, adolescence is our next question, our next discussion uh, topic. That's for licensure, though. Well, oh, that's for licensure. Yeah, but yeah. What, you mean for, for new for new uh, applications? So, I, I mean, I, well, I, I don't want to really oppose what was just said, but, you know, <laughs> to me, when I, when I hear that, you know, these, these vaccines need to be ready in case we need it, then I think, you know, I'm, I'm hearing people who, who spoke in that regard, I think, you know, by implication would have to be supportive of an EOA because a licensure just will take a bit longer. And so I don't know if we need explicit discussions on that at this point. What, you know, if, if any of what I've heard is, you know, that, that people were comfortable about, you know, the, the duration of follow-up that, that is being proposed here and saying that extending the duration of follow-up probably doesn't really, um, you know, add much in terms of information to be gained, especially for rare adverse events. Um, I also seem to hear that regardless of the size of the database to support EOA or licensure, it there is not a differentiation there that that we need a robust safety database in terms of the N, regardless of whether EOA or licensure. And if I'm wrong with my understanding there, then I I, I would like to be corrected. But that's what I've heard. Well, that's what I've heard as well. If uh, there is anybody who disagrees with that uh, summary, uh, could you? Uh, uh, raise your hands now. I know there are hands raised already because we really need to move on to the next topic. Dr. Carilla, no. Dr. Carilla, is your hand raised? I can't tell. Yes, it is, Arnold. Uh, yeah, okay. the, the comment I, I wanted to make was that I, I, while I, while I'm in agreement with most of what has been discussed, I really don't see the pursuit of EUA in this instance because of all of the studies that will need to be done in terms of dose ranging uh, that will have to be performed. And so the time frame with which all of this is going to take place doesn't seem to be um, aligned with both when we would think we would need to use an EUA under under certain situations, I'm not really sure if we saw caseloads going up. If that would automatically imply that oh, we have to start vaccinating kids immediately, uh, and and secondly, um, you know, I don't really see I don't really see this as an emergency in children. Now now having some sort of expanded access program or an EUA that's targeted towards children at high risk, I could see subgroups of children that really would need this vaccine. But I think for the for the broader general population, I, yes, it has a public health impact. But for the individual getting the vaccine, 
for, 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 for children who don't really see a lot of serious disease uh, at, at all, very, very low risk. The EUA just seems uh, overkill, in my opinion. Okay, that was the only comment uh, from the group. Otherwise, I think we are more or less in agreement with your summary. Uh, let's go on then to question uh, or topic number two, which has to do with the adolescents. Provided there is sufficient evidence of effectiveness to support benefit of COVID-19 preventive vaccines for adolescents, discuss the safety data, including data, database size and duration of follow-up that would support licensure. Note, only licensure, not emergency use authorization. And I would assume this is, since we've already got six months on the table, that this would be accepting the six months or requesting for longer or larger database size. So, Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, you know, when I looked at, at this question, um, the thing that, that came to my mind is actually to ask uh, a, another question, which was, where are we at with the licensure for adults? Because this is a question that I feel all the time from family, friends, neighbors, uh, people who write to me, <laughs> members of the community, because I think we would, we would be a, a lot further along in our consideration and discussions around how many people we need in, in a safety database for adolescents if we knew what, what the, the numbers looked like for adults. So that's one point I'd like to make. And I don't know if anybody from the FDA is prepared to, to answer that question. But with regard to the, the size of the database and the duration of follow-up, the specific question that's asked here, uh, again, for licensure, obviously, I think the, the, the safety database has to be robust. I, I'm not certain of what the, the actual number needs to be. I'm not sure how people are actually coming up with numbers. I, I can't do that other than simply guessing. And, and the duration of follow-up there, I think we do have um, an obligation to have it be uh, at least six months and perhaps up to a year uh, in, in order to, to really have robust data that we can rely on. So I'll stop there. Dr. Vance. Sorry, did you call on me? Your hand was raised. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I, I didn't hear Gans. I heard Pans. Anyway, um, yeah, thank you. I don't think that this uh, age <laughs> um, I think that this age group um, is probably the easiest age group. And um, I think we probably have, after all the doses that have been given, um, quite a bit of data um, now to um, start supporting the safety um, the real question that is still um, in everyone's mind is the myocarditis. So I think until that um, safety um, data point or signal um, is actually worked out, um, and we heard a lot of questions regarding that um, without a lot of answers today. So I think that rather than the duration, I think because this is a unique situation where we have a ton of um, already post-use um, um, information that we don't usually have when um, vaccines come up for licensure, that this is a unique opportunity to have more data rather than time. I think time is not of the essence. So I think in order to get to licensure, um, we need um, enhanced um, information on the current safety signals that we're already seeing. I don't see miraculously any other hands raised. Uh, anybody not comfortable with the six month time? Are we being asked whether it should be any shorter than that? I don't believe that's the case unless uh, uh, somebody from FDA would like to mention it. 
So we seem to be comfortable as a group with the six-month follow-up that was uh, in the original uh, guidance document. That was easy. Let's go on to uh, discussion question number three, which is pretty well open-ended, and I think may be as important as some of our discussions in item one and related to item number one. Please discuss studies following licensure and or issuance of an EUA to further evaluate safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines in different pediatric age groups. Pretty much an open-ended question. And uh, we can, I guess, talk about uh, not only statistics, but pathogenesis of, of, of side effects and things like that. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Thanks, Dr. Montu. Um, with regard to, to this question, um, one of the points I wanted to make earlier, I'd like to bring it up now, is with regard to racial and ethnic minorities and, and making sure that a sufficient um, proportion of children from these, eight, these uh, different groups are included in addition to the different age groups. Um, because it's certainly possible, and we've seen that with regard to the the pandemic itself, with the disease itself, that the disease seems to affect different racial and ethnic minorities in different ways. So to ensure that any post-licensure or post-EUA studies that are done include a sufficient number of uh, children from minoritized backgrounds, I think that would be an important aspect to keep in mind. Thank you. Dr. Pergam. Thanks, Arnold. Um, I, I sort of echo Dr. Chavez's earlier comment about licensure, which um, for the adult vaccines, which still I'm still unclear when we're going to be reviewing the BLAs um, for those. Um, I think what will be really important um, in these future studies is once we have additional data about um, um, immunogenicity endpoints in the adult trials, which I know are ongoing, is to make sure that we're looking at these more um, more specifically in the pediatric populations. Um, specifically, T cell immunity is going to be important beyond just antibody levels. And I'm, I'm really curious, um, uh, specifically with the, the different vaccines, I know you didn't want us to, to bring up the different vaccines between Pfizer and Moderna, but Pfizer and Moderna do have different dosage levels, and I'd be really, I'm, I'm curious about um, what Dr. Krill had brought up is I'm looking at these immunogenicity levels um, with the different um, dosing strategies that they're going to be putting forward. So I think that'll be a really important piece as we look at um, of efficacy within the trials, and then uh, obviously that'll play into safety as well. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. McGinnis. Thank you, Arnold. So I, I think, you know, there's the age-old issue of waning immunity and being able to understand the kinetics of this response. This is not unique to pediatric groups, but will apply to adults as well. So I think that's sort of a no-brainer of what has to be followed for ongoing effectiveness um, of these vaccines. And in fact, then perhaps we will get better at understanding um, what might actually be a marker of, of immunity, and, and we'll learn more about what's happening with functional antibody. So I think that's really important. Um, I think the, the safety piece is that I'm not convinced that this has to be newly invented. We've obviously got wonderful systems in place and hopefully you know, participants in studies are going to be able to be followed up long term and that we will hopefully be able to pick up medically attended illnesses and hospitalizations, et cetera, and understand more about that post-licensure. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Dr. Sawyer. I am about saying, but given the unusual immunologic responses in general that we're seeing in children, 
We need to be vigilant for vaccine-enhanced disease, that, like we see in dengue with vaccination and naive people who subsequently then get infected. So I uh, don't want, want to keep that on the radar, along with the other previous comments about expanding the breadth of immunologic phenomenon that we look for after vaccine. And then I think because we've all discussed at fair length here how the concern about myocarditis and other side effects, which seem to generally be worse after the second dose, I think we need some studies on single dose and whether that might be adequate going forward. Dr. Carrilla. Thank you, Arnold. Yeah, so so I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made, particularly about really doing some better detailed understanding of the immunological response. Uh, early on in this outbreak, there was a lot of talk about a little bit of cross-reactivity that some people experienced uh, with prior coronavirus infection. That may be that may end up be influencing some of the vaccine response and also some of the adverse events that we're seeing in children or younger. The younger the children are, the more unique they are going to be in terms of being more coronavirus naive to begin with. So that may actually have an impact on their long-term uh, response to coronaviruses in general. I think the myocarditis is uh, something that needs to be looked at closely because we're likely seeing the tip of the iceberg and there may be subclinical aspects to that and that may be more important developmentally in terms of children uh, that may have some long-term impacts, uh, much more subtle, but may lead to long-term events uh, in, 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 uh, while, while, they're, while they're adults. Um, so I think those are things that we have to pay a little more attention to and be prepared to follow up because we're likely to find some surprises uh, uh, going going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gans. Points that have been raised, which I uh, which I think are great. Um, along the lines of what Dr. Sawyer was saying um, in terms of the enhanced disease that may be seen, and it may have a preference for people who are more immune response, so kids, um, I do think we need to continue to look at breakthrough disease. So while um, it may be that the hospitalization rates and um, other rates are down, I do think we still need to understand the epidemiology of how people get sick, especially when we come maybe potentially into a second season and what, you know, what is going to be circulating, we don't know. So I think that's going to be an important follow-up study that needs to be added to the ones that have already um, been stated and has been stated um, by Dr. Chattery. I think we do need to look because these will be given particularly to young children with their other um, vaccine. So we have to look at if there's any interference, not necessarily with safety as the um, was already raised for the fever, but also the immune response. And then I, I can't iterate enough because I've said it several times, the immune response really needs to be well adjusted. And then um, I do think that the way that we use vaccines in children is usually a prime boost type of strategy. So I do think that likely a second dose is going to be necessary. So even though the recommendation was to look at single dose, and, and that's fine. I do think we also need to do studies, again, as I said, with different intervals, because I do think that initial immune response is likely to need a prime boost feature to it. And um, we just need to get it right on dose and timing. Dr. Meisner. Thank you, Arnold. Um, and I, I think that, um, oh, I agree with what Ofer Levy said um, uh, early on, and I think what everyone else is saying. We need, if we had more information about what's going on uh, with myocarditis, it would be much easier to address some of these safety questions for uh, younger children. So. Um, because we're really operating somewhat in the blind here. And, and uh, so I, 
I agree with what I think uh, uh, several people are saying, because there are a number of options. I mean, we could have a longer interval before the first dose and the second dose. We could um, reduce the, the amount of uh, mRNA in, in uh, the vaccine, or as has been suggested in Israel, that we may, may not even need to give a second dose to, to children because this is a pretty, um, it stimulates a pretty aggressive uh, response. But I, I think these are all issues that, um, that, that need to be addressed, hopefully before uh, we, it, it's necessary to use these vaccines in high numbers in, in, in young children. And we haven't thought about the other possibility. Maybe the numbers, the amounts of disease are going to continue to decline. What happens if the slope of the number of new cases goes down. That, I mean, it seems to me that's more likely than, uh, than it, it will go up. And so these are going to be even more difficult questions to answer in terms of balancing risk and benefit. Over. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the changes in the schedule and obviously with the dose and to be very careful that um, we would not do this passively post licensure. In fact, that they should be controlled studies if pursued. Since we're using an immunobridging technique, I would think the same prime boost schedule would need to be followed in order to provide the reassurance of safety beyond expanding use afterwards. I also do want to focus a little bit on dose and uh, think about, again, how important it is to discriminate what the right dose is for the right child. And also look at the immune response of children. It may not be exactly the same qualitatively with respect to the antibodies that are generated. So if we're hanging our hat on neutralizing antibodies, we need to characterize that immune response in various age groups as well as the, the neutralizing effect against the multiple variants that are emerging. And I want to go back briefly to MISC as well. I noted in the two trials in clinicaltrials.gov that one of the two vaccines excluded it from enrollment, one didn't. I do think we need to track this population specifically and their response to any doses of the vaccines as we follow them, and we need more information as well on the immunosuppressed and clearly our ethnicity diversity with respect to immune response and safety. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Chatterjee, who is going to have the last word. Thank you, um, Dr. Monto. Um, I know we had decided we are not going to talk about variants, but I think this question actually deserves uh, just a brief mention that if we're talking about effectiveness uh, post licensure or authorization, as, as the variants uh, continue to evolve and, and um, appear in our population, I think this would be a critical piece as well to look at to see if the, the current vaccines are actually um, the, serving us or if these variants are escaping our, our current vaccines. Thank you. I think we are all aware that that's a key issue looking at, and many individuals and groups are now looking at escape related to variants. Uh, when we went into this uh, discussion topic, a series of discussion topics, I said that it would be very difficult to summarize. And uh, I do think it is uh, surprisingly easier to summarize for number two, discussion topic two, where I think there was uh, reasonable support for about the same kind of uh, duration to full licensure that was in the original documents for uh, the adults, adult vaccines. Clearly we had a difference uh, <laughs> Uh, a great deal of emphasis, uh, emphasis on post-licensure uh, evaluation to go along with some of the issues related to question one. I think we heard more agreement with the proposed numbers and duration that was in the briefing document 
than disagreement. We had only a few people who really disagreed with some of the approaches. We heard that the numbers will certainly have to be larger for the youngest age groups. Uh, we really did not have uh, any kind of unanimity about emergency use versus licensure. We heard some who wanted to have the vaccine available if you needed it, and uh, but others who felt that we ought to go to full, uh, not have an emergency use authorization, particularly in younger individuals. So it's very difficult to summarize about our views, our opinions in that regard. But to my surprise and uh, happy surprise, I think we heard much more agreement than disagreement about all of the points related to discussion topic one. So thank you. And I'd like to hand over to Dr. Marks, who I believe has some concluding comments. No, so Dr. Monto and uh, committee members, I just want to uh, take a moment uh, to uh, thank everyone uh, uh, for their participation today. Um, uh, I think it's very important to have uh, the type of dialogue that was uh, that took place. I think this is clearly an area where um, achieving consensus, you as, as people can see, may be a little bit challenging, but it's very important that we have the dialogue. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for everyone's time today. I, I first of all want to thank um, the advisory committee uh, staff that has uh, done an incredibly great job putting this together uh, at FDA. Uh, I want to thank our Office of Vaccines, Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology who put things together. I also want to thank all of you um, for uh, on the committee for uh, a very frank uh, discussion. I think all of your perspectives are uh, very important as we put things together. I also want to take a moment to remember all the children who have died of COVID-19 in this pandemic, uh, because that should not be forgotten here. This, I think the, the I just need to just reiterate uh, something, that this is uh, uh, an illness that takes the lives of children. Uh, we know that over 300 children have died um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the pandemic so far, and that um, if one looked at the death rate of the 11 to 17-year-old um, who had COVID-19, um, it was about 1 in 3,600 um, uh, 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 of those individuals. And since we had over a million cases in that age range, uh, you can see that there are, there are deaths due to this. So I want to remember those, and uh, as we go forward, um, I think all of us have as a goal to uh, eliminate any vaccine preventable death that we can uh, with a reasonable benefit risk. So as we leave today, um, I really want to thank you for all of the thoughts about this because I think everyone is obviously trying to do their best to achieve that goal um, and uh, appreciate all the different viewpoints. Thanks also to everyone who tuned in today to uh, listen uh, uh, to this webcast. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to uh, to Dr. Monto or Dr. Atreya. I think we turn it over to Dr. Atreya now to formally close the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Ma Dr. Monto, and the entire workshop team, and then all the staff who participated. These are, these are great uh, discussions, and then uh, a great uh, meeting overall. Thank you, and I formally close the meeting now. So the meeting is adjourned now. Okay, thank you, and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prava. Thanks.